This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kevin, a neural engine by Amazon Web Services. In conjunction with Laude Corpus, Software Safety, Audiobook Library Essentials, and Project Gutenberg. The Veil of Isis. Chapter 6. Hermes, who is of my ordinances ever the bearer, then taking his staff, with which he the eyelids of mortals, closes at will, and the sleeper, at will, reawakens. Odyssey, Book V. I saw the Samothracian rings. Leap, and steel filings boil in a brass dish. So soon as underneath it there was placed. The magnet stone, and with wild terror seemed. The iron to flee from it in stern hate. Lucretius, Book V. But that which especially distinguishes the brotherhood is their marvelous knowledge of the resources of the medical art. They work not by charms but by simples, whose account of the origin and attributes of the true Rosicrucians. One of the truest things ever said by a man of science is the remark made by Professor Cook in his new chemistry. The history of science shows that the age must be prepared before scientific truths can take root and grow. The barren premonitions of science have been barren because these seeds of truth fell upon unfruitful soil, and, as soon as the fullness of the time has come, the seed has taken root and the fruit has ripened. Every student is surprised to find how very little is the share of new truth, which even the greatest genius has added to the previous stock. The revolution through which chemistry has recently passed is well calculated to concentrate the attention of chemists upon this fact, and it would not be strange if, in less time than it has required to effect it, the claims of the alchemists would be examined with impartiality and studied from a rational point of view. To bridge over the narrow gulf which now separates the new chemistry from old alchemy, is little, if any harder than what they have done in going from dualism to the law of Avogadro. As Ampere served to introduce Avogadro to our contemporary chemists, so Reichenbach will perhaps one day be found to have paved the way with his odd for the just appreciation of Paracelsus. It was more than fifty years before molecules were accepted as units of chemical calculations, it may require less than half that time to cause the superlative merits of the Swiss mystic to be acknowledged. The warning paragraph about healing mediums, which will be found elsewhere, might have p. 164. Been written by one who had read his works. You must understand, he says, that the magnet is that spirit of life in man which the infected seeks, as both unite themselves with chaos from without, and thus the healthy are infected by the unhealthy through magnetic attraction. The primal causes of the diseases afflicting mankind, the secret relations between physiology and psychology, vainly tortured by men of modern science for some clue to base their speculations upon, the specifics and remedies for every ailment of the human body all are described and accounted for in his voluminous works. Electromagnetism, the so-called discovery of Professor Ersted, had been used by Paracelsus three centuries before. This may be demonstrated by examining critically his mode of curing disease. Upon his achievements in chemistry there is no need to enlarge, for it is admitted by fair and unprejudiced writers that he was one of the greatest chemists of his time. Briere de Blomont terms him a genius and agrees with Deleuze that he created a new epoch in the history of medicine. The secret of his successful and, as they were called, magic cures lies in his sovereign contempt for the so-called learned authorities of his age. Seeking for truth, says Paracelsus, I considered with myself that if there were no teachers of medicine in this world, how would I set to learn the art? No otherwise than in the great open book of nature, written with the finger of God. I am accused and denounced for not having entered in at the right door of art. But which is the right one? Galen, Avicenna, Meshu, Rasis, or Honest Nature? I believe, the last. Through this door I entered, in the light of nature, and no apothecary's lamp directed me on my way. This utter scorn for established laws and scientific formulas, this aspiration of mortal clay to commingle with the spirit of nature, and look to it alone for health, and help, in the light of truth, was the cause of the inveterate hatred shown by the contemporary pygmies to the fire philosopher and alchemist. No wonder that he was accused of charlatanry and even drunkenness. Of the latter charge, Hemon boldly and fearlessly exonerates him, and proves that the foul accusation proceeded from Operinus, who lived with him some time in order to learn his secrets, but his object was defeated, hence, the evil reports of his disciples and apothecaries. He was the founder of the school of animal magnetism and the discoverer of the occult properties of the magnet. 
He was branded by his age as a sorcerer, because the cures he made were marvelous. Three centuries later, Baron du Petet was also accused of sorcery and demonolatry by the Church of Rome, and of charlatanry by the p. 165. Academicians of Europe. As the fire philosophers say, it is not the chemist who will condescend to look upon the living fire otherwise than his colleagues do. Thou hast forgotten what thy fathers taught thee about it or rather, thou hast never known, it is too loud for thee. A work upon magico spiritual philosophy and occult science would be incomplete without a particular notice of the history of animal magnetism, as it stands since Paracelsus staggered with it the schoolmen of the latter half of the 16th century. We will observe briefly its appearance in Paris when imported from Germany by Anton Mesmer. Let us peruse with care and caution the old papers now moldering in the Academy of Sciences of that capital, for there we will find that, after having rejected in its turn every discovery that was ever made since Galileo, the immortals capped the climax by turning their backs upon magnetism and mesmerism. They voluntarily shut the doors before themselves, the doors which led to those greatest mysteries of nature, which lie hid in the dark regions of the psychical as well as the physical world. The great universal solvent, the alkahest, was within the reach they passed it by, and now, after nearly a hundred years have elapsed, we read the following confession. Still it is true that, beyond the limits of direct observation, our science, chemistry, is not infallible, and our theories and systems, although they may all contain a kernel of truth, undergo frequent changes, and are often revolutionized. To assert so dogmatically that mesmerism and animal magnetism are but hallucinations, implies that it can be proved. But where are these proofs, which alone ought to have authority in science? Thousands of times the chance was given to the academicians to assure themselves of its truth, but, they have invariably declined. Vanley do mesmerists and healers invoke the testimony of the deaf, the lame, the diseased, the dying, who were cured or restored to life by simple manipulations in the apostolic laying on of hands. Coincidence is the usual reply, when the fact is too evident to be absolutely denied, will of the wisp, exaggeration, quackery, or favorite expressions, with our but too numerous Thomases. Newton, the well-known American healer, has performed more instantaneous cures than many a famous physician of New York City has had patients in all his life. Jacob, the Zouave, has had a like success in France. Must we then consider the accumulated testimony of the last forty years upon this subject to be all illusion, confederacy with clever charlatans, and lunacy? Even to breathe. P. 166. Such a stupendous fallacy would be equivalent to a self-accusation of lunacy. Notwithstanding the recent sentence of Lamery, the scoffs of the skeptics and of a vast majority of physicians and scientists, the unpopularity of the subject, and, above all, the indefatigable persecutions of the Roman Catholic clergy, fighting in mesmerism woman's traditional enemy, so evident and unconquerable is the truth of its phenomena that even the French magistrature was forced tacitly, though very reluctantly, to admit the same. The famous clairvoyant, Madame Roger, was charged with obtaining money under false pretenses, in company with her mesmerist, Dr. Fortin. On May 18, 1876, she was arraigned before the tribunal correctionnel of the same. Her witness was Baron du Petet, the Grand Master of Mesmerism in France for the last fifty years, her advocate, the no less famous Jules Favre. Truth for once triumphed the accusation was abandoned. Was it the extraordinary eloquence of the order? or bare facts incontrovertible and unimpeachable that won the day? But Lamery, the editor of the Review Spirit, had also facts in his favor, and, moreover, the evidence of over a hundred respectable witnesses, among whom were the first names of Europe. To this there is but one answer the magistrates dared not question the facts of mesmerism. Spirit photography, spirit rapping, writing, moving, talking, and even spirit materializations can be simulated, there is hardly a physical phenomenon now in Europe and America but could be imitated with apparatus by a clever juggler. The wonders of mesmerism and subjective phenomena alone defy tricksters, skepticism, stern science, and dishonest mediums, the cataleptic state is impossible to feign. Spiritualists who are anxious to have their truth proclaimed and forced on science, cultivate the mesmeric phenomena. Place on the stage of Egyptian hall a somnambulist plunged in a deep mesmeric sleep. Let her mesmerist send her freed spirit to all the places the public may suggest, test her clairvoyance and clairaudience, stick pins into any part of her body which the mesmerist may have made his passes over, thrust needles through the skin below her eyelids, 
burn her flesh and lacerate it with a sharp instrument. Do not fear! exclaim Regazzoni and Dupatet, Test, and Pierrard. Puisigu and Dolgurki, a mesmerized or entranced subject, is never heard. And when all this is performed, invite any popular wizard of the day who thirsts for puffery, and is, or pretends to be, clever at mimicking every spiritual phenomenon, to submit his body to the same test. p. 167. The speech of Jules Favre is reported to have lasted an hour and a half, and to have held the judges in the public spellbound by its eloquence. We who have heard Jules Favre believe it most readily. Only the statement embodied in the last sentence of his argument was unfortunately premature and erroneous at the same time. We are in the presence of a phenomenon which science admits without attempting to explain. The public may smile at it, but our most illustrious physicians regard it with gravity. Justice can no longer ignore what science has acknowledged. Were this sweeping declaration based upon fact and had mesmerism been impartially investigated by many instead of a few true men of science, more desirous of questioning nature than mere expediency, the public would never smile. The public is a docile and pious child, and readily goes whether the nurse leads it. It chooses its idols and fetishes, and worships them in proportion to the noise they make, and then turns round with a timid look of adulation to see whether the nurse, old Mrs. Public Opinion, is satisfied. Lactantius, the old Christian father, is said to have remarked that no skeptic in his days would have dared to maintain before a magician that the soul did not survive the body, but died together with it, or he would refute them on the spot by calling up the souls of the dead, rendering them visible to human eyes, and making them foretell future events. So with the magistrates and bench in Madame Roger's case. Baron du Patet was there, and they were afraid to see him mesmerize the somnambulist, and so forced them not only to believe in the phenomenon, but to acknowledge it which was far worse. And now to the doctrine of Paracelsus. His incomprehensible, though lively style must be read like the Biblio rolls of Ezekiel, within and without. The peril of propounding heterodox theories was great in those days, the church was powerful, and sorcerers were burnt by the dozens. For this reason, we find Paracelsus, Agrippa, and Eugenius Philolethes as notable for their pious declarations as they were famous for their achievements in alchemy and magic. The full views of Paracelsus on the occult properties of the magnet are explained partially in his famous book, Archidax Arum, in which he describes the wonderful taint. p. 168. Your, a medicine extracted from the magnet and called Magisterium Magnetis, and partially in the De Ente De, and De Ente Astrorum, lib. I but the explanations are all given in a diction unintelligible to the profane. Every peasant sees, said he, that a magnet will attract iron, but a wise man must inquire for himself. I have discovered that the magnet, besides this visible power, that of attracting iron, possesses another and concealed power. He demonstrates further that in man lies hidden a sidereal force, which is that emanation from the stars and celestial bodies of which the spiritual form of Monta Astral Spirit is composed. This identity of essence, which we may term the spirit of cometary matter, always stands in direct relation with the stars from which it was drawn and thus there exists a mutual attraction between the two, both being magnets. The identical composition of the earth and all other planetary bodies in man's terrestrial body was a fundamental idea in his philosophy. The body comes from the elements, the, astral, spirit from the stars. Man eats and drinks of the elements, for the sustenance of his blood and flesh, from the stars of the intellect and thoughts sustained in his spirit. The spectroscope has made good his theory as to the identical composition of man and stars. The physicists now lecture to their classes upon the magnetic attractions of the sun and planets. Of the substances known to compose the body of man, there have been discovered in the stars already, hydrogen, sodium, calcium, magnesium and iron. In all the stars observed, numbering many hundreds, hydrogen was found, except in two. Now, if we recollect how they have deprecated Paracelsus and his theory of man and the stars being composed of like substances, how ridiculed he was by astronomers and physicists, for his ideas of chemical affinity and attraction between the two, and then realized that the spectroscope has vindicated one of his assertions at least, is it so absurd to prophesy that in time all the rest of his theories will be substantiated? And now, a very natural question is suggested. How did Paracelsus come to learn anything of the composition of the stars, when, till a very recent period till the discovery of the spectroscope in fact the constituents of the heavenly bodies were utterly unknown to our learned academies? p. 169. And even now, 
notwithstanding telespectroscope and other very important modern improvements, except a few elements and a hypothetical chromosphere, everything is yet a mystery for them in the stars. Could Paracelsus have been so sure of the nature of the starry host, unless he had means of which science knows nothing? Yet knowing nothing she will not even here pronounce the very names of these means, which are hermetic philosophy and alchemy. We must bear in mind, moreover, that Paracelsus was the discoverer of hydrogen, and knew well all its properties and composition long before any of the orthodox academicians ever thought of it, that he had studied astrology and astronomy, as all the fire philosophers did, and that, if he did assert that man is in a direct affinity with the stars, he knew well what he asserted. The next point for the physiologist to verify is his proposition that the nourishment of the body comes not merely through the stomach, but also imperceptibly through the magnetic force, which resides in all nature and by which every individual member draws its specific nourishment to itself. Man, he further says, draws not only health from the elements when in equilibrium, but also disease when they are disturbed. Living bodies are subject to the laws of attraction and chemical affinity, as science admits, the most remarkable physical property of organic tissues, according to physiologists, is the property of imbibition. What more natural, then, than this theory of Paracelsus, that this absorbent, attractive, and chemical body of ours gathers into itself the astral or sidereal influences? The sun and the stars attract from us to themselves, and we again from them to us. What objection can science offer to this? What it is that we give off? is shown in Baron Reichenbach's discovery of the odic emanations of man, which are identical with flames from magnets, crystals, and in fact from all vegetable organisms. The unity of the universe was asserted by Paracelsus, who says that the human body is possessed of primeval stuff, or cosmic matter. The spectroscope has proved the assertion by showing that the same chemical elements which exist upon Earth and in the Sun, are also found in all the stars. The spectroscope does more, it shows that all the stars are suns, similar in constitution to our own, and as we are told by Professor Meyer, that the magnetic condition of the earth changes with every variation upon the sun's surface, and is said to be in subjection. p. 170. To emanations from the sun, the stars being suns must also give off emanations which affect us in proportionate degrees. In our dreams, says Paracelsus, we are like the plants, which have also the elementary and vital body, but possess not the spirit. In our sleep the astral body is free and can, by the elasticity of its nature, either hover round in proximity with its sleeping vehicle, or soar higher to hold converse with its starry parents, or even communicate with its brothers at great distances. Dreams of a prophetic character, prescience, and present wants, are the faculties of the astral spirit. To our elementary and grosser body, these gifts are not imparted, for at death it descends into the bosom of the earth and is reunited to the physical elements while the several spirits return to the stars. The animals, he adds, have also their presentiments, for they too have an astral body. Van Helmont, who was a disciple of Paracelsus, says much the same, though his theories on magnetism are more largely developed, and still more carefully elaborated. The magnel magnum, the means by which the secret magnetic property enables one person to affect another mutually, is attributed by him to that universal sympathy which exists between all things in nature. The cause produces the effect, the effect refers itself back to the cause, and both are reciprocated. Magnetism, he says, is an unknown property of a heavenly nature, very much resembling the stars, and not at all impeded by any boundaries of space or time. Every created being possesses his own celestial power and is closely allied with heaven. This magic power of man, which thus can operate externally, lies, as it were, hidden in the inner man. This magical wisdom and strength thus sleeps, but, by a mere suggestion is roused into activity, and becomes more living, the more the outer man of flesh in the darkness is repressed, and this, I say, the cabalistic artifacts, it brings back to the soul that magical yet natural strength which like a startled sleep had left it. Both Van Helmont and Paracelsus agree as to the great potency of the will and the state of ecstasy, they say that the spirit is everywhere diffused, and the spirit is the medium of magnetism, that pure primeval magic does not consist in superstitious practices and vain ceremonies but in the imperial will of man. It is not the spirits of heaven and of hell which are the masters over physical nature, but the soul and spirit of man which are concealed in him as the fire is concealed in the flint. The theory of the sidereal influence on man was enunciated by all the medieval philosophers. The stars consist equally of the elements. P. 
171. Of earthly bodies, says Cornelius Agrippa, and therefore the ideas attract each other. Influences only go forth through the help of the Spirit, but the Spirit is diffused through the whole universe and is in full accord with the human spirits. The magician who would acquire supernatural powers must possess faith, love, and hope. In all things there is a secret power concealed, and thence come the miraculous powers of magic. The modern theory of General Pleasanton singularly coincides with the views of the fire philosophers. His view of the positive and negative electricities of man and woman, and the mutual attraction and repulsion of everything in nature seems to be copied from that of Robert Flood, the Grand Master of the Rosicrucians of England. When two men approach each other, says the fire philosopher, their magnetism is either passive or active, that is, positive or negative. If the emanations which they send out are broken or thrown back, there arises antipathy. But when the emanations pass through each other from both sides, then there is positive magnetism, for the rays proceed from the center to the circumference. In this case they not only affect sicknesses but also moral sentiments. This magnetism or sympathy is found not only among animals but also in plants and in minerals. And now we will notice how, when Mesmer had imported into France's Bacchae a system based entirely on the philosophy and doctrines of the Paracelsites the great psychological and physiological discovery was treated by the physicians. It will demonstrate how much ignorance, superficiality, and prejudice can be displayed by a scientific body, when the subject clashes with their own cherished theories. It is the more important because, to the neglect of the committee of the French Academy of 1784 is probably due the present materialistic drift of the public mind, and certainly the gaps in the atomic philosophy which we have seen as most devoted teachers confessing to exist. The committee of 1784 comprised men of such eminence as Bury, Salon, Darcet, and the famous Guillotin, to whom were subsequently added, Franklin, Oroy, Bailly, de Bourg, and Lavoisier. Bury died shortly afterward and Magault succeeded him. There can be no doubt of two things, viz., that the committee began their work under strong prejudices and only because peremptorily ordered to do it by the king, and that their manner of observing the delicate facts of mesmerism was injudicious and illiberal. Their report, drawn by Bailly, was intended to be a death blow to the new science. It was spread ostentatiously throughout all the schools and ranks of society, rousing the bitterest feelings. p. 172. Among a large portion of the aristocracy and rich commercial class, who had patronized Mesmer and had been eyewitnesses of his cures. Aunt. L. Did you see you, an active mission of the highest rank, who had thoroughly investigated the subject with the eminent court physician, Deslin, published a counter-report drawn with minute exactness, in which he advocated the careful observation by the medical faculty of the therapeutic effects of the magnetic fluid and insisted upon the immediate publication of their discoveries and observations. His demand was met by the appearance of a great number of memoirs, polemical works, and dogmatical books developing new facts, and Thorpe's works entitled Recherches et Dudes sur le Magnetisme Animal, displaying a vast erudition, stimulated research into the records of the past, and the magnetic phenomena of successive nations from the remotest antiquity were laid before the public. The doctrine of Mesmer was simply a restatement of the doctrines of Paracelsus, Van Helmont, St. Anethley, and Maxwell, the Scotchman and he was even guilty of copying texts from the work of Bertrand, and enunciating them as his own principles. In Professor Stewart's work, the author regards our universe as composed of atoms with some sort of medium between them as the machine, and the laws of energy as the laws working this machine. Professor Humans calls this a modern doctrine, but we find among the 27 propositions laid down by Mesmer, in 1775, just one century earlier, in his letter to a foreign physician, the following. First, there exists a mutual influence between the heavenly bodies, the earth, and living bodies. 2d. A fluid, universally diffused and continued, so as to admit no vacuum, whose subtility is beyond all comparison, and which, from its nature, is capable of receiving, propagating, and communicating all the impressions of motion, is the medium of this influence. It would appear from this, that the theory is not so modern after all. Professor Balfour Stewart says, we may regard the universe in the light of a vast physical machine. In Mesmer. 3d. This reciprocal action is subject to mechanical laws, unknown up to the present time. Professor Meyer, reaffirming Gilbert's doctrine that the earth is a great magnet, 
remarks that the mysterious variations in the intensity of its force seem to be in subjection to emanations from the sun, changing with the apparent daily and yearly revolutions of that orb, and pulsating. p. 173. In sympathy with the huge waves of fire which sweep over its surface. He speaks of the constant fluctuation, the ebb and flow of the Earth's directive influence. In Mesmer. Fourth. From this action result alternate effects which may be considered a flux and reflux. Six. It is by this operation, the most universal of those presented to us by nature, that the relations of activity occur between the heavenly bodies, the Earth, and its constituent parts. There are two more which will be interesting reading to our modern scientists. Seventh. The properties of matter, and of organized body, depend on this operation. Eighth. The animal body experiences the alternate effects of this agent, and it is by insinuating itself into the substance of the nerves, that it immediately affects them. Among other important works which appeared between 1798 and 1824, when the French Academy appointed its second commission to investigate mesmerism, the Annal du Magnetisme Animal, by the Baron de Nom de Cuvier, Lieutenant General, Chevalier of St. Louis, member of the Academy of Sciences, and correspondent of many of the learned societies of Europe, may be consulted with great advantage. In 1820 the Prussian government instructed the Academy of Berlin to offer a prize of 300 ducats in gold for the best thesis on mesmerism. The Royal Scientific Society of Paris, under the presidency of His Royal Highness the Duc d'Angoulême, offered a gold medal for the same purpose. The Marquis de La Place, peer of France, one of the forty of the Academy of Sciences, an honorary member of the learned societies of all the principal European governments, issued a work entitled Essai Philosophique sur les Probabilites, in which this eminent scientist says, of all the instruments that we can employ to know the imperceptible agents of nature, the most sensitive are the nerves, especially when exceptional influences increase their sensibility. The singular phenomena which result from this extreme nervous sensitiveness of certain individuals, have given birth to diverse opinions as to the existence of a new agent, which has been named animal magnetism. We are so far from knowing all the agents of nature and their various modes of action that it would be hardly philosophical to deny the phenomena, simply because they are inexplicable, in the actual state of our information. It is simply your duty to examine them with an attention as much more scrupulous as it seems difficult to admit them. The experiments of Mesmer were vastly improved upon by the Marquis de Puisigou, who entirely dispensed with apparatus and produced. p. 174. Remarkable cures among the tenants of his estate at Byzancy. These being given to the public, many other educated men experimented with like success, and in 1825 M. Foisic proposed to the Academy of Medicine to institute a new inquiry. A special committee, consisting of Adelon, Parisi, Mark, Burden, Senator, with Husson as reporter, united in a recommendation that the suggestion should be adopted. They make the manly avowal that in science no decision whatever is absolute and irrevocable, and afford us the means to estimate the value which should be attached to the conclusions of the Franklin Committee of 1784, by saying that the experiments on which this judgment was founded appeared to have been conducted without the simultaneous and necessary assembling together of all the commissioners, and also with moral predispositions, which, according to the principles of the fact which they were appointed to examine, must cause their complete failure. What they say concerning magnetism as a secret remedy, has been said many times by the most respected writers upon modern spiritualism, namely, it is the duty of the academy to study it, to subject it to trials, finally, to take away the use and practice of it from persons quite strangers to the art, who abuse this means, and make it an object of lucre and speculation. This report provoked long debates, but in May, 1826, the Academy appointed a commission which comprised the following illustrious names, Rue, Bordeaux de Lamont, Double, Magendi, Gerson, Husson, Delay, Marc, Itar, Fouquier, and Genaudamussi. They began their labors immediately, and continued them five years, communicating, through Monsieur Husson, to the Academy the results of their observations. The report embraces accounts of phenomena classified under 34 different paragraphs, but as this work is not specially devoted to the science of magnetism, we must be content with a few brief extracts. They assert that neither contact of the hands, frictions, nor passes are invariably needed, since, on several occasions, the will, fixedness of stare, has sufficed to produce magnetic phenomena, even without the knowledge of the magnetized. 
while attested and therapeutical phenomena depend on magnetism alone, and are not reproduced without it. The state of somnambulism exists and occasions the development of new faculties, which have received the denominations of clairvoyance, intuition, internal prevision. Sleep, the magnetic, has been excited under circumstances where those magnetized could not see, and were entirely ignorant of the means employed to occasion it. The magnetizer, having once controlled a subject, may put him completely into somnambulism, take him out of it without his knowledge, out of his sight, at a certain distance, and through closed doors. The external senses of the sleeper. P. 175. Seem to be completely paralyzed, and a duplicate set to be brought into action. Most of the time they are entirely strangers to the external and unexpected noise made in their ears, such as the sound of copper vessels, forcibly struck, the fall of any heavy substance, and so forth. One may make them respire hydrochloric acid or ammonia without inconveniencing them by it, or without even a suspicion on their part. The committee could tickle their feet, nostrils, and the angles of the eyes by the approach of a feather, pinch their skin so as to produce ecchymosis, prick it under the nails with pins plunged to a considerable depth without the evincing of any pain, or by sign of being at all aware of it. In a word, we have seen one person who was insensible to one of the most painful operations of surgery, and whose countenance, pulse, or respiration did not manifest the slightest emotion. So much for the external senses, now let us see what they have to say about the internal ones, which may fairly be considered as proving a marked difference between man and the mutton protoplasm. Whilst they are in this state of somnambulism, say the committee, the magnetized persons we have observed, retain the exercise of the faculties which they have whilst awake. Their memory even appears to be more faithful and more extensive. We have seen two somnambulists distinguish, with their eyes shut, the objects placed before them, they have told, without touching them, the color and value of the cards, they have read words traced with the hand, or some lines of books opened by mere chance. This phenomenon took place, even when the opening of the eyelids was accurately closed, by means of the fingers. We met, and two somnambulists, the power of foreseeing acts more or less complicated of the organism. One of them announced several days, nay, several months beforehand, the day, the hour, and the minute when epileptic fits would come on in return, the other declared the time of the cure. Their previsions were realized with remarkable exactness. The Commission say that it has collected and communicated facts sufficiently important to induce it to think that the Academy should encourage the researches on magnetism as a very curious branch of psychology and natural history. The Committee conclude by saying that the facts are so extraordinary that they scarcely imagine that the Academy will concede their reality, but protest that they have been throughout animated by motives of a lofty character, the love of science and by the necessity of justifying the hopes which the Academy had entertained of our zeal and our devotion. Their fears were fully justified by the conduct of at least one member of their own number, who had absented himself from the experiments, and, as M. Husson tells us, did not deem it right to sign the report. p. 176. This was Magendi, the physiologist, who, despite the fact stated by the official report that he had not been present at the experiments, did not hesitate to devote four pages of his famous work on human physiology to the subject of mesmerism, and after summarizing its alleged phenomena, without endorsing them as unreservedly as the erudition and scientific acquirements of his fellow committeemen would seem to have exacted, says, self-respect and the dignity of the profession demand circumspection on these points. He, the well-informed physician, will remember how readily mystery glides into charlatanry, and how apt a profession is to become degraded even by its semblance when countenanced by respectable practitioners. No word in the context lets his readers into the secret that he had been duly appointed by the Academy to serve on the Commission of 1826, had absented himself from its sittings, had so failed to learn the truth about mesmeric phenomena, and was now pronouncing judgment ex parte. Self-respect and the dignity of the profession probably exacted silence. Thirty-eight years later, an English scientist, whose specialty is the investigation of physics, and whose reputation is even greater than that of Magendi, stooped to as unfair a course of conduct. When the opportunity offered to investigate the spiritualistic phenomena, and aid in taking it out of the hands of ignorant or dishonest investigators, Professor John Tyndall avoided the subject, but in his fragments of science, he was guilty of the ungentlemanly expressions which we have quoted in another place. Well, we are wrong, he made one attempt, and that sufficed. He tells us, in the fragments, that he once got under a table, 
to see how the wraps were made, and arose with a despair for humanity, such as he never felt before. Israel Putnam, crawling on hand and knee to kill the she-wolf in her den, partially affords a parallel by which to estimate the chemist's courage in groping in the dark after the ugly truth, but Putnam killed his wolf, and Tyndall was devoured by his. Sub mensa desperatio should be the motto on his shield. Speaking of the report of the Committee of 1824, Dr. Alphonse Test, a distinguished contemporaneous scientist, says that it produced a great impression on the Academy, but few convictions, no one could question the veracity of the commissioners, whose good faith as well as great knowledge were undeniable, but they were suspected of having been dupes. In fact, there are certain unfortunate truths which compromise those who believe in them, and those especially who are so candid as to avow them publicly. How true this is, let the records of history, from the earliest times to this very day, attest. When Professor Robert Hare announced the preliminary results of his spiritualistic investigations, he p. 177, albeit one of the most eminent chemists and physicists in the world, was, nevertheless, regarded as a dupe. When he proved that he was not, he was charged with having fallen into dotage, the Harvard professors denouncing his insane adherence to the gigantic humbug. When the professor began his investigations in 1853, he announced that he felt called upon, as an act of duty to his fellow creatures, to bring whatever influence he possessed to the attempt to stem the tide of popular madness, which, in defiance of reason and science, was fast setting in favor of the gross delusion called spiritualism. Though, according to his declaration, he entirely coincided with Faraday's theory of table-turning, he had the true greatness which characterizes the princes of science to make his investigation thorough and then tell the truth. How he was rewarded by his lifelong associates, let his own words tell. In an address delivered in New York, in September, 1854, he says that he had been engaged in scientific pursuits for upwards of half a century, and his accuracy and precision had never been questioned, until he had become a spiritualist, while his integrity as a man had never in his life been assailed, until the Harvard professors fulminated their report against that which he knew to be true, and which they did not know to be false. How much mournful pathos is expressed in these few words? An old man of 76, a scientist of half a century, deserted for telling the truth. And now Mr. A. R. Wallace, who had previously been esteemed among the most illustrious of British scientists, having proclaimed his belief in spiritualism and mesmerism, is spoken of in terms of compassion. Professor Nicholas Wagner, of St. Petersburg, whose reputation as a zoologist is one of the most conspicuous, in his turn pays the penalty of his exceptional candor, and his outrageous treatment by the Russian scientists. There are scientists and scientists and if the occult scientists suffer in the instance of modern spiritualism from the malice of one class, nevertheless, they have had their defenders at all times among men whose names have shed luster upon science itself. In the first rank stands Isaac Newton, the light of science, who was a thorough believer in magnetism, as taught by Paracelsus, Van Helmont, and by the fire philosophers in general. No one will presume to deny that his doctrine of universal space and attraction is purely a theory of magnetism. If his own words mean anything at all, they mean that he based all his speculations upon the soul of the world, the great universal, magnetic agent, which he called the divine sensorium. Here, he says, the p. 178. Question is of a very subtle spirit which penetrates through all, even the hardest bodies and which is concealed in their substance. Through the strength and activity of this spirit, bodies attract each other, and adhere together when brought into contact. Through it, electrical bodies operate at the remotest distance, as well as near at hand, attracting and repelling. Through this spirit the light also flows, and is refracted and reflected, and warms bodies. All senses are excited by this spirit, and through it the animals move their limbs. But these things cannot be explained in few words, and we have not yet sufficient experience to determine fully the laws by which this universal spirit operates. There are two kinds of magnetization, the first is purely animal, the other transcendent, and depending on the will and knowledge of the mesmerizer, as well as on the degree of spirituality of the subject, and his capacity to receive the impressions of the astral light. But now it is next to ascertain that clairvoyance depends a great deal more on the former than on the latter. To the power of an adept, like Dupatet, the most positive subject will have to submit. If his sight is ably directed by the mesmerizer, magician, or spirit, the light must yield up its most secret records to our scrutiny, for, 
If it is a book which is ever closed to those who see and do not perceive, on the other hand it is ever open for one who wills to see it opened. It keeps an unmutilated record of all that was, that is, or ever will be. The minutest acts of our lives are imprinted on it, and even our thoughts rest photographed on its eternal tablets. It is the book which we see open by the angel in the Revelation, which is the book of life, and out of which the dead are judged according to their works. It is, in short, the memory of God. The oracles assert that the impression of thoughts, characters, men, and other divine visions, appear in the ether. In this the things without figure are figured, says an ancient fragment of the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster. Thus, ancient as well as modern wisdom, vaticination and science, agree in corroborating the claims of the Kabbalists. It is on the indestructible tablets of the astral light that has stamped the impression of every thought we think, and every act we perform, and that future events effects of long-forgotten causes are already delineated as a vivid picture for the eye of the seer and prophet to follow. Memory the despair of the materialist, the enigma of the psychologist, the sphinx of science is to the student of old philosophies merely a name to express that power which man unconsciously exerts, and shares with. P. 179. Many of the inferior animals to look with inner sight into the astral light, and there behold the images of past sensations and incidents. Instead of searching the cerebral ganglia for micrographs of the living and the dead, of scenes that we have visited, of incidents in which we have borne a part, they went to the vast repository where the records of every man's life as well as every pulsation of the visible cosmos are stored up for all eternity. That flash of memory which is traditionally supposed to show a drowning man every long-forgotten scene of his mortal life as the landscape is revealed to the traveler by intermittent flashes of lightning is simply the sudden glimpse which the struggling soul gets into the silent galleries where his history is depicted in imperishable colors. The well-known fact one corroborated by the personal experience of nine persons out of ten that we often recognize as familiar to us, scenes, and landscapes, and conversations, which we see or hear for the first time and sometimes in countries never visited before, is a result of the same causes. Believers in reincarnation adduce this as an additional proof of our antecedent existence in other bodies. This recognition of men, countries, and things that we have never seen, is attributed by them to flashes of soul memory of anterior experiences. But the men of old, in common with medieval philosophers, firmly held to a contrary opinion. They affirm that though this psychological phenomenon was one of the greatest arguments in favor of immortality and the soul's pre-existence, yet the latter being endowed with an individual memory apart from that of our physical brain, it is no proof of reincarnation. As Eliphas Levi beautifully expresses it, nature shuts the door after everything that passes, and pushes life onward in more perfected forms. The chrysalis becomes a butterfly, the latter can never become again a grub. In the stillness of the night hours, when our bodily senses are fast locked in the fetters of sleep, and our elementary body rests, the astral form becomes free. It then oozes out of its earthly prison, and as Paracelsus has it confabulates with the outward world, and travels round the visible as well as the invisible worlds. In sleep, he says, the astral body, soul, is in freer motion, than it soars to its parents, and holds converse with the stars. Dreams, forebodings, prescience, Prognostications and presentiments are impressions left by our astral spirit on our brain, which receives them more or less distinctly, according to the proportion of blood with which it is supplied during the hours of sleep. The more the body is exhausted, the freer is the spiritual man, and the more vivid the impressions of our soul's memory. In heavy and robust sleep, dream. p. 180. Lesson uninterrupted. Upon awakening to outward consciousness, men may sometimes remember nothing. But the impressions of scenes and landscapes which the astral body saw in its peregrinations are still there, though lying latent under the pressure of matter. They may be awakened at any moment, and then, during such flashes of man's inner memory, there is an instantaneous interchange of energies between the visible and the invisible universes. Between the micrographs of the cerebral ganglia and the photocenographic galleries of the astral light, a current is established. And a man who knows that he is never visited in body, nor seen the landscape and person that he recognizes may well assert that still has he seen and knows them, for the acquaintance was formed while traveling in spirit. To this the physiologist can have but one objection. They will answer that in natural sleep perfect and deep, half of our nature which is volitional is in the condition of inertia, hence unable to travel, 
the more so as the existence of any such individual astral body or soul is considered by them little else than a poetical myth. Blumenbach assures us that in the state of sleep, all intercourse between mind and body is suspended, an assertion which is denied by Dr. Richardson, F. R. S., who honestly reminds the German scientists that the precise limits and connections of mind and body being unknown it is more than should be said. This confession, added to those of the French physiologist, Fournier, and the still more recent one of Dr. Alchin, an eminent London physician, who frankly avowed, in an address to students, that of all scientific pursuits which practically concern the community, there is none perhaps which rests upon so uncertain and insecure a basis as medicine, gives us a certain right to offset the hypotheses of ancient scientists against those of the modern ones. No man, however gross and material he may be, can avoid leading a double existence, one in the visible universe, the other in the invisible. The life principle which animates his physical frame is chiefly in the astral body, and while the more animal portions of him rest, the more spiritual ones know neither limits nor obstacles. We are perfectly aware that many learned, as well as the unlearned, will object to such a novel theory of the distribution of the life principle. They would prefer remaining in blissful ignorance and go on confessing that no one knows or can pretend to tell whence and whither this mysterious agent appears and disappears, than to give one moment's attention to what they consider old and exploded theories. Some might object on the ground taken by theology, that dumb brutes have no immortal souls, and hence, can have no astral spirits, but theologians as well as laymen labor under the erroneous impression that soul and spirit are one and the same thing. p. 181. But if we study Plato and other philosophers of old, we may readily perceive that while the irrational soul, by which Plato meant our astral body, or the more ethereal representation of ourselves, can have at best only a more or less prolonged continuity of existence beyond the grave, the divine spirit wrongly termed soul, by the church is immortal by its very essence. Any Hebrew scholar will readily appreciate the distinction who comprehends the difference between the two words Ruah and Nepesh. If the life principle is something apart from the astral spirit and in no way connected with it, why is it that the intensity of the clairvoyant powers depends so much on the bodily prostration of the subject? The deeper the trance, the less signs of life the body shows, the clearer become the spiritual perceptions, and the more powerful are the soul's visions. The soul, this burden of the bodily senses, shows activity of power in a far greater degree of intensity than it can in a strong, healthy body. Briere de Blanc gives repeated instances of this fact. The organs of sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing are proved to become far acuter in a mesmerized subject deprived of the possibility of exercising them bodily, than while he uses them in his normal state. Such facts alone, once proved, ought to stand as invincible demonstrations of the continuity of individual life, at least for a certain period after the body has been left by us, either by reason of its being worn out or by accident. But though during its brief sojourn on earth our soul may be assimilated to a light hidden under a bushel, it still shines more or less bright and attracts to itself the influences of kindred spirits, and when a thought of good or evil import is begotten in our brain, it draws to it impulses of like nature as irresistibly as the magnet attracts iron filings. This attraction is also proportionate to the intensity with which the thought impulse makes itself felt in the ether, and so it will be understood how one man may impress himself upon his own epoch so forcibly, that the influence may be carried through the ever-interchanging currents of energy between the two worlds, the visible and the invisible from one succeeding age to another, until it affects a large portion of mankind. How much the authors of the famous work entitled The Unseen Universe may have allowed themselves to think in this direction, it would be difficult to say, but that they have not told all they might will be inferred from the following language. Regard it as you please, there can be no doubt that the properties of the ether are of a much higher order in the arcana of nature than those of tangible matter. And, as even the high priests of science still find the latter far beyond their comprehension, except in numerous but minute. p. 182. In often isolated particulars, it would not become us to speculate further. It is sufficient for our purpose to know from what the ether certainly does, that it is capable of vastly more than any has yet ventured to say. One of the most interesting discoveries of modern times, is that of the faculty which enables a certain class of sensitive persons to receive from any object held in the hand or against the forehead impressions of the character or appearance of the individual, or any other object with which it has previously been in contact. Thus a manuscript, painting, article of clothing, or jewelry no matter how ancient conveys to the sensitive, a vivid picture of the writer, 
painter, or wearer, even though he lived in the days of Ptolemy Renop. Nay, more, a fragment of an ancient building will recall its history and even the scenes which transpired within or about it. A bit of it will carry the soul vision back to the time when it was in process of formation. This faculty is called by its discovered Professor J. R. Buchanan, of Louisville, Kentucky Psychometry. To him, the world is indebted for this most important addition to psychological sciences, and to him, perhaps, when skepticism is found fell to the ground by such accumulation of facts, posterity will have to elevate a statue. In announcing to the public his great discovery, Professor Buchanan, confining himself to the power of psychometry to delineate human character, says, the mental and physiological influence imparted to writing appears to be imperishable, as the oldest specimens I have investigated gave their impressions with a distinctness and force, little impaired by time. Old manuscripts, requiring an antiquary to decipher their strange old penmanship, were easily interpreted by the psychometric power. The property of retaining the impress of mind is not limited to writing. Drawings, paintings, everything upon which human contact, thought, and volition have been expended, may become linked with that thought in life, so as to recall them to the mind of another when in contact. Without, perhaps, really knowing, at the early time of the grand discovery, the significance of his own prophetic words, the professor adds, this discovery, in its application to the arts and to history, will open a mine of interesting knowledge. The existence of this faculty was first experimentally demonstrated in 1841. It has since been verified by a thousand psychometers in different parts of the world. It proves that every occurrence in nature no matter how minute or unimportant leaves its indelible impress upon physical nature, and, as there has been no appreciable molecular dis. p. 183. Turbans. The only inference possible is, that these images have been produced by that invisible, universal force ether, or astral light. In his charming work, entitled The Soul of Things, Professor Denton, the geologist, enters at great length into a discussion of this subject. He gives a multitude of examples of the psychometrical power, which Mrs. Denton possesses in a marked degree. A fragment of Cicero's house, at Tusculum, enabled her to describe, without the slightest intimation as to the nature of the object placed on her forehead, not only the great order's surroundings, but also the previous owner of the building, Cornelius Sulla Felix, or, as he is usually called, Sulla the Dictator. A fragment of marble from the ancient Christian church of Smyrna, brought before her its congregation and officiating priests. Specimens from Nineveh, China, Jerusalem, Greece, Ararat, and other places all over the world brought up scenes in the life of various personages, whose ashes had been scattered thousands of years ago. In many cases Professor Denton verified the statements by reference to historical records. More than this, a bit of the skeleton, or a fragment of the tooth of some antediluvian animal caused the seeress to perceive the creature as it was when alive, and even led for a few brief moments its life, and experience its sensations. Before the eager quest of the psychometer, the most hidden recesses of the domain of nature yield up their secrets, and the events of the most remote epochs rival in vividness of impression the flooding circumstances of yesterday. Says the author, in the same work, not a leaf waves, not an insect crawls, not a ripple moves, but each motion is recorded by a thousand faithful scribes in infallible and indelible scripture. This is just as true of all past time. From the dawn of light upon this infant globe, when round its cradle the steamy curtains hung, to this moment, nature has been busy photographing everything. What a picture gallery is hers. It appears to us the height of impossibility to imagine that scenes in ancient Thebes, or in some temple of prehistoric times should be photographed only upon the substance of certain atoms. The images of the events are embedded in that all-permeating, universal, and ever-retaining medium, which the philosophers call the soul of the world, and Mr. Denton the soul of things. The psychometer, by applying the fragment of a substance to his forehead, brings his inner self into relations with the inner soul of the object he handles. It is now admitted that the universal ether pervades all things in nature, even the most solid. It is beginning to be admitted, also, that this preserves the images of all. P. 184. Things which transpire. When the psychometer examines his specimen, he is brought in contact with the current of the astral light, connected with that specimen, and which retains pictures of the events associated with its history. These, according to Denton, pass before his vision with the swiftness of light, scene after scene crowding upon each other so rapidly, 
that it is only by the supreme exercise of the will that he is able to hold anyone in the field of vision long enough to describe it. The psychometer is clairvoyant, that is, he sees with the inner eye. Unless his willpower is very strong, unless he has thoroughly trained himself to that particular phenomenon, and his knowledge of the capabilities of his sight are profound, his perceptions of places, persons, and events, must necessarily be very confused. But in the case of mesmerization, in which the same clairvoyant faculty is developed, the operator, whose will holds that of the subject under control, can force him to concentrate his attention upon a given picture long enough to observe all its minute details. Moreover, under the guidance of an experienced mesmerizer, the seer would excel the natural psychometer in having a prevision of future events, more distinct and clear than the latter. And to those who might object to the possibility of perceiving that which yet is not, we may put the question, why is it more impossible to see that which will be, than to bring back to sight that which is gone, and is no more? According to the Kabbalistic doctrine, the future exists in the astral light and embryo, as the present existed in embryo in the past. While man is free to act as he pleases, the manner in which he will act was foreknown from all time, not on the ground of fatalism or destiny, but simply on the principle of universal, unchangeable harmony, and, as it may be foreknown that, when a musical note is struck, its vibrations will not, and cannot change into those of another note. Besides, eternity can have neither past nor future, but only the present, as boundless space, in its strictly literal sense, can have neither distant nor approximate places. Our conceptions, limited to the narrow area of our experience, attempt to fit if not an end, at least the beginning of time and space, but neither of these exist in reality, for in such case time would not be eternal, nor space boundless. The past no more exists than the future, as we have said, only our memories survive, and our memories are but the glimpses that we catch of the reflections of this past in the currents of the astral light, as the psychometer catches them from the astral emanations of the object held by him. Says Professor E. Hitchcock, when speaking of the influences of light upon bodies, and of the formation of pictures upon them by means of it, it seems, then, that this photographic influence pervades all nature, nor can we say where it stops. We do not know but it may imprint upon. p. 185. The world around us are features, as they are modified by various passions, and thus fill nature with the garotype impressions of all our actions, it may be, too, that there are tests by which nature, more skillful than any photographist, can bring out and fix these portraits, so that acuter senses than ours shall see them as on a great canvas, spread over the material universe. Perhaps, too, they may never fade from that canvas, but become specimens in the great picture gallery of eternity. The perhaps of Professor Hitchcock is henceforth changed by the demonstration of psychometry into a triumphant certitude. Those who understand these psychological and clairvoyant faculties will take exception to Professor Hitchcock's idea, that acuter senses and hours are needed to see these pictures upon his supposed cosmic canvas, and maintain that he should have confined his limitations to the external senses of the body. The human spirit, being of the divine, a mortal spirit, appreciates neither past nor future, but sees all things as in the present. These daguerreotypes referred to in the above quotation are imprinted upon the astral light, where, as we said before and, according to the hermetic teaching, the first portion of which is already accepted and demonstrated by science has kept the record of all that was, is, or ever will be. Of late, some of our learned men have given a particular attention to a subject hitherto branded with the mark of superstition. They begin speculating on hypothetical and invisible worlds. The authors of the unseen universe were the first to boldly take the lead, and already they find a follower in Professor Fisk, whose speculations are given in the unseen world. Evidently the scientists are probing the insecure ground of materialism, and, feeling it trembling under their feet, are preparing for a less dishonorable surrender of arms in case of defeat. Jevons confirms Babbage, and both firmly believe that every thought, displacing the particles of the brain and setting them in motion, scatters them throughout the universe, and think that each particle of the existing matter must be a register of all that has happened. On the other hand, Dr. Thomas Young, in his lectures on natural philosophy, most positively invites us to speculate with freedom on the possibility of independent worlds, some existing in different parts, others pervading each other, unseen and unknown, in the same space, and others again to which space may not be a necessary mode of existence. If scientists, proceeding from a strictly scientific point of view, such as the possibility of energy being transferred into the invisible universe and on the principle of continuity, 
indulge in such speculations. Why should occultists and spiritualists be refused the same privilege? Ganglionic. P. 186. Impressions on the surface of polished metal are registered and may be preserved for an indefinite space of time, according to science, and Professor Draper illustrates the fact most poetically. A shadow, says he, never falls upon a wall without leaving there upon a permanent trace, a trace which might be made visible by resorting to proper processes. The portraits of our friends, or landscape views, may be hidden on the sensitive surface from the eye, but they are ready to make their appearance, as soon as proper developers are resorted to. A specter is concealed on a silver or glassy surface, until, by our necromancy, we make it come forth into the visible world. Upon the walls of our most private apartments, where we think the eye of intrusion is altogether shut out, and our retirement can never be profaned, there exist the vestiges of all our acts, silhouettes of whatever we have done. If an indelible impression may be thus obtained on inorganic matter, and if nothing is lost or passes completely out of existence in the universe, why such a scientific levy of arms against the authors of the unseen universe? And on what ground can they reject the hypothesis that thought, conceived to affect the matter of another universe simultaneously with this, may explain a future state? In our opinion, if psychometry is one of the grandest proofs of the indestructibility of matter, retaining eternally the impressions of the outward world, the possession of that faculty by our inner sight is a still greater one in favor of the immortality of man's individual spirit. Capable of discerning events which took place hundreds of thousands of years ago, why would it not apply the same faculty to a future lost in the eternity, in which there can be neither past nor future, but only one boundless present? Notwithstanding the confessions of stupendous ignorance in some things, made by the scientists themselves, they still deny the existence of that mysterious spiritual force, lying beyond the grasp of the ordinary physical laws. They still hope to be able to apply to living beings the same laws which they have found to answer in reference to dead matter. And, having discovered what the Kabbalists term the gross purgations of ether light, heat, electricity, and motion they have rejoiced over their good fortune, counted its vibrations in producing the colors of the spectrum, and, proud of their achievements, refuse to see any further. Several men of science have pondered more or less over its protein essence, and unable to measure it with their photometers, called it an hypothetical medium of great elasticity and extreme tenuity, supposed to. p. 187. Pervade all space, the interior of solid bodies not accepted, and, to be the medium of transmission of light and heat, dictionary. Others, whom we will name the will of the wisps of science or pseudo-sons examined it also, and even went to the trouble of scrutinizing it through powerful glasses, they tell us. But perceiving neither spirits nor ghosts in it, and failing equally to discover in its treacherous waves anything of a more scientific character, they turned round and called all believers in immortality in general, and spiritualists in particular, insane fools and visionary lunatics, the whole, in doleful accents, perfectly appropriate to the circumstance of such a sad failure. Say the authors of the unseen universe. We have driven the operation of that mystery called life out of the objective universe. The mistake made, lies in imagining that by this process they completely get rid of a thing so driven before them, and that it disappears from the universe altogether. It does no such thing. It only disappears from that small circle of light which we may call the universe of scientific perception. Call it the trinity of mystery, mystery of matter, the mystery of life and the mystery of God and these three are one. Taking the ground that the visible universe must certainly, in transformable energy, and probably in matter, come to an end, and the principle of continuity, still demanding a continuance of the universe. The authors of this remarkable work find themselves forced to believe that there is something beyond that which is visible, and that the visible system is not the whole universe but only, it may be, a very small part of it. Furthermore, looking back as well as forward to the origin of this visible universe, the authors urge that if the visible universe is all that exists then the first abrupt manifestation of it is as truly a break of continuity as its final overthrow. Art. 85. Therefore, as such a break is against the accepted law of continuity, the authors come to the following conclusion. Now, is it not natural to imagine, that a universe of this nature, which we have reason to think exists, and is connected by bonds of energy with the visible universe, is also capable of receiving energy from it? May we not regard ether, or the medium, as not merely a bridge between? p. 188. One order of things in another, 
forming as it were a species of cement, in virtue of which the various orders of the universe are welded together and made into one? In fine, what we generally called ether, may be not a mere medium, but a medium plus the invisible order of things, so that when the motions of the visible universe are transferred into ether, part of them are conveyed as by a bridge into the invisible universe, and are there made use of and stored up. Nay, is it even necessary to retain the conception of a bridge? May we not at once say that when energy is carried from matter into ether, it is carried from the visible into the invisible, and that when it is carried from ether to matter it is carried from the invisible into the visible? Art. 198. Unseen Universe. Precisely, and were science to take a few more steps in that direction and fathom more seriously the hypothetical medium who knows but Tyndall's impassable chasm between the physical processes of the brain and consciousness, might be at least intellectually passed with surprising ease and safety. So far back as 1856, a man considered a savant in his days Dr. Jabbar of Paris, had certainly the same ideas as the authors of the unseen universe, on ether, when he startled the press in the world of science by the following declaration. I hold a discovery which frightens me. There are two kinds of electricity. One, brute and blind, is produced by the contact of metals and acids. The gross purgation, the other is intelligent and clairvoyant. Electricity has bifurcated itself in the hands of Golvani, Nobili, and Matusi. The brute force of the current has followed Jacobi, Benelli, and Munkel, while the intellectual one was following Bois Robert, Thelorier, and the Chevalier du Planty. The electric ball or globular electricity contains a thought which disobeys Newton and Marriott to follow its own freaks. We have, in the annals of the Academy, thousands of proofs of the intelligence of the electric bolt, but I remark that I am permitting myself to become indiscreet. A little more and I should have disclosed to you the key which is about to discover to us the universal spirit. The foregoing, added to the wonderful confessions of science and what we have just quoted from the unseen universe throw an additional luster on the wisdom of the long-departed ages. In one of the preceding chapters we have alluded to a quotation from Corey's translation of ancient fragments, in which it appears that one of the Chaldean oracles expresses the self-same idea about ether, and in language singularly like. p. 189. That of the authors of the unseen universe. It states that from ether have come all things, and to it all will return, that the images of all things are indelibly impressed upon it and that it is the storehouse of the germs or of the remains of all visible forms, and even ideas. It appears as if this case strangely corroborates our assertion that whatever discoveries may be made in our days will be found to have been anticipated by many thousand years by our simple-minded ancestors. At the point at which we are now arrived, the attitude assumed by the materialist toward psychical phenomena being perfectly defined. We may assert with safety that were this key lying loose on the threshold of the chasm not one of our tindles would stoop and pick it up. How timid would appear to some cabalists these tentative efforts to solve the great mystery of the universal ether. Although so far in advance of anything propounded by contemporary philosophers, what the intelligent explorers of the unseen universe speculate upon, was to the masters of hermetic philosophy familiar science. To them ether was not merely a bridge connecting the seen and unseen sides of the universe, but across its span their daring feet followed the road that led through the mysterious gates which modern speculators either will not or cannot unlock. The deeper the research of the modern explorer, the more often he comes face to face with the discoveries of the ancients. Does Elie de Beaumont, the great French geologist, venture a hint upon the terrestrial circulation, in relation to some elements in the Earth's crust, he finds himself anticipated by the old philosophers? Do we demand of distinguished technologists, what are the most recent discoveries in regard to the origin of the metalliferous deposits? We hear one of them, Professor Sterry Hunt in showing us how water is a universal solvent, enunciating the doctrine held and taught by the old dailies, more than two dozen centuries ago, that water was the principle of all things. We listened to the same professor, with de Beaumont as authority, expounding the terrestrial circulation, and the chemical and physical phenomena of the material world. While we read with pleasure that he is not prepared to concede that we have in chemical and physical processes the whole secret of organic life, we note with a still greater delight the following honest confession on his part, still we are, in many respects, approximating the phenomena of the organic world to those of the mineral kingdom, and we at the same time learn that these so far interest and depend upon each other that we begin to see a certain truth underlying the notion of those old philosophers, who extended to the mineral world the notion of a vital force, which led them to speak of the earth as a great living organism, 
and to look upon the various changes of its air, its waters, and its rocky depths, as processes belonging to the life of our planet. p. 190. Everything in this world must have a beginning. Things have latterly gone so far with scientists in the matter of prejudice, that it is quite a wonder that even so much as this should be conceded to ancient philosophy. The poor, honest primordial elements have long been exiled, and our ambitious men of science run races to determine who shall add one more to the fledgling brood of the sixty-three or more elementary substances. Meanwhile there rages a war in modern chemistry about terms. We are denied the right to call these substances chemical elements, for they are not primordial principles or self-existing essences out of which the universe was fashioned. Such ideas associated with the word element were good enough for the old Greek philosophy, but modern science rejects them, for, as Professor Cook says, they are unfortunate terms, and experimental science will have nothing to do with any kind of essences except those which it can see, smell, or taste. It must have those that can be put in the eye, the nose, or the mouth. It leaves others to the metaphysicians. Therefore, when Van Helmont tells us that, though a homogeneal part of elementary earth may be artfully, artificially, converted into water, though he still denies that the same can be done by nature alone, for no natural agent is able to transmute one element into another, offering as a reason that the elements always remain the same, we must believe him, if not quite an ignoramus, at least an unprogressed disciple of the moldy old Greek philosophy. Living and dying in blissful ignorance of the future sixty-three substances, what could either he or his old master, Paracelsus, achieve? Nothing, of course, but metaphysical and crazy speculations, clothed in a meaningless jargon common to all medieval and ancient alchemists. Nevertheless, in comparing notes, we find in the latest of all works upon modern chemistry, the following, the study of chemistry has revealed a remarkable class of substances, from no one of which a second substance has ever been produced by any chemical process which weighs less than the original substance, by no chemical process whatever can we obtain from iron a substance weighing less than the metal used in its production. In a word, we can extract from iron nothing but iron. Moreover, it appears, according to Professor Cook, that seventy-five years ago men did not know there was any difference between elementary and compound substances, for in old times alchemists had never conceived that weight is the measure of material, and that, as thus measured, no material is ever lost, but, on the contrary, they imagine that in such experiments as these the substances involved underwent a mysterious transformation. Centuries, in short, p. 191. Were wasted in vain attempts to transform the baser metals into gold. Is Professor Cook, so eminent in modern chemistry, equally proficient in the knowledge of what the alchemists did or did not know? Is he quite sure that he understands the meaning of the alchemical diction? We are not. But let us compare his views as above expressed with what sentences written in plain and good, albeit Old English, from the translations of Van Helmont and Paracelsus. We learn from their own admissions that the alkahes induces the following changes. 1. The alkahes never destroys the seminal virtues of the bodies thereby dissolved. For instance, gold, by its action, is reduced to a salt of gold, antimony to a salt of antimony, etc., of the same seminal virtues, or characters with the original concrete. 2. The subject exposed to its operation is converted into its three principles, salt, sulfur, and mercury, and afterwards into salt alone, which then becomes volatile, and at length is wholly turned into clear water. 3. Whatever it dissolves may be rendered volatile by sand heat, and if, after volatilizing the solvent, it be distilled therefrom, the body is left pure, insipid water, but always equal in quantity to its original self. Further, we find Van Helmont, the elder, saying of this salt that it will dissolve the most untractable bodies into substances of the same seminal virtues, equal in weight to the matter dissolved, and he adds, this salt, by being several times cohobated with Paracelsus sal circulatum, loses all its fixedness, and at length becomes an insipid water, equal in quantity to the salt it was made from. The objection that might be made by Professor Cook, in behalf of modern science, to the hermetic expressions, would equally apply to the Egyptian hieratic writings they hide that which was meant to be concealed. If he would profit by the labors of the past, he must employ the cryptographer, and not the satirist. Paracelsus, like the rest, exhausted his ingenuity in transpositions of letters and abbreviations of words and sentences. For example, when he wrote Sutrature he meant Tartar, and Mutrin meant Nitrum, and so on. 
There was no end to the pretended explanations of the meaning of the alkahist. Some imagined that it was an alkaline of salt of tartar salatoized, others that it meant algist, a German word which means all spirit, or spirituous. Paracelsus usually termed salt the center of water wherein metals ought to die. This gave rise to the most absurd suppositions, in some persons such as Glauber thought that the alkahes was the spirit of salt. It requires no little hardihood to assert that Paracelsus and his colleagues were ignorant of the natures of elementary and compound substances, they may not be called by. p. 192. The same names as are now in fashion, but that they were known as proved by the results attained. What matters it by what name the gas given off when iron is dissolved in sulfuric acid was called by Paracelsus, since he is recognized, even by our standard authorities, as the discoverer of hydrogen? His merit is the same, and though Van Helmont may have concealed, under the name Seminal Virtues, his knowledge of the fact that elementary substances have their original properties, which the entering into compounds only temporarily modifies never destroys he was nonetheless the greatest chemist of his age, and the peer of modern scientists. He affirmed that the orm of tabulae could be obtained with the alkahist, by converting the whole body of gold into salt, retaining its seminal virtues, and being soluble in water. When chemists learn what he meant by orm potabile, alkahes, salt, and seminal virtues what he really meant, not what he said he meant, nor what was thought he meant then, and not before, can our chemists safely assume such airs toward the fire philosophers and those ancient masters whose mystic teachings they reverently studied. One thing is clear, at any rate. Taken merely in its exoteric form, this language of Van Helmont shows that he understood the solubility of metallic substances in water which Sterry Hunt makes the basis of his theory of metalliferous deposits. We would like to see what sort of terms would be invented by our scientific contemporaries to conceal and yet half reveal their audacious proposition that man's only god is the cinericious matter of his brain, if in the basement of the new courthouse or the cathedral on Fifth Avenue there were a torture chamber, to which judge or cardinal could send them at will. Professor Sterry Hunt says in one of his lectures, the alchemists sought in vain for a universal solvent, but we now know that water, aided in some cases by heat, pressure, and the presence of certain widely distributed substances, such as carbonic acid and alkaline carbonates and sulfides, will dissolve the most insoluble bodies, so that it may, after all, be looked upon as the long sought for alkahest or universal menstruum. This reads almost like a paraphrase of Van Helmont, or Paracelsus himself. They knew the properties of water as a solvent as well as modern chemists, and what is more, made no concealment of the fact which shows that this was not their universal solvent. Many commentaries and criticisms of their works are still extant, and one can hardly take up a book on the subject without finding at least one of their spec. p. 193. Elations of which they never thought of making a mystery. This is what we find in an old work on alchemist A. Satire, moreover of 1820, written at the beginning of our century when the new theories on the chemical potency of water were hardly in their embryonic state. It may throw some light to observe, that Van Helmont, as well as Paracelsus, took water for the universal instrument, agent, of chemistry and natural philosophy, and earth for the unchangeable basis of all things that fire was assigned as the sufficient cause of all things that seminal impressions were lodged in the mechanism of the earth that water, by dissolving and fermenting with this earth, as it does by means of fire, brings forth everything, whence originally preceded animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms. The alchemists understand well this universal potency of water. In the works of Paracelsus, Van Helmont, Philolethes, Pontantum, Tacanius, and even Boyle, the great characteristic of the alkahest, to dissolve and change all sublunary bodies water alone accepted, is explicitly stated. And is it possible to believe that Van Helmont, whose private character was unimpeachable, and whose great learning was universally recognized, should most solemnly declare himself possessed of the secret? Word but a vain boast. In a recent address at Nashville, Tennessee, Professor Huxley laid down a certain rule with respect to the validity of human testimony as a basis of history and science, which we are quite ready to apply to the present case. It is impossible, he says, that one's practical life should not be more or less influenced by the views which we may hold as to what has been the past history of things. One of them is human testimony in its various shapes, all testimony of eyewitnesses traditional testimony from the lips of those who have been eyewitnesses, and the testimony of those who have put their impressions into writing and into print. If you read Caesar's commentaries, wherever he gives an account of his battles with the Gauls, 
you place a certain amount of confidence in his statements. You take his testimony upon this. You feel that Caesar would not have made these statements unless he had believed them to be true. Now, we cannot in logic permit Mr. Huxley's philosophical role to be applied in a one-sided manner to Caesar. Either that personage was naturally truthful or a natural liar, and since Mr. Huxley has settled that point to his own satisfaction as regards the facts of military history in his favor, we insist that Caesar is also a competent witness as. p. 194. To augurs, diviners, and psychological facts. So with Herodotus, and all their ancient authorities, unless they were by nature men of truth, they should not be believed even about civil or military affairs. Falsus in Uno, Falsus in Omnibus. And equally, if they are credible as to physical things, they must be regarded as equally so as to spiritual things, for as Professor Huxley tells us, human nature was of old just as it is now. Men of intellect and conscience did not lie for the pleasure of bewildering or disgusting posterity. The probabilities of falsification by such men having been defined so clearly by a man of science, we feel free from the necessity of discussing the question in connection with the names of Van Helmont and his illustrious but unfortunate master, the much-slandered Paracelsus. Deleuze, though finding in the works of the former many mythic, illusory ideas perhaps only because he could not understand them credits him nevertheless with a vast knowledge, an acute judgment, and at the same time with having given to the world great truths. He was the first, he adds, to give the name of gas to aerial fluids. Without him it is probable that steel would have given no new impulse to science. By what application of the doctrine of chances could we discover the likelihood that experimentalists, capable of resolving and recombining chemical substances, as they are admitted to have done, were ignorant of the nature of elementary substances, their combining energies, and the solvent or solvents, that would disintegrate them when wanted? If they had the reputation only of theorists the case would stand differently and our argument would lose its force, but the chemical discoveries grudgingly accorded to them, by their worst enemies, form the basis for much stronger language than we have permitted ourselves, from a fear of being deemed overpartial. And, as this work, moreover, is based on the idea that there is a higher nature of man, that his moral and intellectual faculties should be judged psychologically, we do not hesitate to reaffirm that since Van Helmont asserted, most solemnly, that he was possessed of the secret of the alkahest, no modern critic has a right to set him down as either a liar or a visionary, until something more certain is known about the nature of this alleged universal menstruum. Facts are stubborn things, remarks Mr. A. R. Wallace, in his preface to Miracles in Modern Spiritualism. Therefore, as facts must be our. p. 195. Strong as allies, we will bring as many of these forward as the miracles of antiquity and those of our modern times will furnish us with. The authors of the unseen universe have scientifically demonstrated the possibility of certain alleged psychological phenomena through the medium of the universal ether. Mr. Wallace has as scientifically proved that the whole catalog of assumptions to the contrary, including the sophisms of Hume, are untenable if brought face to face with strict logic. Mr. Crookes has given to the world of skepticism his own experiments, which lasted above three years before he was conquered by the most undeniable of evidence out of his own senses. A whole list could be made up of men of science who have recorded their testimony to that effect, and Camille Flammarion, the well-known French astronomer, and author of many works which, in the eyes of the skeptical, should send him to the ranks of the deluded, in company with Wallace, Crookes, and Hare, corroborates our words in the following lines. I do not hesitate to affirm my conviction, based on a personal examination of the subject, that any scientific man who declares the phenomena denominated magnetic, somnambulic, mediumic, and others not yet explained by science, to be impossible, is one who speaks without knowing what he is talking about, and also any man accustomed, by his professional avocations, to scientific observations provided that his mind be not biased by preconceived opinions, nor his mental vision blinded by that opposite kind of illusion, unhappily too common in the learned world, which consists in imagining that the laws of nature are already known to us, and that everything which appears to overstep the limit of our present formulas is impossible, may require a radical and absolute certainty of the reality of the facts alluded to. In Mr. Kirk's notes of an inquiry into the phenomena called spiritual, on p. 101, this gentleman quotes Mr. Sergeant Cox, who having named this unknown force, psychic, explains it thus, as the organism is itself moved and directed within the structure by a force which either is, or is not controlled by the soul, spirit, or mind, 
which constitutes the individual being we term the man, it is an equally reasonable conclusion that the force which causes the motions beyond the limits of the body is the same force that produces motion within the limits of the body. And, as the external force is often directed by intelligence, it is an equally reasonable conclusion that the directing intelligence of the external force is the same intelligence that directs the force internally. In order to comprehend this theory the better, we may as well divide it in four propositions and show that Mr. Sergeant Cox believes. 1. That the force which produces physical phenomena proceeds from, consequently is generated in, the medium. p. 196. 2. That the intelligence directing the force for the production of the phenomena, a, may sometimes be other than the intelligence of the medium, but of this the proof is insufficient, therefore, b, the directing intelligence is probably that of the medium himself. This Mr. Cox calls a reasonable conclusion. 3. He assumes that the force which moves the table is identical with the force which moves the medium's body itself. 4. He strongly disputes the spiritualistic theory, or rather assertion, that spirits of the dead are the sole agents in the production of all the phenomena. Before we fairly proceed on our analysis of such views we must remind the reader that we find ourselves placed between two extreme opposites represented by two parties the believers and unbelievers in this agency of human spirits. Neither seem capable of deciding the point raised by Mr. Cox, for while the spiritualists are so omnivorous in their credulity as to believe every sound and movement in a circle to be produced by disembodied human beings, their antagonists dogmatically deny that anything can be produced by spirits, for there are none. Hence, neither class is in a position to examine the subject without bias. If they consider that force which produces motion within the body and the one which causes the motion beyond the limits of the body to be of the same essence, they may be right. But the identity of these two forces stops here. The life principle which animates Mr. Cox's body is of the same nature as that of his medium. Nevertheless he is not the medium, nor is the latter Mr. Cox. This force, which, to please Mr. Cox and Mr. Crooks we may just as well call psychic as anything else, proceeds through not from the individual medium. In the latter case this force would be generated in the medium and we are ready to show that it cannot be so, neither in the instances of levitation of human bodies, the moving of furniture and other objects without contact, nor in such cases in which the force shows reason and intelligence. It is a well-known fact to both mediums and spiritualists, that the more the former is passive, the better the manifestations, and every one of the above-mentioned phenomena requires a conscious predetermined will. In cases of levitation, we should have to believe that this self-generated force will raise the inert mass off the ground, direct it through the air, and lower it down again, avoiding obstacles and thereby showing intelligence, and still act automatically, the medium remaining all the while passive. If such were the fact, the medium would be a conscious magician, and all pretense for being a passive instrument in the hands of invisible intelligences would become useless. As well plead. p. 197. That a quantity of steam sufficient to fill, without bursting, a boiler, will raise the boiler, or a Leyden jar, full of electricity, overcome the inertia of the jar, as such a mechanical absurdity. All analogy would seem to indicate that the force which operates in the presence of a medium upon external objects comes from a source back of the medium himself. We may rather compare it with the hydrogen which overcomes the inertia of the balloon. The gas, under the control of an intelligence, is accumulated in the receiver in sufficient volume to overcome the attraction of its combined mass. On the same principle this force moves articles of furniture, and performs other manifestations, and though identical in its essence with the astral spirit of the medium, it cannot be a spirit only, for the latter remains all the while in a kind of cataleptic torpor, when the mediumship is genuine. Mr. Cox's first point seems, therefore, not well taken, it is based upon an hypothesis mechanically untenable. Of course our argument proceeds upon the supposition that levitation is an observed fact. The theory of psychic force, to be perfect, must account for all visible motions, and solid substances, and among these is levitation. As to his second point, we deny that the proof is insufficient that the force which produces the phenomena is sometimes directed by other intelligences than the mind of the psychic. On the contrary there is such an abundance of testimony to show that the mind of the medium, in a majority of cases, has nothing to do with the phenomena, that we cannot be content to let Mr. Cox's bold assertion go unchallenged. Equally illogical do we conceive to be his third proposition, 
For if the medium's body be not the generator but simply the channel of the force which produces the phenomena a question upon which Mr. Cox's researches throw no light whatever then it does not follow that because the medium's soul, spirit, or mind directs the medium's organism, therefore this soul, spirit, or mind, lifts the chair or raps at the call of the alphabet. As to the fourth proposition, namely, that spirits of the dead are the sole agents in the production of all the phenomena, we need not join issue at the present moment, inasmuch as the nature of the spirits producing mediumistic manifestations is treated at length in other chapters. The philosophers, and especially those who were initiated into the mysteries, held that the astral soul is the impalpable duplicate of the gross external form which we call body. It is the perisprit of the cardasis and the spirit form of the spiritualists. Above this internal duplicate, and illuminating it as the warm ray of the sun illuminates the earth. p. 198. Rectifying the germ and calling out to spiritual vivification the latent qualities dormant in it, hovers the divine spirit. The astral perisprit is contained and confined within the physical body as ether in a bottle, or magnetism and magnetized iron. It is a center and engine of force, fed from the universal supply of force and moved by the same general laws which pervade all nature and produce all cosmical phenomena. Its inherent activity causes the incessant physical operations of the animal organism and ultimately results in the destruction of the latter by overuse and its own escape. It is the prisoner, not the voluntary tenant, of the body. It has an attraction so powerful to the external universal force, that after wearing out its casing it finally escapes to it. The stronger, grosser, more material its encasing body, the longer is the term of its imprisonment. Some persons are born with organizations so exceptional, that the door which shuts other people in from communication with the world of the astral light, can be easily unbarred and opened, and their souls can look into, or even pass into that world, and return again. Those who do this consciously, and at will, are termed magicians, hierophants, seers, adepts, those who are made to do it, either through the fluid of the mesmerizer or of spirits are mediums. The astral soul, when the barriers are once opened, is so powerfully attracted by the universal, astral magnet, that it sometimes lifts its encasement with it and keeps it suspended in midair, until the gravity of matter reasserts its supremacy, and the body redescends again to earth. Every objective manifestation, whether it be the motion of a living limb, or the movement of some inorganic body, requires two conditions, will enforce plus matter, or that which makes the object so move visible to our eye, and these three are all convertible forces, or the force correlation of the scientists. In their turn they are directed or rather overshadowed by the divine intelligence which these men so studiously leave out of the account, but without which not even the crawling of the smallest earthworm could ever take place. The simplest is the most common of all natural phenomena, the rustling of the leaves which tremble under the gentle contact of the breeze requires a constant exercise of these faculties. Scientists may well call them cosmic laws, immutable and unchangeable. Behind these laws we must search for the intelligent cause, which once having created and set these laws in motion, has infused into them the essence of its own consciousness. Whether we call this the first cause, the universal will, or God, it must always bear intelligence. And now we may ask, how can a will manifest itself intelligently and unconsciously at the same time? It is difficult, if not impossible, to conceive of intellection apart from consciousness. By consciousness we do. p. 199. Not necessarily imply physical or corporeal consciousness. Consciousness is a quality of the sentient principle, or, in other words, the soul, and the latter often displays activity even while the body is asleep or paralyzed. When we lift our arm mechanically, we may imagine that we do it unconsciously because our superficial senses cannot appreciate the interval between the formulation of the purpose and its execution. Legion as it seemed to us, our vigilant will evolve force, and set our matter in motion. There is nothing in the nature of the most trivial of mediumistic phenomena to make Mr. Cox's theory plausible. If the intelligence manifested by this force is no proof that it belongs to a disembodied spirit, still less is it evidence that it is unconsciously given out by the medium. Mr. Crooks himself tells us of cases where the intelligence could not have emanated from any one in the room, as in the instance where the word however, covered by his finger and unknown even to himself, was correctly written by Planchet. No explanation whatever can account for this case, the only hypothesis tenable if we exclude the agency of a spirit power is that the clairvoyant faculties were brought into play. But scientists deny clairvoyance, and if, 
To escape the unwelcome alternative of accrediting the phenomena to a spiritual source, they concede to us the fact of clairvoyance. It then devolves upon them to either accept the Kabbalistic explanation of what this faculty is, or achieve the task hitherto impracticable of making a new theory to fit the facts. Again, if for the sake of argument it should be admitted that Mr. Crook's word however might have been clairvoyantly read, what shall we say of mediumistic communications having a prophetic character? Does any theory of mediumistic impulse account for the ability to foretell events beyond the possible knowledge of both speaker and listener? Mr. Cox will have to try again. As we have said before, the modern psychic force, and the ancient oracular fluids, whether terrestrial or sidereal, are identical in essence simply a blind force. So is air. And while a dialogue the sound waves produced by a conversation of the speakers affect the same body of air, that does not imply any doubt of the fact that there are two persons talking with each other. Is it any more reasonable to say that when a common agent is employed by medium and spirit to intercommunicate, there must necessarily be but one intelligence displaying itself? As the air is necessary for the mutual exchange of audible sounds, so are certain currents of astral light, or ether directed by an intelligence, necessary for the production of the phenomena called spiritual. Place. P. 200. Two interlocutors in the exhaustive receiver of an air pump, and, if they could live, their words would remain inarticulate thoughts, for there would be no air to vibrate, and hence no ripple of sound would reach their ears. Place the strongest medium in such isolating atmosphere as a powerful mesmerizer, familiar with the properties of the magical agent, can create around him, and no manifestations will take place until some opposing intelligence, more potential than the willpower of the mesmerizer, overcomes the latter and terminates the astral inertia. The ancients were at no loss to discriminate between a blind force acting spontaneously in the same force when directed by an intelligence. Plutarch, the priest of Apollo, when speaking of the oracular vapors which were but a subterranean gas, imbued with intoxicating magnetic properties, shows its nature to be dual, when he addresses it in these words, And who art thou? Without a god who creates and ripens thee, without a demon, spirit, who, acting under the orders of God, directs and governs thee, thou canst do nothing, thou art nothing but a vain breath. Thus without the indwelling soul or intelligence, psychic force would be also but a vain breath. Aristotle maintains that this gas, or astral emanation, escaping from inside the earth, is the sole sufficient cause, acting from within outwardly for the vivification of every living being and plan upon the external crust. In answer to the skeptical negators of his century, Cicero, moved by a just wrath, exclaims, And what can be more divine than the exhalations of the earth, which affect the human soul so as to enable her to predict the future? And could the hand of time evaporate such a virtue? Do you suppose you are talking of some kind of wine or salted meat? Do modern experimentalists claim to be wiser than Cicero, and say that this eternal force has evaporated, and that the springs of prophecy are dry? All the prophets of old inspired sensitives were said to be uttering their prophecies under the same conditions, either by the direct outward efflux of the astral emanation, or a sort of damp fluxion, rising from the earth. It is this astral matter which serves as a temporary clothing of the souls who form themselves in this light. Cornelius Agrippa expresses the same views as to the nature of these phantoms by describing it as moist or humid, in spirito turbido humidoc. Prophecies are delivered in two ways consciously, by magicians who are able to look into the astral light, and unconsciously, by those. p. 201. Who act under what is called inspiration. To the latter class belonged and belong the biblical prophets and the modern trans speakers. So familiar with this fact was Plato, that of such prophets he says, No man, when in his senses, attains prophetic truth and inspiration, but only when demented by some distemper or possession, by a daimonian or spirit. Some persons call them prophets, they do not know that they are only repeaters, and are not to be called prophets at all, but only transmitters of vision and prophecy, he adds. In continuation of his argument, Mr. Cox says, the most ardent spiritualists practically admit the existence of psychic force, under the very inappropriate name of magnetism, to which it has no affinity whatever, for they assert that the spirits of the dead can only do the acts attributed to them by using the magnetism, that is, the psychic force, of the mediums. Here, again, a misunderstanding arises in consequence of different names being applied to what may prove to be one and the same imponderable compound. Because electricity did not become a science till the 18th century, 
No one will presume to say that this force has not existed since the creation. Moreover, we are prepared to prove that even the ancient Hebrews were acquainted with it. But, merely because exact science did not happen before 1819 to stumble over the discovery which showed the intimate connection existing between magnetism and electricity, it does not at all prevent these two agents being identical. If a bar of iron can be endowed with magnetic properties, by passing a current of voltaic electricity over some conductor placed in a certain way close to the bar, why not accept, as a provisional theory, that a medium may also be a conductor, and nothing more, at a seance? Is it unscientific to say that the intelligence of psychic force, drawing currents of electricity from the waves of the ether, and employing the medium as a conductor, develops and calls into action the latent magnetism with which the atmosphere of the seance room is saturated? so as to produce the desired effects? The word magnetism is as appropriate as any other, until science gives us something more than a merely hypothetical agent endowed with conjectural properties. The difference between the advocates of psychic force and the spiritualists consists in this, says Sergeant Cox, that we contend that there is as yet insufficient proof of any other directing agent than the intelligence of the medium, and no proof whatever of the agency of the spirits of the dead. p. 202. We fully agree with Mr. Cox as to the lack of proof that the agency is that of the spirits of the dead. As for the rest, it is a very extraordinary deduction from a wealth of facts, according to the expression of Mr. Crooks, who remarks further, on going over my notes, I find, such a superabundance of evidence, so overwhelming a mass of testimony, that I could fill several numbers of the quarterly. Now some of these facts of an overwhelming evidence are as follows. First, the movement of heavy bodies with contact but without mechanical exertion. 2d. The phenomena of percussive and other sounds. 3d. The alteration of weight of bodies. 4th. Movements of heavy substances when at a distance from the medium. 5th. The rising of tables and chairs off the ground, without contact with any person. 6th. The levitation of human beings. 7th. Luminous apparitions. Says Mr. Crooks, under the strictest conditions, I have seen a solid self-luminous body, the size and nearly the shape of a turkey's egg, float noiselessly about the room, at one time higher than anyone could reach on tiptoe, and then gently descend to the floor. It was visible for more than ten minutes, and before it faded away it struck the table three times with a sound like that of a hard, solid body. We must infer that the egg was of the same nature as M. Bobinet's meteor cat, which is classified with other natural phenomena in Argo's works. 8. The Appearance of Hands either self-luminous or visible by ordinary light. Ninth, Direct writing by these same luminous hands, detached, and evidently endowed with intelligence. Psychic force? Tenth, Phantom forms and faces. In this instance, the psychic force comes from a corner of the room as a phantom form, takes an accordion in its hand, and then glides about the room, playing the instrument, home, the medium, being in full view at the time. The whole of the proceeding Mr. Crooks witnessed and tested at his own house, and, having assured himself scientifically of the genuineness of the phenomenon, reported it to the Royal Society. Was he welcomed as a discoverer of natural? p. 203. Phenomena of a new and important character? Let the reader consult his work for the answer. In addition to these freaks played on human credulity by psychic force, Mr. Crooks gives another class of phenomena, which he terms special instances which seem, to point to the agency of an exterior intelligence. I have been, says Mr. Crooks, with Miss Fox when she has been writing a message automatically to one person present, whilst a message to another person, on another subject, was being given alphabetically by means of reps, and the whole time she was conversing freely with a third person, on a subject totally different from either. During a seance with Mr. Home, a small lath moved across the table to me, in the light, and delivered a message to me by tapping my hand, I repeating the alphabet, and the laugh tapping me at the right letters, being at a distance from Mr. Holmes' hands. The same laugh, upon request of Mr. Crooks, gave him a telegraphic message through the Morse alphabet, by taps on my hand, the Morse code being quite unknown to any other person present, and but imperfectly to himself, and, adds Mr. Crooks, it convinced me that there was a good Morse operator at the other end of the line, wherever that might be. Would it be undignified in the present case to suggest that Mr. Cox should search for the operator in his private principality psychic land? But the same laugh does more and better. In full light in Mr. Crook's room it is asked to give a message. A pencil and some sheets of paper had been lying on the center of the table, 
Presently the pencil rose on its point, and after advancing by hesitating jerks to the paper, fell down. It then rose, and again fell. After three unsuccessful attempts, a small wooden lath, the Morse operator, which was lying near upon the table, slid towards the pencil, and rose a few inches from the table, the pencil rose again, and propping itself against the lath, the two together made an effort to mark the paper. It fell, and then a joint effort was made again. After a third trial the lath gave it up, and moved back to its place, the pencil lay as it fell across the paper, and an alphabetic message told us, we have tried to do as you asked, but our power is exhausted. The word hour, as the joint intelligent efforts of the friendly lath and pencil, would make us think that there were two psychic forces present. In all this, is there any proof that the directing agent was the intelligence of the medium? Is there not, on the contrary, every indication that the movements of the lath and pencil were directed by spirits of the dead, or at least of those of some other unseen intelligent entities? p. 204. Most certainly the word magnetism explains in this case as little as the term psychic force, howbeit, there is more reason to use the former than the latter, if it were but for the simple fact that the transcendent magnetism or mesmerism produces phenomena identical in effects with those of spiritualism. The phenomenon of the enchanted circle of Baron du Petit and Regazzoni is as contrary to the accepted laws of physiology as the rising of a table without contact is to the laws of natural philosophy. A strong man have often found it impossible to raise a small table weighing a few pounds, and broken it to pieces in the effort, so a dozen of experimenters, among them sometimes, academicians, were utterly unable to step across a chalk line drawn on the floor by Dupatet. On one occasion a Russian general, well known for his skepticism, persisted until he fell on the ground in violent convulsions. In this case, the magnetic fluid which opposed such a resistance was Mr. Cox's psychic force, which endows the tables with an extraordinary and supernatural weight. If they produce the same psychological and physiological effects, there is good reason to believe them more or less identical. We do not think the deduction could be very reasonably objected to. Besides, were the fact even denied, this is no reason why it should not be so. Once upon a time, all the academies in Christendom had agreed to deny that there were any mountains in the moon, and there was a certain time when, if any one had been so bold as to affirm that there was life in the superior regions of the atmosphere as well as in the fathomless depths of the ocean, he would have been set down as a fool or an ignoramus. The devil affirms it must be a lie. The pious abbe Anaguana used to say, in a discussion with a spiritualized table, we will soon be warranted in paraphrasing the sentence and making a red scientist deny that it must be true. Chapter 7. Thou great first cause, least understood. Pope. Whence this pleasing hope, this fond desire, this longing after immortality, or whence this secret dread, an inward horror, of falling into naught, why shrinks the soul, back on herself, and startles at destruction, tis the divinity that stirs within us, tis heaven itself that points out our hereafter, and intimates eternity to man, eternity, thou pleasing, dreadful thought, Addison, there is another and a better world. Kotzebue, the stranger. After according so much space to the conflicting opinions of our men of science about certain occult phenomena of our modern period, it is but just that we give attention to the speculations of medieval alchemists and certain other illustrious men. Almost without exception, ancient and medieval scholars believed in the arcane doctrines of wisdom. These included alchemy, the Chaldea Jewish Kabbalah, the esoteric systems of Pythagoras and the Old Magi, and those of the later Platonic philosophers and theurgists. We also propose in subsequent pages to treat of the Indian gymnosophists and the Chaldean astrologers. We must not neglect to show the grand truths underlying the misunderstood religions of the past. The four elements of our fathers, earth, air, water, and fire, contain for the student of alchemy and ancient psychology or as it is now termed, magic many things of which our philosophy has never dreamed. We must not forget that what is now called necromancy by the church, and spiritualism by modern believers, and that includes the evoking of departed spirits, is a science which has, from remote antiquity, been almost universally diffused over the face of the globe. Although neither an alchemist, magician, nor astrologer, but simply a great philosopher, Henry Moore, of Cambridge University a man universally esteemed, may be named as a shrewd logician, scientist, and metaphysician. His belief in witchcraft was firm throughout his life. 
His faith in immortality and able arguments in demonstration of the survival of man's spirit after death are all based on the Pythagorean system, adopted by Cardan, Van Helmont, and other mystics. The Infinite and p. 206. Uncreated spirit that we usually call God, a substance of the highest virtue and excellency, produced everything else by emanative causality. God thus is the primary substance, the rest, the secondary, if the former created matter with the power of moving itself, he, the primary substance, is still the cause of that motion as well as of the matter, and yet we rightly say that it is matter which moves itself. We may define this kind of spirit we speak of to be a substance indiscernible, that can move itself, that can penetrate, contract, and dilate itself, and can also penetrate, move, and alter matter, which is the third emanation. He firmly believed in apparitions, and stoutly defended the theory of the individuality of every soul in which personality, memory, and conscience will surely continue in the future state. He divided the astral spirit of man after its exit from the body into two distinct entities, the aerial and the ethereal vehicle. During the time that a disembodied man moves in its aerial clothing, he is subject to fate I.E., evil and temptation, attached to its earthly interests, and therefore is not utterly pure. It is only when he casts off this garb of the first spheres and becomes ethereal that he becomes sure of his immortality. For what shadow can that body cast that is a pure and transparent light, such as the ethereal vehicle is? And therefore that oracle is then fulfilled, when the soul has ascended into that condition we have already described, in which alone it is out of the reach of fate and mortality. He concludes his work by stating that this transcendent and divinely pure condition was the only aim of the Pythagoreans. As to the skeptics of his age, his language is contemptuous and severe. Speaking of Scott, 80, and Webster, he terms them our new inspired saints, sworn advocates of the witches, who thus madly and boldly, against all sense and reason, against all antiquity, all interpreters, and against the scripture itself, will have even no Samuel in the scene, but a confederate knave. Whether the scripture, or these inblown buffoons, puffed up with nothing but ignorance, vanity, and stupid infidelity, are to be believed, let any one judge, he adds. What kind of language would this eminent divine have used against our skeptics of the 19th century? Descartes, although a worshipper of matter, was one of the most devoted teachers of the magnetic doctrine and, in a certain sense, even of alchemy. His system of physics was very much like that of other great philosophers. Space, which is infinite, is composed, or rather filled up with a fluid and elementary matter, and is the sole fountain of all life. P. 207. Enclosing all the celestial globes and keeping them in perpetual motion. The magnet streams of Mesmer are disguised by him into the Cartesian vortices, and both rest on the same principle. Anna Moser does not hesitate to say that both have more in common than people suppose, who have not carefully examined the subject. The esteemed philosopher, Pierre Parinaud, was the warmest defender of the doctrines of occult magnetism and its first propounders, in 1679. The magical theosophical philosophy is fully vindicated in his works. The well-known Dr. Hufeland has written a work on magic in which he propounds the theory of the universal magnetic sympathy between men, animals, plants, and even minerals. The testimony of Campanella, Van Helmont, and Sarius is confirmed by him in relation to the sympathy existing between the different parts of the body as well as between the parts of all organic and even inorganic bodies. Such also was the doctrine of Tenzel Wiredig. It may even be found expounded in his works, with far more clearness, logic, and vigor, than in those of other mystical authors who have treated of the same subject. In his famous treatise, The New Spiritual Medicine, he demonstrates, on the ground of the later accepted fact of universal attraction and repulsion now called gravitation that the whole nature is ensouled. Wiredig calls this magnetic sympathy the accordance of spirits. Everything is drawn to its like and converges with natures congenial to itself. Out of this sympathy and antipathy arises a constant movement in the whole world, and in all its parts, an uninterrupted communion between heaven and earth, which produces universal harmony. Everything lives and perishes through magnetism, one thing affects another one, even at great distances, and its congenitals may be influenced to health and disease by the power of this sympathy, at any time, and notwithstanding the intervening space. Hufel Aunt, says Anna Moser, gives the account of a nose which had been cut from the back of a porter, but which, when the porter died, died too and fell off from its artificial position. A piece of skin, adds Hufelant, 
taken from a living head, had its hair turned gray at the same time as that on the head from which it was taken. Kepler, the forerunner of Newton in many great truths, even in that of the universal gravitation which he very justly attributed to magnetic attraction, notwithstanding that he terms astrology the insane daughter of a most wise mother astronomy, shares the Kabbalistic belief. p. 208. That the spirits of the stars are so many intelligences. He firmly believes that each planet is the seat of an intelligent principle, and that they are all inhabited by spiritual beings, who exercise influences over other beings inhabiting more gross and material spheres than their own and especially our Earth. As Kepler's spiritual starry influences were superseded by the vortices of the more materialistic Descartes, whose atheistical tendencies did not prevent him from believing that he had found out a diet that will prolong his life 500 years and more, so the vortices of the latter and his astronomical doctrines may someday give place to the intelligent magnetic streams which are directed by the anima mundi. Bacci Supporta, the learned Italian philosopher, notwithstanding his endeavors to show to the world the groundlessness of their accusations of magic being a superstition and sorcery, was treated by later critics with the same unfairness as his colleagues. This celebrated alchemist left the work on natural magic, in which he bases all of the occult phenomena possible to man upon the world's soul which binds all with all. He shows that the astral light acts in harmony and sympathy with all nature, that it is the essence out of which our spirits are formed, and that by acting in unison with their parent source, our sidereal bodies are rendered capable of producing magic wonders. The whole secret depends on our knowledge of kindred elements. He believed in the Philosopher's Stone, of which the world hath so great an opinion of, which hath been bragged of in so many ages and happily attained unto by some. Finally, he throws out many valuable hints as to its spiritual meaning. In 1643, there appeared among the mystics a monk, Father Kircher, who taught a complete philosophy of universal magnetism. His numerous works embrace many of the subjects merely hinted at by Paracelsus. His definition of magnetism is very original, for he contradicted Gilbert's theory that the earth was a great magnet. He asserted that although every particle of matter, and even the intangible and visible powers were magnetic, they did not themselves constitute a magnet. There is but one magnet in the universe, and from it proceeds the magnetization of everything existing. This magnet is of course what the Kabbalists term. p. 209. The central spiritual sun, or God. The sun, moon, planets, and stars he affirmed are highly magnetic, but they have become so by induction from living in the universal magnetic fluid the spiritual light. He proves the mysterious sympathy existing between the bodies of the three principal kingdoms of nature, and strengthens his argument by a stupendous catalogue of instances. Many of these were verified by naturalists, but still more have remained unauthenticated, therefore, according to the traditional policy and very equivocal logic of our scientists, they are denied. For instance, he shows a difference between mineral magnetism and zoomagnetism, or animal magnetism. He demonstrates it in the fact that except in the case of the lodestone all the minerals are magnetized by the higher potency, the animal magnetism, while the latter enjoys it as the direct emanation from the first cause the creator. A needle can be magnetized by simply being held in the hand of a strong-willed man, and amber develops its powers more by the friction of the human hand than by any other object, therefore man can impart his own life, and, to a certain degree, animate inorganic objects. This, in the eyes of the foolish, is sorcery. The sun is the most magnetic of all bodies, he says, thus anticipating the theory of General Pleasanton by more than two centuries. The ancient philosophers never denied the fact he adds, but have at all times perceived that the sun's emanations were binding all things to itself, and that it imparts this binding power to everything falling under its direct rays. As a proof of it he brings the instance of a number of plants being especially attracted to the sun, and others to the moon, and showing their irresistible sympathy to the former by following its course in the heavens. The plant known as the Githymal, faithfully follows its sovereign, even when it is invisible on account of the fog. The acacia uncloses its petals at its rising, and closes them at its setting. So does the Egyptian lotus and the common sunflower. The nightshade exhibits the same predilection for the moon. As examples of antipathies or sympathies among plants, he instances the aversion which the vine feels for the cabbage, and its fondness toward the olive tree, the love of the ranunculus for the water lily, and of the rue for the figure the antipathy which sometimes exists even among kindred substances is clearly demonstrated in the case of the Mexican pomegranate, whose shoots, when cut to pieces, 
repel each other with the most extraordinary ferocity. Kircher accounts for every feeling in human nature as results of changes in our magnetic condition. Anger, jealousy, friendship, love, and p. 210. Hatred, are all modifications of the magnetic atmosphere which is developed in us and constantly emanates from us. Love is one of the most variable, and therefore the aspects of it are numberless. Spiritual love, that of a mother for a child, of an artist for some particular art, love as pure friendship, are purely magnetic manifestations of sympathy in congenial natures. The magnetism of pure love is the originator of every created thing. In its ordinary sense love between the sexes is electricity, and he calls it a more febrous species, the fever of species. There are two kinds of magnetic attraction, sympathy and fascination, the one holy and natural, the other evil and unnatural. To the latter, fascination, we must attribute the power of the poisonous toad, which upon merely opening its mouth, forces the passing reptile or insect to run into it to its destruction. The deer, as well as smaller animals, are attracted by the breath of the boa, and are made irresistibly to come within its reach. The electric fish, the torpedo, repels the arm with a shock that for a time benumbs it. To exercise such a power for beneficent purposes, man requires three conditions, 1. Nobility of soul, 2. Strong will and imaginative faculty, 3. A subject weaker than the magnetizer, otherwise he will resist. A man free from worldly incentives and sensuality, may cure in such a way the most incurable diseases, and his vision may become clear and prophetic. A curious instance of the above-mentioned universal attraction between all the bodies of the planetary system and everything organic as well as inorganic pertaining to them, is found in a quaint old volume of the 17th century. It contains notes of travel and an official report to the King of France, by his ambassador, the Law Lubert, upon what he has seen in the Kingdom of Siam. At Siam, he says, there are two species of freshwater fish, which they respectively call palout and plocati fish. Once salted and placed uncut, whole, in the pot, they are found to exactly follow the flux and reflux of the sea, growing higher and lower in the pot as the sea ebbs or flows. The La Luber experimented with this fish for a long time, together with a government engineer, named Vincent, and, therefore, vouches for the truth of this assertion, which at first had been dismissed as an idle fable. So powerful is this mysterious attraction that it affected the fishes even when their bodies became totally rotten and fell to pieces. It is especially in the countries unblessed with civilization that we should seek for an explanation of the nature, and observe the effects of that subtle power, which ancient philosophers called the world's soul. p. 211. In the East only, and on the boundless tracts of unexplored Africa, will the student of psychology find abundant food for his truth-hungering soul. The reason is obvious. The atmosphere in populous neighborhoods is badly vitiated by the smoke and fumes of manufactories, steam engines, railroads, and steamboats, and especially by the miasmatic exhalations of the living and the dead. Nature is as dependent as a human being upon conditions before she can work, and her mighty breathing, so to say, can be as easily interfered with, impeded, and arrested, and the correlation of her forces destroyed in a given spot, as though she were a man. Not only climate, but also occult influences daily felt not only modify the physio-psychological nature of man, but even alter the constitution of so-called inorganic matter in a degree not fairly realized by European science. Thus the London Medical and Surgical Journal advises surgeons not to carry lancets to Calcutta, because it has been found by personal experience that English steel could not bear the atmosphere of India, so a bunch of English or American keys will be completely covered with rust 24 hours after having been brought to Egypt while objects made of native steel in those countries remain unoxidized. So, too, it has been found that a Siberian shaman who has given stupendous proofs of his occult powers among his native Chuchen, is gradually and often completely deprived of such powers when coming into smoky and foggy London. Is the inner organism of man less sensitive to climatic influences than a bit of steel? If not, then why should we cast out upon the testimony of travelers who may have seen the shaman, day after day, exhibit phenomena of the most astounding character in his native country, and deny the possibility of such powers and such phenomena, only because he cannot do as much in London or Paris? In his lecture on the lost arts, Wendell Phillips proves that besides the psychological nature of man being affected by a change of climate, Oriental people have physical senses far more acute than the Europeans. The French dyers of lions, whom no one can surpass in skill, he says, 
have a theory that there is a certain delicate shade of blue that Europeans cannot see. And in Kashmir, where the girls make shawls worth $30,000, they will show him, the dire of lions, 300 distinct colors, which he not only cannot make, but cannot even distinguish. If there is such a vast difference between the acuteness of the external senses of two races, why should there not be the same in their psychological powers? Moreover, the eye of a Kashmir girl is able to see objectively a color which does exist, but which being inappreciable by the European, is therefore non-existent for him. Why then not concede, that some peculiarly endowed organisms, which are thought to be possessed of that mysterious faculty called second sight? p. 212. See their pictures as objectively as the girl sees the colors, and that therefore the former, instead of mere objective hallucinations called forth by imagination are, on the contrary, reflections of real things and persons impressed upon the astral ether, as explained by the old philosophy of the Chaldean oracles, and surmised by those modern discoverers, Babbage, Jevons, and the authors of the unseen universe? Three spirits live and actuate man, teaches Paracelsus, three worlds pour their beams upon him but all three only as the image and echo of one and the same all-constructing and uniting principle of production. The first is the spirit of the elements, terrestrial body and vital force in its brute condition, the second, the spirit of the stars, sidereal or astral body the soul, the third is the divine spirit, agoides. Our human body, being possessed of primeval earth stuff, as Paracelsus calls it, we may readily accept the tendency of modern scientific research to regard the processes of both animal and vegetable life as simply physical and chemical. This theory only the more corroborates the assertions of old philosophers in the Mosaic Bible, that from the dust of the ground our bodies were made, and to dust they will return. But we must remember that dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. Man is a little world a microcosm inside the great universe. Like a fetus, he is suspended, by all his three spirits, in the matrix of the macrocosmos, and while his terrestrial body is in constant sympathy with its parent earth, his astral soul lives in unison with the sidereal animal mundi. He is in it, as it is in him, for the world-pervading element fills all space, and is space itself, only shoreless and infinite. As to his third spirit, the divine, what is it but an infinitesimal ray? one of the countless radiations proceeding directly from the highest cause the spiritual light of the world? This is the trinity of organic and inorganic nature the spiritual and the physical, which are three in one, and of which Prabhu says that the first monad is the eternal God, the second, eternity, the third, the paradigm, or pattern of the universe, the three constituting the intelligible triad. Everything in this visible universe is the outflow of this triad, in a microcosmic triad itself and thus they move in majestic procession in the fields of eternity, round the spiritual sun, as in the heliocentric system the celestial bodies move round the visible suns. The Pythagorean monad, which lives in solitude and darkness, may remain on this earth forever invisible, impalpable, and undemonstrated by experimental science. Still the whole universe will be gravitating around it, as it did from the beginning of time, and p. 213. With every second, Man and Adam approach nearer to that solemn moment in the eternity, when the invisible presence will become clear to their spiritual sight. When every particle of matter, even the most sublimated, has been cast off from the last shape that forms the ultimate link of that chain of double evolution which, throughout millions of ages and successive transformations, has pushed the entity onward, and when it shall find itself reclothed in that primordial essence, identical with that of its creator, then this once impalpable organic atom will have run its race and the sons of God will once more shout for joy at the return of the pilgrim. Man, says Van Helmont, is the mirror of the universe, and his triple nature stands in relationship to all things. The will of the Creator, through which all things were made and received their first impulse, is the property of every living being. Man, endowed with an additional spirituality, has the largest share of it on this planet. It depends on the proportion of matter in him whether he will exercise its magical faculty with more or less success. Sharing this divine potency in common with every inorganic atom, he exercises it through the course of his whole life, whether consciously or otherwise. In the former case, when in the full possession of his powers, he will be the master, and the magnal magnum, the universal soul, will be controlled and guided by him. In the cases of animals, plants, minerals, and even of the average of humanity, this ethereal fluid which pervades all things, finding no resistance, and being left to itself, 
moves them as its impulse directs. Every created being in this sublunary sphere, is formed out of the magnale magnum, and is related to it. Man possesses a double celestial power, and is allied to heaven. This power is not only in the outer man, but to a degree also in the animals, and perhaps in all other things, as all things in the universe stand in a relation to each other, or, at least, God is in all things, as the ancients have observed it with a worthy correctness. It is necessary that the magic strength should be awakened in the outer as well as in the inner man. And if we call this a magic power, the uninstructed only can be terrified by the expression. But, if you prefer it, you can call it a spiritual power spirit to all a robervus atavarus. There is, therefore, such magic power in the inner man. But, as there exists a certain relationship between the inner and the outer man, this strength must be diffused through the whole man. In an extended description of the religious rites, monastic life, and superstitions of the Siamese, the law Luber cites among other things the wonderful power possessed by the tall point, the monks, or the holy. p. 214. Men of Buddha, over the wild beasts. The tall point of Siam, he says, will pass whole weeks in the dense woods under a small awning of branches and palm leaves, and never make a fire in the night to scare away the wild beasts, as all other people do who travel through the woods of this country. The people consider it a miracle that no tall point is ever devoured. The tigers, elephants, and rhinoceroses with which the neighborhood abounds respect him, and travelers place in secure ambuscade have often seen these wild beasts lick the hands and feet of the sleeping tall point. They all use magic, adds the French gentleman, and think all nature animated, and sold, they believe in tutelar geniuses. But that which seems to shock the author most is the idea which prevails among the Siamese, that all that man was in his bodily life, he will be after death. When the Tartar, which now reigns at China, remarks to La Lubert, would force the Chinese to shave their hair after the Tartarian fashion, several of them chose rather to suffer death than to go, they said, into the other world and appear before their ancestors without hair, imagining that they shaved the head of the soul also. Now, what is altogether impertinent, adds the ambassador, in this absurd opinion is, that the Orientals attribute the human figure rather than any other to the soul. Without enlightening his reader as to the particular shape these benighted Orientals ought to select for their disembodied souls, the law Luber proceeds to pour out his wrath on these savages. Finally, he attacks the memory of the old king of Siam, the father of the one to whose court he was sent, by accusing him of having foolishly spent over two million livres in search of the philosopher's stone. The Chinese, he says, reputed so wise, have for three or four thousand years had the folly of believing in the existence, and of seeking out a universal remedy by which they hope to exempt themselves from the necessity of dying. They base themselves on some foolish traditions, concerning some rare persons that are reported to have made bold, and to have lived some ages, there are some very strongly established facts among the Chinese, the Siamese, and other Orientals, concerning those that know how to render themselves immortal, either absolutely, or in such a manner that they can die no otherwise than by violent death. Wherefore, they name some persons who have withdrawn themselves from the sight of men to enjoy free and peaceable life. They relate wonders concerning the knowledge of these pretended immortals. If Descartes, a Frenchman and a scientist, could, in the midst of civilization, firmly believe that such a universal remedy had been found. p. 215. And that if possessed of it he could live at least five hundred years, why are not the Orientals entitled to the same belief? The master problems of both life and death are still unsolved by Occidental physiologists. Even sleep is a phenomenon about whose cause there is a great divergence of opinion among them. How, then, can they pretend to set limits to the possible, and to find the impossible? From the remotest ages the philosophers have maintained the singular power of music over certain diseases, especially of the nervous class. Kircher recommends it, having experienced its good effects in himself, and he gives an elaborate description of the instrument he employed. It was a harmonica composed of five tumblers of a very thin glass, placed in a row. In two of them were two different varieties of wine, in the third, brandy, in the fourth, oil, and the fifth, water. He extracted five melodious sounds from them in the usual way, by merely rubbing his finger on the edges of the tumblers. The sound has an attractive property, it draws out disease, which streams out to encounter the musical wave, and the two, blending together, disappear in space. Asclepiades employed music for the same purpose. Some twenty centuries ago, he blew a trumpet to cure sciatica, 
and its prolonged sound making the fibers of the nerves to palpitate, the pain invariably subsided. Democritus in like manner affirmed that many diseases could be cured by the melodious sounds of a flute. Mesmer used this very harmonica described by Kircher for his magnetic cures. The celebrated Scotchman, Maxwell, offered to prove to various medical faculties that with certain magnetic means at his disposal, he would cure any of the diseases abandoned by them as incurable, such as epilepsy, impotence, insanity, lameness, dropsy, and the most obstinate fevers. The familiar story of the exorcism of the evil spirit from God that obsessed Saul will recur to every one in this connection. It is thus related, and it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp, and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed, and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Maxwell, in his Medicina Magnetica, expounds the following propositions, all which are the very doctrines of the alchemists and Kabbalists. That which men call the world soul, is a life, as fire, spiritual, fleet, light, and ethereal as light itself. It is a life spirit everywhere, and everywhere the same. All matter is destitute of action, except as it is ensouled by this spirit. This spirit maintains all things in their peculiar condition. It is found in nature free from all fetters, and he. p. 216. Who understands how to unite it with a harmonizing body, possesses a treasure which exceeds all riches. This spirit is the common bond of all quarters of the earth, and lives through and in all audes in mundo quid commune omnibus mextis, in quote supermanent. He who knows this universal life spirit and its application can prevent all injuries. If thou canst avail thyself of this spirit and fix it on some particular body thou wilt perform the mystery of magic. He who knows how to operate on men by this universal spirit, can heal, and this at any distance that he pleases. He who can invigorate the particular spirit through the universal one, might continue his life to eternity. There is a blending together of spirits, or of emanations, even when they are far separated from each other. And what is this blending together? It is an eternal and incessant outpouring of the rays of one body into another. In the meantime, says Maxwell, it is not without danger to treat of this. Many abominable abuses of this may take place. And now let us see what are these abuses of mesmeric and magnetic powers in some healing mediums. Healing, to deserve the name, requires either faith in the patient, or robust health united with a strong will, in the operator. With expectancy supplemented by faith, one can cure himself of almost any morbific condition. The tomb of a saint, a holy relic, a talisman, a bit of paper or a garment that has been handled by the supposed healer, a nostrum, a penance, or a ceremonial, the laying on of hands, or a few words impressively pronounced either will do. It is a question of temperament imagination, self-cure. In thousands of instances, the doctor, the priest, or the relic has had credit for healings that were solely and simply due to the patient's unconscious will. The woman with the bloody issue who pressed through the throng to touch the robe of Jesus, was told that her faith had made her whole. The influence of mind over the body is so powerful that it has affected miracles at all ages. How many unhoped for, sudden, and prodigious cures have been affected by imagination, says Salvert. Our medical books are filled with facts of this nature which would easily pass for miracles. But, if the patient has no faith, what then? If he is physically nega. p. 217. Tive and receptive, and the healer strong, healthy, positive, determined, the disease may be extirpated by the imperative will of the operator, which, consciously or unconsciously, draws to and reinforces itself with the universal spirit of nature and restores the disturbed equilibrium of the patient's aura. He may employ as an auxiliary, a crucifix as Gassner did, or impose the hands and will, like the French Suave Jacob, like our celebrated American, Newton, the healer of many thousands of sufferers, and like many others, or like Jesus, and some apostles, he may cure by the word of command. The process in each case is the same. In all these instances, the cure is radical and real, and without secondary ill effects. But, when one who is himself physically diseased, attempts healing, he not only fails of that, but often imparts his illness to his patient, and robs him of what strength he may have. The decrepit King David reinforced his failing vigor with the healthy magnetism of the young Abishag, and the medical works tell us of an aged lady of Bath, England, who broke down the constitutions of two maids in succession, in the same way.
The old sages, in Paracelsus also, remove disease by applying a healthy organism to the afflicted part, and in the works of the above said fire philosopher, their theory is boldly and categorically set forth. If a diseased person medium or not attempts to heal, his force may be sufficiently robust to displace the disease, to disturb it in the present place, and cause it to shift to another, where shortly it will appear, the patient, meanwhile, thinking himself cured. But, what if the healer be morally diseased? The consequences may be infinitely more mischievous, for it is easier to cure a bodily disease than cleanse a constitution infected with moral turpitude. The mystery of Morzine, Savan, and that of the Jansenists, is still as great a mystery for physiologists as for psychologists. If the gift of prophecy, as well as hysteria and convulsions, can be imparted by infection, why not every vice? The healer, in such a case, conveys to his patient who is now his victim the moral poison that infects his own mind and heart. His magnetic touch is defilement, his glance, profanation. Against this insidious taint, there is no protection for the passively receptive subject. The healer holds him under his power, spellbound and powerless, as the serpent holds a poor, weak bird. The evil that one such healing medium can affect is incalculably great, and such healers there are by the hundred. But, as we have said before, there are real and godlike healers, who, notwithstanding all the malice and skepticism of their bigoted opponents, p. 218, have become famous in the world's history. Such are the Kirdar, of Lyons, Jacob, and Newton. Such, also, were Gassner, the clergyman of Clerstel, and the well-known Valentine Grey Trakes, the ignorant and poor Irishman, who was endorsed by the celebrated Robert Boyle, President of the Royal Society of London, in 1670. In 1870, he would have been sent to Bedlam, in company with other healers, if another president of the same society had had the disposal of the case, or Professor Lancaster would have summoned him under the vagrant act for practicing upon Her Majesty's subjects by palmistry or otherwise. But, to close a list of witnesses which might be extended indefinitely, it will suffice to say that, from first to last, from Pythagoras down to Eliphas Levi, from highest to humblest, every one teaches that the magical power is never possessed by those addicted to vicious indulgences. Only the pure and heart see God, or exercise divine gifts only such can heal the ills of the body, and allow themselves, with relative security, to be guided by the invisible powers. Such only can give peace to the disturbed spirits of their brothers and sisters, for the healing waters come from no poisonous source, grapes do not grow on thorns, and thistles bear no figs. But, for all this, magic has nothing supernal in it, it is a science, and even the power of casting out devils was a branch of it, of which the initiates made a special study. That skill which expels demons out of human bodies, is a science useful and sanative to men, says Josephus. The foregoing sketches are sufficient to show why we hold fast to the wisdom of the ages, in preference to any new theories that may have been hatched from the occurrences of our later days, respecting the laws of intermundane intercourse and the occult powers of man. While phenomena of a physical nature may have their value as a means of arousing the interests of materialists, and confirming, if not wholly, at least inferentially, our belief in the survival of our souls and spirits, it is questionable whether, under their present aspect, the modern phenomena are not doing more harm than good. Many minds, hungering after proofs of immortality, are fast falling into fanaticism, and, as Stowe remarks, fanatics are governed rather by imagination than judgment. Undoubtedly, believers in the modern phenomena can claim for themselves a diversity of endowments, but the discerning of spirits is evidently absent from this catalogue of spiritual gifts. Speaking of the Diaca, whom we one fine morning had discovered in a shady corner of the summer land, A. J. Davis, the great American seer, remarks, A diaca is one who takes insane delight in playing parts, in juggling. p. 219. Tricks, impersonating opposite characters, to whom prayer and profane utterances are of equal value, for charged with a passion for lyrical narrations, morally deficient, he is without the active feelings of justice, philanthropy, or tender affection. He knows nothing of what men call the sentiment of gratitude, the ends of hate and love are the same to him, his motto is often fearful and terrible to others self is the whole of private living, and exalted annihilation the end of all private life. Only yesterday, one said to a lady medium, signing himself Svedenborg, this, whatsoever is, has been, will be, or may be, that I am, 
in private life is but the aggregate of phantasms of thinking throblets, rushing in their rising onward to the central heart of eternal death. Porphyry, whose works to borrow the expression of an irritated phenomenalist are moldering like every other antiquated trash in the closets of oblivion, speaks thus of these diaca if such be their name rediscovered in the nineteenth century, it is with the direct help of these bad demons, that every kind of sorcery is accomplished, it is the result of their operations, and men who injure their fellow creatures by enchantments, usually pay great honors to these bad demons, and especially to their chief. These spirits pass their time in deceiving us, with a great display of cheap prodigies and illusions, their ambition is to be taken for gods, and their leader demands to be recognized as the supreme god. The spirit signing himself said and board just quoted from Davis's Diaca, and hinting that he is the I am, singularly resembles this chief leader of Porphyry's bad demons. What more natural than this vilification of the ancient and experienced theurgists by certain mediums, when we find Yamlikus, the expositor of spiritualistic theurgy, strictly forbidding all endeavors to procure such phenomenal manifestations, unless, after a long preparation of moral and physical purification, and under the guidance of experienced theurgists. When, furthermore, he declares that, with very few exceptions, for a person to appear elongated or thicker, or be borne aloft in the air, is a sure mark of obsession by bad demons. Everything in this world has its time, and truth, however based upon unimpeachable evidence, will not root or grow, unless, like a plant, it is thrown into soil in its proper season. The age must be prepared. p. 220. Says Professor Cook, in some thirty years ago this humble work would have been doomed to self-destruction by its own contents. But the modern phenomenon, notwithstanding the daily exposes, the ridicule with which it is crowned at the hand of every materialist, and its own numerous errors, grows and waxes strong in facts, if not in wisdom and spirit. What would have appeared twenty years ago simply preposterous, may well be listened to now that the phenomena are endorsed by great scientists. Unfortunately, if the manifestations increase in power daily, there is no corresponding improvement in philosophy. The discernment of spirits is still as wanting as ever. Perhaps, among the whole body of spiritualist writers of our day, not one is held in higher esteem for character, education, sincerity, and ability, than E. Sargent, of Boston, Massachusetts. His monograph entitled The Proof Palpable of Immortality, deservedly occupies a high rank among works upon the subject. With every disposition to be charitable and apologetic for mediums and their phenomena, Mr. Sargent is still compelled to use the following language, the power of spirits to reproduce simulacra of persons who have passed from the earth life, suggests the question how far can we be assured of the identity of any spirit, let the tests be what they may? We have not yet arrived at that stage of enlightenment that would enable us to reply confidently to this inquiry. There is much that is yet a puzzle in the language and action of this class of materialized spirits. As to the intellectual caliber of most of the spirits which lurk behind the physical phenomena, Mr. Sargent will unquestionably be accepted as a most competent judge, and he says, the great majority, as in this world, are of the unintellectual sort. If it is a fair question, we would like to ask why they should be so lacking in intelligence, if they are human spirits? Either intelligent human spirits cannot materialize, or, the spirits that do materialize have not human intelligence, and, therefore, by Mr. Sargent's own showing, they may just as well be elementary spirits, who have ceased to be human altogether, or those demons, which, according to the Persian Magi and Plato, hold a middle rank between gods and disembodied men. There is good evidence, that of Mr. Crooks for one, to show that many materialized spirits talk in an audible voice. Now, we have shown, on the testimony of ancients, that the voice of human spirits is not and cannot be articulated, being, as Emanuel Swedenborg declares, a deep suspiration. Who of the two classes of witnesses may be trusted more safely? Is it the ancients who had the experience of so many ages in theurgical practices, or modern spiritualists, who have had none at all, and who have no facts upon which to base an opinion, except such as have been communicated by spirits, whose identity they have no means? p. 221. Of proving? There are mediums whose organisms have called out sometimes hundreds of these would-be human forms. And yet we do not recollect to have seen or heard of one expressing anything but the most commonplace ideas. This fact ought surely to arrest the attention of even the most uncritical spiritualists. If a spirit can speak at all, and if the way is open to intelligent as well as to unintellectual beings, 
Why should they not sometimes give us addresses in some remote degree approximating in quality to the communications we receive through the direct writing? Mr. Sargent puts forward a very suggestive and important idea in this sentence. How far they are limited in their mental operations and in their recollections by the act of materialization, or how far by the intellectual horizon of the medium is still a question. If the same kind of spirits materialize that produce the direct writing, and both manifest through mediums, and the one talk nonsense, while the other often give us sublime philosophical teachings, why should their mental operations be limited by the intellectual horizon of the medium in the one instance more than in the other? The materializing mediums at least so far as our observation extends are no more uneducated than many peasants and mechanics who at different times have, under supernal influences, given profound and sublime ideas to the world. The history of psychology teems with examples and illustration of this point, among which that of Bohm, the inspired but ignorant shoemaker, and our own Davis, are conspicuous. As to the matter of unintellectuality we presume that no more striking cases need be sought than those of the child prophets of Savan, poets and seers, such as have been mentioned in previous chapters. When spirits have once furnished themselves with vocal organs to speak at all, it surely ought to be no more difficult for them to talk as persons of their assumed respective education, intelligence, and social rank would in life, instead of falling invariably into one monotonous tone of commonplace and, but too often, platitude. As to Mr. Sargent's hopeful remark, that the science of spiritualism being still in its infancy, we may hope for more light on this question, we fear we must reply, that it is not through dark cabinets that this light will ever break. It is simply ridiculous and absurd to require from every investigator who comes forward as a witness to the marvels of the day in psychological phenomena the diploma of a master of arts and sciences. The experience of the past 40 years is an evidence that it is not always the minds which are the most scientifically trained that are the best in matters of simple common sense and honest truth. Nothing blinds like p. 222. Fanaticism, or a one-sided view of a question. We may take as an illustration oriental magic or ancient spiritualism, as well as the modern phenomena. Hundreds, nay thousands of perfectly trustworthy witnesses, returning from residence and travels in the East, have testified to the fact that uneducated fakirs, sheiks, dervishes, and lamas have, in their presence, without confederates or mechanical appliances, produced wonders. They have affirmed that the phenomena exhibited by them were in contravention of all the known laws of science, and thus tended to prove the existence of many yet unknown occult potencies in nature, seemingly directed by preter human intelligences. What has been the attitude assumed by our scientists toward this subject? How far did the testimony of the most scientifically trained minds make impression on their own? Did the investigations of Professors Hare and de Morgan, of Crooks and Wallace, de Gasparin and Thury, Wagner and Butleroff, etc., shake for one moment their skepticism? How were the personal experiences of Jacques Leo with the fakirs of India received, or the psychological elucidations of Professor Purdy, of Geneva, viewed? How far does the loud cry of mankind, craving for palpable and demonstrated signs of a god, an individual soul, and of eternity, affect them, and what is their response? They pull down and destroy every vestige of spiritual things, but they erect nothing. We cannot get such signs with either retorts or crucibles, they say, hence, it's all but a delusion. In this age of cold reason and prejudice, even the church has to look to science for help. Creeds built on sand, and high-towering but rootless dogmas, crumble down under the cold breath of research, and pull down true religion in their fall. But the longing for some outward sign of a god in a life hereafter, remains as tenaciously as ever in the human heart. In vain is all sophistry of science, it can never stifle the voice of nature. Only her representatives have poisoned the pure waters of simple faith, and now humanity mirrors itself in waters made turbid with all the mud stirred up from the bottom of the once pure spring. The anthropomorphic god of our fathers is replaced by anthropomorphic monsters, and what is still worse, by the reflection of humanity itself in these waters, whose ripples send it back to distorted images of truth and facts as evoked by its misguided imagination. It is not a miracle that we want, writes the Reverend Brooke Herford, but to find palpable evidence of the spiritual and the divine. It is not to the prophets that men cry for such a sign, but rather to the scientists. Men feel as if all that groping about in the foremost verge or innermost recesses of creation should bring the investigator at length close to the deep, underlying facts of all things, to some unmistakable signs of God. The signs are there, and the scientists too, what can we expect more of them, now?
p. 223. That they have done so well their duty? Have they not, these titans of thought, dragged down God from his hiding place, and given us instead a protoplasm? At the Edinburgh meeting of the British Association, in 1871, Sir William Thompson said, Science is bound by the everlasting law of honor to face fearlessly every problem which can fairly be presented to it. In his turn, Professor Huxley remarks, With regard to the miracle question, I can only say that the word impossible is not, to my mind, applicable to matters of philosophy. The great Humboldt remarks that a presumptuous skepticism that rejects facts without examination of their truth is, in some respects, more injurious than unquestioning credulity. These men have proved untrue to their own teachings. The opportunity afforded them by the opening of the Orient, to investigate for themselves the phenomena alleged by every traveler to take place in those countries, has been rejected. Did our physiologists and pathologists ever so much as think of availing themselves of it to settle this most momentous subject of human thought? Oh, no, for they would never dare. It is not to be expected that the principal academicians of Europe and America should undertake a joint journey to Tibet and India, and investigate the fakir marvel on the spot and were one of them to go as a solitary pilgrim and witness all the miracles of creation, in that land of wonders, who, of his colleagues, could be expected to believe his testimony? It would be as tedious as superfluous to begin a restatement of facts, so forcibly put by others, Mr. Wallace and W. Howitt, have repeatedly and cleverly described the thousand and one absurd errors into which the learned societies of France and England have fallen, through their blind skepticism. If Cuvier could throw aside the fossil excavated in 1828 by Bou, the French geologist, only because the anatomist thought himself wiser than his colleague, and would not believe that human skeletons could be found 80 feet deep in the mud of the Rhine, and if the French Academy could discredit the assertions of Boucher de Perthes, in 1846, only to be criticized in its turn in 1860, when the truth of the Perthes discoveries and observations was fully confirmed by the whole body of geologists finding flint weapons in the drift gravels of northern France, and if McHenry's testimony, in 1825, to the fact that he had discovered worked flints, together with the remains of extinct animals, in Kent's whole cavern was laughed at, and that of p. 224. Godwin Austin to the same effect, in 1840, ridiculed still more, if that were possible, and all that excess of scientific skepticism and merriment could, in 1865, finally come to grief, and be shown to have been entirely uncalled for, when says Mr. Wallace all the previous reports for forty years were confirmed and shown to be even less wonderful than the reality, who can be so credulous as to believe in the infallibility of our science? And why wonder at the exhibition of such a lack of moral courage in individual members of this great and stubborn body known as modern science? Thus fact after fact has been discredited. From all sides we hear constant complaints. Very little is known of psychology. Size 1F. R. S. We must confess that we know little, if anything, in physiology, says another. Of all sciences, there is none which rests upon so uncertain a basis as medicine, reluctantly testifies a third. What do we know about the presumed nervous fluids? Nothing, as yet, puts in a fourth one, and so on in every branch of science. And, meanwhile, Phenomena, surpassing and interest all others of nature, and to be solved only by physiology, psychology, and the as yet unknown fluids, are either rejected as delusions, or, if even true, do not interest scientists. Or, what is still worse, when a subject, whose organism exhibits in itself the most important features of such occult though natural potencies, offers his person for an investigation, instead of an honest experiment being attempted with him he finds himself entrapped by a scientist and paid for his trouble with a sentence of three months' imprisonment. This is indeed promising. It is easy to comprehend that a fact given in 1731, testifying to another fact which happened during the papacy of Paul III, for instance, is disbelieved in 1876. And when scientists are told that the Romans preserved lights in their sepulchres for countless years by the oiliness of gold, and that one of such ever-burning lamps was found brightly burning in the tomb of Tullia, the daughter of Cicero, Notwithstanding that the tomb had been shut up 1550 years, they have a certain right to doubt, and even disbelieve the statement, until they assure themselves, on the evidence of their own senses, that such a thing is possible. In such a case they can reject the testimony of all the ancient and medieval philosophers. The burial of living fakirs and their subsequent resuscitation, after thirty days of inhumation, may have a suspicious look to them. So also with the self-infliction of mortal wounds, 
and the exhibition of their own bowels to the persons present by various laws, who heal such wounds almost instantaneously. p. 225. For certain men who deny the evidence of their own senses as to phenomena produced in their own country, and before numerous witnesses, the narratives to be found in classical books, and in the notes of travelers, must of course seem absurd. But what we will never be able to understand is the collective stubbornness of the academies, in the face of such bitter lessons in the past, to these institutions which have so often darkened counsel by words without knowledge. Like the Lord answering Job out of the whirlwind, magic can say to modern science, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. And, who art thou who dare say to nature, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed? But what matters it if they do deny? Can they prevent phenomena taking place in the four corners of the world, if their skepticism were a thousand times more bitter? The cares will still be buried and resuscitated, gratifying the curiosity of European travelers, and the loss in Hindu ascetics will wound, mutilate, and even disembowel themselves, and find themselves all the better for it, and the denials of the whole world will not blow sufficiently to extinguish the perpetually burning lamps in certain of the subterranean crypts of India, Tibet, and Japan. One of such lamps is mentioned by the Rev. S. Matir, of the London Mission. In the Temple of Trevandrum, in the Kingdom of Travancore, South India, there is a deep well inside the temple, into which immense riches are thrown year by year, and in another place, in a hollow covered by a stone, a great golden lamp, which was lit over 120 years ago, still continues burning, says this missionary in his description of the place. Catholic missionaries attribute these lamps, as a matter of course, to the obliging services of the devil. The more prudent Protestant divine mentions the fact, and makes no commentary. The Abbe Huck has seen and examined one of such lamps, and so have other people whose good luck it has been to win the confidence and friendship of Eastern Lamas and divines. No more can be denied the wonders seen by Captain Lane in Egypt, the Benares experiences of Jacques Leo and those of Sir Charles Napier, the levitations of human beings in broad daylight and which can be accounted for only on the explanation given in the introductory chapter of the present work. Such limitations are testified to besides Mr. Crooks by Professor Purdy, who shows them produced in open air, and lasting sometimes twenty minutes. All these phenomena and many more have happened, do, and will happen in every country of this globe, and that in spite of all the skeptics and scientists that ever were evolved out of the Solarian mud. P. 226 among the ridiculed claims of alchemy is that of the perpetual lamps. If we tell the reader that we have seen such, we may be asked in case that the sincerity of our personal belief is not questioned how we can tell that the lamps we have observed are perpetual, as the period of our observation was but limited? Simply that, as we know the ingredients employed, and the manner of their construction, and the natural law applicable to the case, we are confident that our statement can be corroborated upon investigation in the proper quarter. What that quarter is, and from whom that knowledge can be learned, our critics must discover, by taking the pains we did. Meanwhile, however, we will quote a few of the 173 authorities who have written upon the subject. None of these, as we recollect, have asserted that these sepulchral lamps would burn perpetually, but only for an indefinite number of years, and instances are recorded of their continuing alight for many centuries. It will not be denied that, if there is a natural law by which a lamp can be made without replenishment to burn ten years, there is no reason why the same law could not cause the combustion to continue one hundred or one thousand years. Among the many well-known personages who firmly believed and strenuously asserted that such sepulchral lamps burned for several hundreds of years, and would have continued to burn maybe forever, had they not been extinguished, or the vessels broken by some accident, we may reckon the following names, Clemens Alexandrinus, Hermolaeus Barbarus, Appian, Baratinus, Cytosius, Celius, Foxius, Costius, Cassilius, Cedrinus, Dorius, Heresius, Gesnerus, Jacobonus, Leander, Lubavius, Lazius, P. Delamarandola, Philolithes, Lysetus, Malus, Maturantius, Bacci Supporta, Pancarolus, Russelius, Scardionius, Ludovicus Vives, Volaterinus, Paracelsus, several Arabian alchemists, and finally, Pliny, Solinus, Kircher, and Albertus Magnus. The discovery is claimed by the ancient Egyptians, those sons of the land of chemistry. At least, they were a people who used these lamps far more than any other nation, on account of their religious doctrines. 
The astral soul of the mummy was believed to be lingering about the body for the whole space of the 3,000 years of the circle of necessity. Attached to it by a magnetic thread, which could be broken but by its own exertion, the Egyptians hoped that the ever-burning lamp, symbol of their incorruptible and immortal spirit, would at last decide the more material soul to part with its earthly dwelling, and unite forever with its divine self. Therefore lamps were hung in the sepulchres of the rich. Such lamps are often found in the subterranean caves of the dead. P. 227. And Lysetus has written a large folio to prove that in his time, whenever a sepulchre was opened, a burning lamp was found within the tomb, but was instantaneously extinguished on account of the desecration. T. Livius, Baratinus, and Michael Shatta, in their letters to Kircher, affirm that they found many lamps in the subterranean caves of old Memphis. Pausanias speaks of the golden lamp in the temple of Minerva at Athens, which he says was the workmanship of Callimachus, and burned a whole year. Plutarch affirms that he saw one in the temple of Jupiter Amun, and that the priests assured him that it had burned continually for years, and though it stood in the open air, neither wind nor water could extinguish it. St. Augustine, the Catholic authority, also describes a lamp in the fane of Venus, of the same nature as the others, unextinguishable either by the strongest wind or by water. A lamp was found at Edessa, says Cadrinus, which, being hidden at the top of a certain gate, burned five hundred years. But of all such lamps, the one mentioned by Libius Maximus of Padua is by far the more wonderful. It was found near a test, and Scardionis gives a glowing description of it, in a large earthen urn was contained a lesser, and in that a burning lamp, which had continued so for one thousand five hundred years, by means of a most pure liquor contained in two bottles, one of gold and the other of silver. These are in the custody of Franciscus Maturantius, and are by him valued at an exceeding rate. Taking no account of exaggerations, in putting aside as mere unsupported negation the affirmation by modern science of the impossibility of such lamps, we would ask whether, in case these inextinguishable fires are found to have really existed in the ages of miracles, the lamps burning at Christian shrines and those of Jupiter, Minerva, and other pagan deities, ought to be differently regarded. According to certain theologians, it would appear that the former, for Christianity also claims such lamps, have burned by a divine, miraculous power, and that the light of the latter, made by heathen art, was supported by the wiles of the devil. Kircher and Lysetis show that they were ordered in these two diverse ways. The lamp at Antioch, which burned 1,500 years, in an open and public place, over the door of a church, was preserved by the power of God, who hath made so infinite a number of stars to burn with perpetual light. As to the pagan lamps, St. Augustine assures us they were the work of the devil, who deceives us in a thousand ways. What more easy for Satan to do than represent a flash of light, or bright flame to them who first enter into such a subterranean cave? This was asserted. p. 228. By all good Christians during the papacy of Paul III, when upon opening the tomb in the Appian Way, at Rome, there was found the entire body of a young girl swimming in a bright liquor which had so well preserved it, that the face was beautiful and like life itself. At her feet burned a lamp, whose flame vanished upon opening the sepulchre. From some engraved signs it was found to have been buried for over 1,500 years, and supposed to have been the body of Tulula, or Tullia, Cicero's daughter. Chemists and physicists deny that perpetual lamps are possible, alleging that whatever is resolved into vapor or smoke cannot be permanent, but must consume, and as the oily nutriment of a lighted lamp is exhaled into a vapor, hence the fire cannot be perpetual for want of food. Alchemists, on the other hand, deny that all the nourishment of kindled fire must of necessity be converted into vapor. They say that there are things in nature which will not only resist the force of fire and remain inconsumable, but will also prove inextinguishable by either wind or water. In an old chemical work of the year 1700, called New Epsilon Kappa Rho Omicron Kappa Epsilon Delta Epsilon Iota Alpha, the author gives a number of refutations of the claims of various alchemists. But though he denies that a fire can be made to burn perpetually, he is half inclined to believe it possible that a lamp should burn several hundred years. Besides, we have a mass of testimony from alchemists who devoted years to these experiments and came to the conclusion that it was possible. There are some peculiar preparations of gold, silver, and mercury, also of naphtha, petroleum, and other bituminous oils. Alchemists also named the oil of camphor and amber, the lapis asbestos seu amianthus, the lapis caristius, cyprius, and lenum vivum seu credium, as employed for such lamps. 
They affirm that such matter can be prepared either of gold or silver, reduced to fluid, and indicate that gold is the fittest pabulum for their wondrous flame, as, of all metals, gold wastes the least when either heated or melted, and, moreover, can be made to reabsorb its oily humidity as soon as exhaled, so continuously feeding its own flame when it is once lighted. The Kabbalists assert that the secret was known to Moses, who had learned it from the Egyptians, and that the lamp ordered by the Lord to burn on the tabernacle, was an inextinguishable lamp. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. Exod. 27. 20. Lysetis also denies that these lamps were prepared of metal, but on, p. 229. Page 44 of his work mentions a preparation of quicksilver filtrated seven times through white sand by fire, of which, he says, lamps were made that would burn perpetually. Both Maturantius and Cytoses firmly believe that such a work can be done by a purely chemical process. This liquor of quicksilver was known among alchemists as aqua mercurialis, materia metallorum, perpetua dispositio, and materia prima artis, also olean vitri. Tradenheim and Bartolomeo Korndorf both made preparations for the inextinguishable fire, and left their recipes for it. Asbestos which was known to the Greeks under the name of Alpha Sigma Beta Epsilon Sigma Tau Omicron Sigma, or inextinguishable, is a kind of stone, which once set on fire. p. 230. Cannot be quenched, as Pliny and Salinas tell us. Albertus Magnus describes it as a stone of an iron color, found mostly in Arabia. It is generally found covered with a hardly perceptible oleaginous moisture, which upon being approached with a lighted candle will immediately catch fire. Many were the experiments made by chemists to extract from it this indissoluble oil, but they are alleged to have all failed. But, are chemists prepared to say that the above operation is utterly impracticable? If this oil could once be extracted there can be no question but it would afford a perpetual fuel. The ancients might well boast of having had the secret of it, for, we repeat, there are experimenters living at this day who have done so successfully. Chemists who have vainly tried it have asserted that the food or liquor chemically extracted from that stone was more of a watery than oily nature, and so impure and feculent that it could not burn. Others affirmed, on the contrary, that the oil, as soon as exposed to the air, became so thick and solid that it would hardly flow, and when lighted emitted no flame, but escaped in dark smoke, whereas the lamps of the ancients are alleged to have burned with the purest and brightest flame, without emitting the slightest smoke. Kircher, who shows the practicability of purifying it, thinks it so difficult as to be accessible only to the highest adepts of alchemy. St. Augustine, who attributes the whole of these arts to the Christian scapegoat, the devil, is flatly contradicted by Ludovicus Vives, who shows that all such would-be magical operations are the work of man's industry and deep study of the hidden secrets of nature, wonderful and miraculous as they may seem. Potocoterus, a Cypriot knight, had both flax and linen made out of another asbestos, which Porcacius says he saw at the house of this knight. Pliny calls this flax linum vinum, an Indian flax, and says it is done out of asbestum sive asbestinum, a kind of flax of which they made cloth that was to be cleaned by throwing it in the fire. He adds that it was as precious as pearls and diamonds, for not only was it very rarely found but exceedingly difficult to be woven, on account of the shortness of the threads. Being beaten flat with a hammer, it is soaked in warm water, and when dried its filaments can be easily divided into threads like flax and woven into cloth. Pliny asserts he has seen some towels made of it, and assisted in an experiment of purifying them by fire. Bachista Porta also states that he found the same, at Venice, in the hands of a Cyprian lady, he calls this discovery of alchemy a secretum optimum. Dr. Grew, in his description of the curiosities in Gresham College. p. 231. 17th century, believes the art, as well as the use of such linen, altogether lost, but it appears that it was not quite so, for we find the museum Septalius boasting of the possession of thread, ropes, paper, and network done of this material as late as 1726, some of these articles made, moreover, by the own hand of Septalius, as we learn in Greenhill's Art of Embalming, p. 361. Grew, says the author, seems to make Asbestinus Lapis and Amianthus all one, and calls them in English the thrum stone, he says it grows in short threads or thrums, from about a quarter of an inch to an inch in length, parallel and glossy, as fine as though small, single threads the silkworm spin, and very flexible like to flax or tow. 
That the secret is not altogether lost is proved by the fact that some Buddhist convents in China and Tibet are in possession of it. Whether made of the fiber of one or the other of such stones, we cannot say, but we have seen in a monastery of female tall points, a yellow gown, such as the Buddhist monks wear, thrown into a large pit, full of glowing coals, and taken out two hours afterward as clear as if it had been washed with soap and water. Similar severe trials of asbestos having occurred in Europe and America in our own times, the substance is being applied to various industrial purposes, such as roofing cloth, and combustible dresses and fireproof safes. A very valuable deposit on Staten Island, in New York Harbor, yields the mineral in bundles, like dry wood, with fibers of several feet in length. The finer variety of asbestos, called Alpha Mu Iota Alpha Nu Tau Omicron Sigma, undefiled, by the ancients, took its name from its white, satin-like luster. The ancients made the wick of their perpetual lamps from another stone also, which they called Lapis Caristius. The inhabitants of the city of Caristo seem to have made no secret of it, as Matthias Ratter says in his work that they kemp, spun, and wove this downy stone into mantles, table linen, and the like, which when foul they purified again with fire instead of water. Pausanias, in Atticus, and Plutarch also assert that the wicks of lamps were made from this stone, but Plutarch adds that it was no more to be found in his time. Lysidus is inclined to believe that the perpetual lamps used by the ancients in their sepulchres had no wicks at all, as very few have been found, but Ludovicus Vives is of a contrary opinion and affirms that he has seen quite a number of them. Lysidus, moreover, is firmly persuaded that a pabulum for fire may be given with such an equal temperament as cannot be consumed but after a long series of ages, and so that neither the matter shall exhale. p. 232. But strongly resist the fire, nor the fire consume the matter, but be restrained by it, as it were with a chain, from flying upward. To this, Sir Thomas Brown, speaking of lamps which have burned many hundred years, included in small bodies, observes that this proceeds from the purity of the oil, which yields no fuliginous exhalations to suffocate the fire, for if air had nourished the flame, then it had not continued many minutes, for it would certainly in that case have been spent and wasted by the fire. But he adds, the art of preparing this inconsumable oil is lost. Not quite, and time will prove it, though all that we now write should be doomed to fail, like so many other truths. We are told, in behalf of science, that she accepts no other mode of investigation than observation and experiment. Agreed, and have we not the records of say three thousand years of observation of facts going to prove the occult powers of man? As to experiment, what better opportunity could have been asked than the so-called modern phenomena have afforded? In 1869, various scientific Englishmen were invited by the London Dialectical Society to assist in an investigation of these phenomena. Let us see what our philosophers replied. Professor Huxley wrote, I have no time for such an inquiry, which would involve much trouble and, unless it were unlike all inquiries of that kind I have known, much annoyance. I take no interest in the subject but supposing the phenomena to be genuine they do not interest me. Mr. George H. Lewis expresses a wise thing in the following sentence, When any man says that phenomena are produced by no known physical laws, he declares he knows the laws by which they are produced. Professor Tyndall expresses doubt as to the possibility of good results at any seance which he might attend. His presence, according to the opinion of Mr. Varley, throws everything in confusion. Professor Carpenter writes, I have satisfied myself by personal investigation, that, whilst the great number of what passes such, i.e., spiritual manifestations, are the results of intentional imposture, and many others of self-deception, there are certain phenomena which are quite genuine, and must be considered as fair subjects of scientific study, the source of these phenomena does not lie in any communication ab extra, but depends upon the subjective condition of the individual which operates according to certain recognized physiological laws, the process to which I have given the name unconscious cerebration, performs a p. 233. Large part in the production of the phenomena known as spiritualistic. And it is thus that the world is apprised through the organ of exact science, that unconscious cerebration has acquired the faculty of making the guitars fly in the air and forcing furniture to perform various clownish tricks. So much for the opinions of the English scientists. The Americans have not done much better. In 1857, a committee of Harvard University warned the public against investigating this subject, which corrupts the morals and degrades the intellect. They called it, furthermore, a contaminating influence, 
which surely tends to lessen the truth of man and the purity of woman. Later, when Professor Robert Hare, the great chemist, defying the opinions of his contemporaries, investigated spiritualism, and became a believer, he was immediately declared non compass and in 1874, when one of the New York Daily Papers addressed a circular letter to the principal scientists of this country, asking them to investigate, and offering to pay the expenses, they, like the guests bidden to the supper, with one consent, began to make excuses. Yet, despite the indifference of Huxley, the jocularity of Tyndall, and the unconscious cerebration of Carpenter, many a scientist as noted as either of them, has investigated the unwelcome subject, and, overwhelmed with the evidence, become converted and another scientist, and a great author although not a spiritualist bears this honorable testimony, that the spirits of the dead occasionally revisit the living, or haunt their former abodes, has been in all ages, in all European countries, a fixed belief, not confined to rustics, but participated in by the intelligent. If human testimony on such subjects can be of any value, there is a body of evidence reaching from the remotest ages to the present time, as extensive and unimpeachable as is to be found in support of anything whatever. Unfortunately, human skepticism is a stronghold capable of defying any amount of testimony. And to begin with Mr. Huxley, our men of science accept of but so much as suits them, and no more. O oh, shame to men! Devil with devil damned! Firm concord holds, men only disagree. Of creatures rational! How can we account for such divergence of views among men taught out of the same textbooks and deriving their knowledge from the same? p. 234. Source? Clearly, this is but one more corroboration of the truism that no two men see the same thing exactly alike. This idea is admirably formulated by Dr. J. J. Garth Wilkinson, in a letter to the Dialectical Society. I have long, says he, been convinced, by the experience of my life as a pioneer in several heterodoxies which are rapidly becoming orthodoxies, that nearly all truth is temperamental to us, or given in the affections and intuitions, and that discussion and inquiry do little more than feed temperament. This profound observer might have added to his experience that of Bacon, who remarks that, a little philosophy inclineth a man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth man's mind about to religion. Professor Carpenter vaunts the advanced philosophy of the present day which ignores no fact however strange that can be attested by valid evidence, and yet he would be the first to reject the claims of the ancients to philosophical and scientific knowledge, although based upon evidence quite as valid as that which supports the pretensions of men of our times to philosophical or scientific distinction. In the Department of Science, let us take for example the subjects of electricity and electromagnetism which have exalted the names of Franklin and Morse to so high a place upon a roll of fame. Six centuries before the Christian era, Thales is said to have discovered the electric properties of amber, and yet the later researches of Schwiger, as given in his extensive works on symbolism, have thoroughly demonstrated that all the ancient mythologies were based on the science of natural philosophy, and show that the most occult properties of electricity and magnetism were known to the theurgists of the earliest mysteries recorded in history, those of Samothrace. Diodorus, of Sicily, Herodotus, and Sanconitone, the Phoenician the oldest of historians tell us that these mysteries originated in the night of time, centuries and probably thousands of years prior to the historical period. One of the best proofs of it we find in a most remarkable picture, in Raoul Rochette's monuments d'antiquité figures, in which, like the erect haired pan, all the figures have their hair streaming out in every direction except the central figure of the Cabarian Demeter, from whom the power issues and one other, a kneeling man. The picture, according to Schwiger, evidently represents a part of the ceremony of initiation. And yet it is not so long since the elementary works on natural philosophy began to be ornamented with cuts of electrified heads, with hair. p. 235. Standing out in all directions, under the influence of the electric fluid. Schwiger shows that a lost natural philosophy of antiquity was connected with the most important religious ceremonies. He demonstrates in the amplest manner, that magic in the prehistoric periods had a part in the mysteries and that the greatest phenomena, the so-called miracles whether pagan, Jewish, or Christian rested in fact on the arcane knowledge of the ancient priests of physics and all the branches of chemistry, or rather alchemy. In chapter 11, which is entirely devoted to the wonderful achievements of the ancients, we propose to demonstrate our assertions more fully. We will show, on the evidence of the most trustworthy classics, that at a period far anterior to the siege of Troy, 
The learned priests of the sanctuaries were thoroughly acquainted with electricity and even lightning conductors. We will now add but a few more words before closing the subject. The theurgists so well understood the minutest properties of magnetism, that, without possessing the lost key to their arcana, but depending wholly upon what was known in their modern days of electromagnetism, Schwiger and Enemoser have been able to trace the identity of the twin brothers, the Dioscuri, with the polarity of electricity and magnetism. Symbolical myths, previously supposed to be meaningless fictions, are now found to be the cleverest and at the same time most profound expressions of a strictly scientifically defined truth of nature, according to Enemoser. Our physicists pride themselves on the achievements of our century and exchange antiphonal hymns of praise. The eloquent diction of their class lectures, their flowery phraseology, required but a slight modification to change these lectures into melodious sonnets. Our modern Petrarchs, Dantes, and Torquato Tasso's rival with the troubadours of old and poetical effusion. In their unbounded glorification of matter, they sing the amorous commingling of the wandering atoms, and the loving interchange of protoplasms, and lament the coquettish fickleness of forces which play so provokingly at hide-and-seek with their grave professors in the great drama of life, called by them force correlation. Proclaiming matter's soul an autocratic sovereign of the boundless universe, they would forcibly divorce her from her consort, and place the widowed queen on the great throne of nature made vacant by the exiled spirit. And now, they try to make her appear as attractive as they can by incensing and worshipping at the shrine of their own building. Do they forget, or are they utterly unaware of the fact, that in the absence of its p. 236. Legitimate sovereign, this throne is but a whitened sepulchre, inside of which all is rottenness and corruption. That matter without the spirit which vivifies it, and of which it is but the gross purgation, to use a hermetic expression, is nothing but a soulless corpse, whose limbs, in order to be moved in predetermined directions, require an intelligent operator at the great galvanic battery called life. And what particular is the knowledge of the present century so superior to that of the ancients? When we say knowledge we do not mean that brilliant and clear definition of our modern scholars of particulars to the most trifling detail in every branch of exact science, of that tuition which finds an appropriate term for every detail and significant and microscopic as it may be, a name for every nerve and artery in human and animal organisms, an appellation for every cell, filament, and rib in a plant, but the philosophical and ultimate expression of every truth in nature. The greatest ancient philosophers are accused of shallowness and a superficiality of knowledge of those details and exact sciences of which the moderns boast so much. Plato is declared by his various commentators to have been utterly ignorant of the anatomy and functions of the human body, to have known nothing of the uses of the nerves to convey sensations, and to have had nothing better to offer than vain speculations concerning physiological questions. He has simply generalized the divisions of the human body, they say, and given nothing reminding us of anatomical facts. As to his own views on the human frame, the microcosmos being in his ideas the image and miniature of the macrocosmos, they are much too transcendental to be given the least attention by our exact and materialistic skeptics. The idea of this frame being, as well as the universe, formed out of triangles, seems preposterously ridiculous to several of his translators. Alone of the latter, Professor Joet, in his introduction to the Timaeus, honestly remarks that the modern physical philosopher hardly allows to his notions the merit of being the dead men's bones out of which he has himself risen to a higher knowledge, forgetting how much the metaphysics of olden times has helped the physical sciences of the present day. If, instead of quarreling with the insufficiency and at times absence of terms and definitions strictly scientific in Plato's works, we analyze them carefully, the Timaeus, alone, will be found to contain within its limited space the germs of every new discovery. The circulation of the blood and the law of gravitation are clearly mentioned, though the former fact, it may be, is not so clearly defined as to withstand the reiterated attacks of modern. p. 237. Science, for according to Professor Joet, the specific discovery that the blood flows out at one side of the heart through the arteries, and returns through the veins at the other, was unknown to him, though Plato was perfectly aware that blood is a fluid in constant motion. Plato's method like that of geometry, was to descend from universals to particulars. Modern science vainly seeks a first cause among the permutations of molecules, the former sought and founded amid the majestic sweep of worlds. For him it was enough to know the great scheme of creation and to be able to trace the mightiest movements of the universe through their changes to their ultimates. The petty details, 
whose observation and classification have so taxed and demonstrated the patience of modern scientists, occupied but little of the attention of the old philosophers. Hence, while a fifth-form boy of an English school can prate more learnedly about the little things of physical science than Plato himself, yet, on the other hand, the dullest of Plato's disciples could tell more about great cosmic laws and their mutual relations, and demonstrate a familiarity with and control over the occult forces which lie behind them, than the most learned professor in the most distinguished academy of our day. This fact, so little appreciated and never dwelt upon by Plato's translators, accounts for the self-laudation in which we moderns indulge at the expense of that philosopher and his compeers. Their alleged mistakes in anatomy and physiology are magnified to an inordinate extent to gratify our self-love, until, in acquiring the idea of our own superior learning, we lose sight of the intellectual splendor which adorns the ages of the past. It is as if one should, in fancy, magnify the solar spots until he should believe the bright luminary to be totally eclipsed. The unprofitableness of modern scientific research is events in the fact that while we have a name for the most trivial particle of mineral, plant, animal, and man, the wisest of our teachers are unable to tell us anything definite about the vital force which produces the changes in these several kingdoms. It is necessary to seek further for corroboration of this statement than the works of our highest scientific authorities themselves. It requires no little moral courage in a man of eminent professional position to do justice to the acquirements of the ancients, in the face of a public sentiment which is content with nothing else than their abasement. When we meet with a case of the kind we gladly lay a laurel at the feet of the bold and honest scholar. Such is Professor Jowett, Master of Balliol College, and Regis Professor of Greek in the University of Oxford, who, in his translation of Plato's works, speaking of the physical philosophy of the ancients as a whole, gives them the following. p. 238. Credit, 1. That the nebular theory was the received belief of the early physicists. Therefore it could not have rested, as Draper asserts, upon the telescopic discovery made by Herschel I. 2. That the development of animals out of frogs who came to land, and of man out of the animals, was held by Anaximenes, in the 6th century before Christ. The professor might have added that this theory antedated Anaximenes by some thousands of years, perhaps, that it was an accepted doctrine among Chaldeans, and that Darwin's evolution of species and monkey theory are of an antediluvian origin. 3. That, even by Philolaeus and the early Pythagoreans, the Earth was held to be a body like the other stars revolving in space. Thus Galileo, studying some Pythagorean fragments, which are shown by Rochelin to have yet existed in the days of the Florentine mathematician, being, moreover, familiar with the doctrines of the old philosophers, but reasserted an astronomical doctrine which prevailed in India at the remotest antiquity. 4. The ancients thought that there was a sex in plants as well as in animals. Thus our modern naturalists had but to follow in the steps of their predecessors. 5. That musical notes depended on the relative length or tension of the strings from which they were emitted, and were measured by ratios of number. 6. That mathematical laws pervaded the world and even qualitative differences were supposed to have their origin in number. And 7. The annihilation of matter was denied by them, and held to be a transformation only. Although one of these discoveries might have been supposed to be a happy guess, adds Mr. Jowett, we can hardly attribute them all to mere coincidences. In short, the Platonic philosophy was one of order, system, and proportion. It embraced the evolution of worlds and species, the correlation and conservation of energy, the transmutation of material form, the indestructibility of matter and of spirit. Their position in the latter respect being far in advance of modern science, and binding, the arch of their p. 239. Philosophical system with a keystone at once perfect and immovable. If science has made such colossal strides during these latter days if we have such clear ideas of natural law then the ancients why are our inquiries as to the nature and source of life unanswered? If the modern laboratory is so much richer in the fruits of experimental research than those of the olden time, how comes it that we make no step except on paths that were trodden long before the Christian era? How does it happen that the most advanced standpoint that has been reached in our times only enables us to see in the dim distance up the alpine path of knowledge the monumental proofs that earlier explorers have left to mark the plateaus they had reached and occupied? If modern masters are so much in advance of the old ones, why do they not restore to us the lost arts of our post-Diluvian forefathers? Why do they not give us the unfading colors of Lux or the Tyrian purple, the bright vermilion and dazzling blue which decorate the walls of this place, 
and are as bright as on the first day of their application. The indestructible cement of the pyramids and of ancient aqueducts, the Damascus blade, which can be turned like a corkscrew in its scabbard without breaking, the gorges, unparalleled tints of the stained glass that is found amid the dust of old ruins and beams in the windows of ancient cathedrals, and the secret of the true malleable glass? And if chemistry is so little able to rival even with the early medieval ages in some arts, why boast of achievements which, according to strong probability, were perfectly known thousands of years ago? The more archaeology and philology advance, the more humiliating to our pride are the discoveries which are daily made, the more glorious testimony do they bear in behalf of those who, perhaps on account of the distance of their remote antiquity, have been until now considered ignorant flounderers in the deepest mire of superstition. Why should we forget that, ages before the prow of the adventurous Genoese clove the western waters, the Phoenician vessels had circumnavigated the globe, and spread civilization in regions now silent and deserted? What archaeologists will dare assert that the same hand which planned the pyramids of Egypt, Karnak, and the thousand ruins now crumbling to oblivion on the sandy banks of the Nile, did not erect the monumental knock on what of Cambodia? Or trace the hieroglyphics on the obelisks and doors of the deserted Indian village, newly discovered in British Columbia by Lord Dufferin? Or those on the ruins of Palenque and Uxmal, of Central America? Do not the relics we treasure in our museum's last mementos of the long-lost art speak loudly in favor of ancient civilization? And do they not prove, over and over again, that nations and continents that have passed away have buried? p. 240. Along with them arts and sciences, which neither the first crucible ever heated in a medieval cloister, nor the last cracked by a modern chemist have revived, nor will at least, in the present century. They were not without some knowledge of optics. Professor Draper magnanimously concedes to the ancients, others positively denied to them even that little. The convex lens found at Nimrod shows that they were not unacquainted with magnifying instruments. Indeed? If they were not, all the classical authors must have lied. For, when Cicero tells us that he had seen the entire Iliad written on skin of such a miniature size, that it could easily be rolled up inside a nutshell, and Pliny asserts that Nero had a ring with a small glass in it, through which he watched the performance of the gladiators at a distance could audacity go farther? Truly, when we are told that Mauritius could see from the promontory of Sicily over the entire sea to the coast of Africa, with an instrument called Noscopit, we must either think that all these witnesses lied, or that the ancients were more than slightly acquainted with optics and magnifying glasses. Wendell Phillips states that he has a friend who possesses an extraordinary ring perhaps three-quarters of an inch in diameter, and on it is the naked figure of the god Hercules. By the aid of glasses, you can distinguish the interlacing muscles, and count every separate hair on the eyebrows. Rawlinson brought home a stone about twenty inches long and ten wide, containing an entire treatise on mathematics. It would be perfectly illegible without glasses. In Dr. Abbott's museum, there is a ring of Cheops, to which Bunsen assigns 500 BC the signet of the ring is about the size of a quarter of a dollar, and the engraving is invisible without the aid of glasses. At Parma, they will show you a gem once worn on the finger of Michelangelo, of which the engraving is 2,000 years old, and on which there are the figures of seven women. You must have the aid of powerful glasses in order to distinguish the forms at all. So the microscope, adds the learned lecturer, instead of dating from our time, finds its brothers in the books of Moses and these are infant brothers. The foregoing facts do not seem to show that the ancients had merely some knowledge of optics. Therefore, Totally disagreeing in this particular with Professor Fisk and his criticism of Professor Draper's conflict in his unseen world, the only fault we find with the admirable book of Draper is that, as an historical critic, he sometimes uses his own optical instruments in the wrong place. While, in order to magnify the atheism of the Pythagorean Bruno, he looks through convex lenses, when p. 241. Ever talking of the knowledge of the ancients? he evidently sees things through concave ones. It is simply worthy of admiration to follow on various modern works the cautious attempts of both pious Christians and skeptical, albeit very learned men, to draw a line of demarcation between what we are and what we are not to believe, in ancient authors. No credit is ever allowed them without being followed by a qualifying caution. If Strabo tells us that ancient Nineveh was 47 miles in circumference, and his testimony is accepted, why should it be otherwise the moment he testifies to the accomplishment of sibylline prophecies? Where is the common sense in calling Herodotus the father of history, and then accusing him, in the same breath, of silly gibberish, 
whenever he recounts marvelous manifestations, of which he was an eyewitness? Perhaps, after all, such a caution is more than ever necessary, now that our epoch has been christened the century of discovery. The disenchantment may prove too cruel for Europe. Gunpowder, which has long been thought an invention of Bacon and Schwartz, is now shown in the school books to have been used by the Chinese for leveling hills and blasting rocks, centuries before our era. In the Museum of Alexandria, says Draper, there was a machine invented by Hero, the mathematician, a little more than 100 years BC it revolved by the agency of steam, and was of the form that we should now call a reaction engine. Chance had nothing to do with the invention of the modern steam engine. Europe prides herself upon the discoveries of Copernicus and Galileo, and now we are told that the astronomical observations of the Chaldeans extend back to within a hundred years of the flood, and Bunsen fixes the flood at not less than ten thousand years before our era. Moreover, a Chinese emperor, more than two thousand years before the birth of Christ, i.e., before Moses, put to death his two chief astronomers for not predicting an eclipse of the sun. It may be noted, as an example of the inaccuracy of current notions as to the scientific claims of the present century, that the discoveries of the indestructibility of matter and force correlation, especially the latter, are heralded as among our crowning triumphs. It is the most important discovery of the present century, as Sir William Armstrong expressed it in his famous address as president of the British Association. But, this important discovery is no discovery after all. Its origin, apart from the undeniable traces of it to be found among the old philosophers, is lost in the dense shadows of prehistoric days. Its first vestiges are discovered. p. 242. In the dreamy speculations of Vedic theology, in the doctrine of emanation and absorption, the nirvana in short, John Origina outlined it in his bold philosophy in the 8th century, and we invite anyone to read his The Division Naturae, who would convince himself of this truth. Science tells that when the theory of the indestructibility of matter, also a very, very old idea of Democritus, by the way, was demonstrated, it became necessary to extend it to force. No material particle can ever be lost, no part of the force existing in nature can vanish, hence, force was likewise proved indestructible, and its various manifestations or forces, under divers aspects, were shown to be mutually convertible, and with different modes of motion of the material particles, and thus was rediscovered the force correlation. Mr. Grove, so far back as 1842, gave to each of these forces, such as heat, electricity, magnetism, and light, the character of convertibility, making them capable of being at one moment a cause, and at the next an effect. But whence come these forces, and whither do they go, when we lose sight of them? On this point science is silent. The theory of force correlation, though it may be in the minds of our contemporaries the greatest discovery of the age, can account for neither the beginning nor the end of one of such forces, neither can the theory point out the cause of it. Forces may be convertible, and one may produce the other, still, no exact science is able to explain the alpha and omega of the phenomenon. In what particular are we then in advance of Plato who, discussing in the Timaeus the primary and secondary qualities of matter and the feebleness of human intellect, makes Timaeus say, God knows the original qualities of things, man can only hope to attain to probability. We have but to open one of the several pamphlets of Huxley and Tyndall to find precisely the same confession, but they improve upon Plato by not allowing even God to know more than themselves, and perhaps it may be upon this that they base their claims of superiority. The ancient Hindus founded their doctrine of emanation and absorption on precisely that law. The Tau Omicron Omicron Nu, the primordial point in the boundless circle, whose circumference is nowhere, in the center everywhere, emanating from itself all things, and manifesting them in the visible universe under multifarious forms, the forms interchanging, commingling, and, after a gradual transformation from the pure spirit, for the Buddhistic nothing, into the grossest matter, beginning to recede and as gradually re-emerge into their primitive state, which is the absorption into nirvana what else is this but correlation of forces? p. 243. Science tells us that heat may be shown to develop electricity, electricity produce heat, and magnetism to evolve electricity, and vice versa. Motion, they tell us, results from motion itself, and so on, ad infinitum. This is the ABC of occultism and of the earliest alchemists. The indestructibility of matter and force being discovered and proved, the great problem of eternity is solved. What need have we more of spirit? Its uselessness is henceforth scientifically demonstrated. 
Thus modern philosophers may be said not to have gone one step beyond what the priests of Samothrace, the Hindus, and even the Christian Gnostics well knew. The former have shown in that wonderfully ingenious mythos of the Dioscuri, or the Sons of Heaven, the twin brothers, spoken of by Schwiger, who constantly die and return to life together, while it is absolutely necessary that one should die that the other may live. They knew as well as our physicists, that when a force has disappeared it has simply been converted into another force. Though archaeology may not have discovered any ancient apparatus for such special conversions, it may nevertheless be affirmed with perfect reason and upon analogical deductions that nearly all the ancient religions were based on such indestructibility of matter and force plus the emanation of the whole from an ethereal, spiritual fire or the central sun, which is God or spirit, on the knowledge of whose potentiality is based ancient theurgic magic. In the manuscript commentary of Proclus on Magic he gives the following account. In the same manner as lovers gradually advance from that beauty which is apparent in sensible forms, to that which is divine, so the ancient priests, when they consider that there is a certain alliance and sympathy in natural things to each other, and of things manifest to occult powers, and discover that all things subsist in all, they fabricated a sacred science from this mutual sympathy and similarity. Thus they recognize things supreme and such as are subordinate, and the subordinate and the supreme, and the celestial regions, train properties subsisting in a causal and celestial manner, and an earth celestial properties, but according to a terrene condition. Proclus then proceeds to point to certain mysterious peculiarities of p. 244. Plants, minerals, and animals, all of which are well known to our naturalists, but none of which are explained. Such are the rotatory motion of the sunflower, of the heliotrope, of the lotus which, before the rising of the sun, folds its leaves, drawing the petals within itself, so to say, then expands them gradually, as the sun rises, and draws them in again as it descends to the west of the sun and lunar stones and the heliosalinus, of the cock and lion, and other animals. Now the ancients, he says, having contemplated this mutual sympathy of things, celestial and terrestrial, applied them for occult purposes, both celestial and terrene natures, by means of which, through a certain similitude, they deduce divine virtues into this inferior abode. All things are full of divine natures, terrestrial natures receiving the plenitude of such as are celestial, but celestial of super-celestial essences, while every order of things proceeds gradually in a beautiful descent from the highest to the lowest. For whatever particulars are collected into one above the order of things, are afterwards dilated in descending, various souls being distributed under their various ruling divinities. Evidently Proclus does not advocate here simply a superstition, but science, for notwithstanding that it is a cult, and unknown to our scholars, who deny its possibilities, magic is still a science. It is firmly and solely based on the mysterious affinities existing between organic and inorganic bodies, the visible productions of the four kingdoms, and the invisible powers of the universe. That which science calls gravitation, the ancients and the medieval hermetists called magnetism, attraction, affinity. It is the universal law, which is understood by Plato and explained in Timaeus as the attraction of lesser bodies to larger ones, and of similar bodies to similar, the latter exhibiting a magnetic power rather than following the law of gravitation. The anti-Aristotelian formula that gravity causes all bodies to descend with equal rapidity, without reference to their weight, the difference being caused by some other unknown agency, would seem to point a great deal more forcibly to magnetism than to gravitation, the former attracting rather in virtue of the substance than of the weight. A thorough familiarity with the occult faculties of everything existing in nature, visible as well as invisible, their mutual relations, attractions, and repulsions, the cause of these, traced to the spiritual principle which pervades and animates all things, the ability to furnish the best conditions for this principle to manifest itself. In other words a profound and exhaustive knowledge of natural law this was and is the basis of magic. p. 245. In his notes on ghosts and goblins, when reviewing some facts adduced by certain illustrious defenders of the spiritual phenomena, such as Professor de Morgan, Mr. Robert Dale Owen, and Mr. Wallace, among others Mr. Richard A. Proctor says that he cannot see any force in the following remarks by Professor Wallace. How is such evidence as this? He, Wallace, says, speaking of one of Owen's stories, refuted or explained away. Scores, and even hundreds, of equally attested facts are on record, but no attempt is made to explain them. They are simply ignored, and in many cases admitted to be inexplicable. 
To this Mr. Proctor jocularly replies that as our philosophers declare that they have long ago decided these ghost stories to be all delusions, therefore they need only be ignored, and they feel much worried that fresh evidence should be adduced, and fresh converts made, some of whom are so unreasonable as to ask for a new trial on the ground that the former verdict was contrary to the evidence. All this, he goes on to say, affords excellent reason why the converts should not be ridiculed for their belief but something more to the purpose must be urged before the philosophers can be expected to devote much of their time to the inquiry suggested. It ought to be shown that the well-being of the human race is to some important degree concerned in the matter, whereas the trivial nature of all ghostly conduct hitherto recorded is admitted even by converts. Mrs. Emma Hardinge Britton has collected a great number of authenticated facts from secular and scientific journals, which show with what serious questions our scientists sometimes replace the vexed subject of ghosts and goblins. She quotes from a Washington paper a report of one of these solemn conclaves, held on the evening of April 29, 1854. Professor Hare, of Philadelphia, the venerable chemist, who was so universally respected for his individual character, as well as for his lifelong labors for science, was bullied into silence by Professor Henry, as soon as he had touched the subject of spiritualism. The impertinent action of one of the members of the American Scientific Association, says the authoress, was sanctioned by the majority of that distinguished body and subsequently endorsed by all of them in their proceedings. On the following morning, in the report of the session, the spiritual telegraph thus commented upon the events. It would seem that a subject like this, presented by Professor Hare, was one which would lie peculiarly within the domain of science. But the American Association for the Promotion of Science decided. p. 246 that it was either unworthy of their attention or dangerous for them to meddle with, and so they voted to put the invitation on the table. We cannot omit in this connection to mention that the American Association for the Promotion of Science held a very learned, extended, grave, and profound discussion at the same session, upon the cause why roosters crow between twelve and one o'clock at night. A subject worthy of philosophers, and one, moreover, which must have been shown to affect the well-being of the human race in a very important degree. It is sufficient for one to express belief in the existence of a mysterious sympathy between the life of certain plants and that of human beings, to assure being made the subject of ridicule. Nevertheless, there are many well-authenticated cases going to show the reality of such an affinity. Persons have been known to fall sick simultaneously with the uprooting of a tree planted upon their natal day, and dying when the tree died. Reversing affairs, it has been known that a tree planted under the same circumstances withered and died simultaneously with the person whose twin brother, so to speak, it was. The former would be called by Mr. Proctor an effect of the imagination, the latter a curious coincidence. Max Muller gives a number of such cases in his essay on manners and customs. He shows this popular tradition existing in Central America, in India, and in Germany. He traces it over nearly all Europe finds it among the Maori warriors, in British Guiana, and in Asia. Reviewing Tyler's researches into the early history of mankind, a work in which are brought together quite a number of such traditions, the great philologist very justly remarks the following, if it occurred in Indian and German tales only, we might consider it as ancient Aryan property, but when we find it again in Central America, nothing remains but either to admit a later communication between European settlers and Native American storytellers or to inquire whether there is not some intelligible and truly human element in this supposed sympathy between the life of flowers and the life of man. The present generation of men, who believe in nothing beyond the superficial evidence of their senses, will doubtless reject the very idea of such a sympathetic power existing in plants, animals, and even stones. The call covering their inner sight allows them to see but that which they cannot well deny. The author of the Aesopian Dialogue furnishes us with a reason for it, that might perhaps fit the present period and account for this epidemic of unbelief. In our century, as then, there. p. 247. Is a lamentable departure of divinity from man, when nothing worthy of heaven or celestial concerns is heard or believed, and when every divine voice is by a necessary silence dumb. Or, as the Emperor Julian has it, the little soul of the skeptic is indeed acute, but sees nothing with a vision healthy and sound. We are at the bottom of a cycle and evidently in a transitory state. Plato divides the intellectual progress of the universe during every cycle into fertile and barren periods. In the sublunary regions, the spheres of the various elements remain eternally in perfect harmony with the divine nature, he says, both their parts, 
lying to a too close proximity to earth, and their commingling with the earthly, which is matter, and therefore the realm of evil, are sometimes according, and sometimes contrary to, divine, nature. When those circulations which Eliphas Levi calls currents of the astral light in the universal ether which contains in itself every element, take place in harmony with the divine spirit, our earth and everything pertaining to it enjoys a fertile period. The occult powers of plants, animals, and minerals magically sympathize with the superior natures, and the divine soul of man is in perfect intelligence with these inferior ones. But during the barren periods, the latter lose their magic sympathy, and the spiritual sight of the majority of mankind is so blinded as to lose every notion of the superior powers of its own divine spirit. We are in a barren period, the 18th century, during which the malignant fever of skepticism broke out so irrepressibly, has entailed unbelief as an hereditary disease upon the 19th. The divine intellect is veiled in man, his animal brain alone philosophizes. Formerly, magic was a universal science, entirely in the hands of the sacerdotal savant. Though the focus was jealously guarded in the sanctuaries, its rays illuminated the whole of mankind. Otherwise, how are we to account for the extraordinary identity of superstitions, customs, traditions, and even sentences, repeated in popular proverbs so widely scattered from one pole to the other that we find exactly the same ideas among the Tartars and Laplanders as among the southern nations of Europe, the inhabitants of the steppes of Russia, and the aborigines of North and South America? For instance, Tyler shows one of the ancient Pythagorean maxims, do not stir the fire with a sword, as popular among a number of nations which have not the slightest connection with each other. He quotes the plain of Kirpini, who found this tradition prevailing among the Tartars so far back as in 1246. A Tartar will not consent for any amount of money to stick a knife into the fire, or touch it with any sharp or pointed instrument, for fear of cutting the head of the fire. p. 248. The Comchital of Northeastern Asia consider it a great sin so to do. The Sioux Indians of North America dare not touch the fire with either needle, knife, or any sharp instrument. The Kalmyks entertain the same dread and an Abyssinian would rather bury his bare arms to the elbows in blazing coals than use a knife or axe near them. All these facts Tyler also calls simply curious coincidences. Max Muller, however, thinks that they lose much of their force by the fact of the Pythagorean doctrine being at the bottom of it. Every sentence of Pythagoras, like most of the ancient maxims, has a dual signification, and, while it had an occult physical meaning, expressed literally in its words, it embodied a moral precept, which is explained by Iamblichus in his Life of Pythagoras. This thing not fire with a sword, is the ninth symbol in the protreptics of this Neoplatonist. This symbol, he says, exhorts to prudence. It shows the propriety of not opposing sharp words to a man full of fire and wrath not contending with him. For frequently by uncivil words you will agitate and disturb an ignorant man, and you will suffer yourself. Heraclitus also testifies to the truth of this symbol. For, he says, it is difficult to fight with anger, for whatever is necessary to be done redeems the soul. And this he says truly. For many, by gratifying anger, hath changed the condition of their soul, and have made death preferable to life. But by governing the tongue and being quiet, friendship is produced from strife, the fire of anger being extinguished, and you yourself will not appear to be destitute of intellect. We have had misgivings sometimes, we have questioned the impartiality of our own judgment our ability to offer a respectful criticism upon the labors of such giants as some of our modern philosophers Tyndall, Huxley, Spencer, Carpenter, and a few others. In our immoderate love for the men of old the primitive sages we were always afraid to trespass the boundaries of justice and refuse their dues to those who deserve them. Gradually this natural fear gave way before an unexpected reinforcement. We found out that we were but the feeble echo of public opinion, which, though suppressed, has sometimes found relief in able articles scattered throughout the periodicals of the country. One of such can be found in the National Quarterly Review of December, 1875, entitled Our Sensational Present-Day Philosophers. It is a very able article, discussing fearlessly the claims of several of our scientists to new discoveries in regard to the nature of matter, the human soul, the mind, the universe, how the universe came into existence, etc. The religious world has been much startled, the author proceeds to say, and not a. p. 249. Little excited by the utterances of men like Spencer, Tyndall, Huxley, Proctor, and a few others of the same school. Admitting very cheerfully how much science owes to each of those gentlemen, 
Nevertheless, the author most emphatically denies that they have made any discoveries at all. There is nothing new in the speculations, even of the most advanced of them, nothing which was not known and taught, in one form or another, thousands of years ago. He does not say that these scientists put forward their theories as their own discoveries, but they leave the fact to be implied, and the newspapers do the rest. The public, which has neither time nor the inclination to examine the facts, adopts the faith of the newspapers, and wonders what will come next. The supposed originators of such startling theories are assailed in the newspapers. Sometimes the obnoxious scientists undertake to defend themselves, but we cannot recall a single instance in which they have candidly said, Gentlemen, be not angry with us, we are merely revamping stories which are nearly as old as the mountains. This would have been the simple truth, but even scientists or philosophers, adds the author, are not always proof against the weakness of encouraging any notion which they think may secure niches for them among the immortal ones. Huxley, Tyndall, and even Spencer have become lately the great oracles, the infallible popes on the dogmas of protoplasm, molecules, primordial forms, and atoms. They have reaped more palms and laurels for their great discoveries than Lucretius, Cicero, Plutarch, and Seneca had hairs on their heads. Nevertheless, the works of the latter team with ideas on the protoplasm, primordial forms, etc., let alone the atoms, which caused Democritus to be called the atomic philosopher. In the same review we find this very startling denunciation. Who, among the innocent, has not been astonished, even within the last year, at the wonderful results accomplished by oxygen? What an excitement Tyndall and Huxley have created by proclaiming, in their own ingenious, oracular way, just the very doctrines which we have just quoted from Liebig. Yet, as early as 1840, Professor Leon Playfair translated into English the most advanced of Baron Liebig's works. Another recent utterance, he says, which startled a large number of innocent and pious persons, is, that every thought we express, or attempt to express, produces a certain wonderful change in the substance of the brain. But, for this and a good deal more of its kind, our philosophers had only to turn to the pages of Baron Liebig. Thus, for instance, p. 250. That scientist proclaims, physiology has sufficiently decisive grounds for the opinions, that every thought, every sensation is accompanied by a change in the composition of the substance of the brain, that every motion, every manifestation of force is the result of a transformation of the structure or of its substance. Thus, throughout the sensational lectures of Tyndall, we can trace, almost to a page, the whole of Liebig's speculations, interline now and then with the still earlier views of Democritus and other pagan philosophers. A potpourri of old hypotheses elevated by the great authority of the day into quasi-demonstrated formulas, and delivered in that pathetic, picturesque, mellow, and thrillingly eloquent phraseology so preeminently his own. Further, the same reviewer shows us many of the identical ideas and all the material requisite to demonstrate the great discoveries of Tyndall and Huxley, in the works of Dr. Joseph Priestley, author of Disquisitions on Matter and Spirit, and even in Herder's Philosophy of History. Priestley, adds the author, was not molested by government, simply because he had no ambition to obtain fame by proclaiming his atheistic views from the housetop. This philosopher was the author of from 70 to 80 volumes and the discoverer of oxygen. It is in these works that he puts forward those identical ideas which have been declared so startling, bold, etc., as the utterances of our present-day philosophers. Our readers, he proceeds to say, remember what an excitement has been created by the utterances of some of our modern philosophers as to the origin and nature of ideas, but those utterances, like others that preceded and followed them, contain nothing new. An idea, says Plutarch, is a being incorporeal, which has no subsistence by itself, but gives figure and form unto shapeless matter, and becomes the cause of its manifestation, the placitio philosophorum. Verily, no modern atheist, Mr. Huxley included, can out be Epicurus in materialism, he can but mimic him. And what is his protoplasm, but a reshof of the speculations of the Hindu Swabhavikas or pantheists, who assert that all things, the gods as well as men and animals, are born from Swabhava or their own nature? As to Epicurus, this is what Lucretius makes him say, the soul, thus produced, must be material, because we trace it issuing from a material source, because it exists, and exists alone in a material system, is nourished by material food, grows with the growth of the body, becomes matured with its maturity, declines with its decay, and hence, whether belonging to man. p. 
251. Or brute, must die with its death. Nevertheless, we would remind the reader that Epicurus is here speaking of the astral soul, not of divine spirit. Still, if we rightly understand the above, Mr. Huxley's mutton protoplasm is of a very ancient origin, and can claim for its birthplace, Athens, and for its cradle, the brain of old Epicurus. Further, still, anxious not to be misunderstood or found guilty of depreciating the labor of any of our scientists, the author closes his essay by remarking, we merely want to show that, at least, that portion of the public which considers itself intelligent and enlightened should cultivate its memory, or remember the advanced thinkers of the past much better than it does. Especially should those do so who, whether from the desk, the rostrum, or the pulpit, undertake to instruct all willing to be instructed by them. There would then be much less groundless apprehension, much less charlatanism, and above all, much less plagiarism, than there is. Truly says Cudworth that the greatest ignorance of which our modern wiseacres accuse the ancients is their belief in the soul's immortality. Like the old skeptic of Greece, our scientists who use an expression of the same Dr. Cudworth are afraid that if they admit spirits and apparitions they must admit a god too, and there is nothing too absurd, he adds, for them to suppose, in order to keep out the existence of God. The great body of ancient materialists, skeptical as they now seem to us, thought otherwise, and Epicurus, who rejected the soul's immortality, believed still in a god, and Democritus fully conceded the reality of apparitions. The pre-existence and godlike powers of the human spirit were believed in by most all the sages of ancient days. The magic of Babylon and Persia based upon it the doctrine of their Mechagistia. The Chaldean oracles, on which Pletho and Celis have so much commented, constantly expounded and amplified their testimony. Zoroaster, Pythagoras, Epicharmus, and Pedocles, Cobbs, Euripides, Plato, Euclid, Philo, Bias, Virgil, Marcus Cicero, Plotinus, Iamblichus, Proclus, Celis, Synesius, Origen, and, finally, Aristotle himself, far from denying our immortality, support it most emphatically. Like Cardin and Pomponatius, who were no friends to the soul's immortality, as says Henry Moore, Aristotle expressly concludes that the rational soul is both a distinct being from the soul of the world, though of the same essence, and that it does pre-exist before it comes into the body. Years have rolled away since the Count Joseph de Mestre wrote a sentence which, if appropriate to the Voltairean epoch in which he lived, p. 252, applies with still more justice to our period of utter skepticism. I have heard, writes this eminent man, I have heard and read of myriads of good jokes on the ignorance of the ancients, who were always seeing spirits everywhere, methinks that we are a great deal more imbecile than our forefathers, and never perceiving any such now, anywhere. Chapter 8. Think not my magic wonders wrought by aid. Of Stygian angels summoned up from hell. Scorn and accursed by those who have essayed. Her gloomy dis and affrights to compel. But by perception of the secret powers. Of mineral springs, in nature's inmost cell. Of herbs and curtain of her greenest bowers. And of the moving stars or mountain tops and towers. Tasso, Canto 14, 43. Who dares think one thing and another tell? My heart detests him as the gates of hell. Pope. If man ceases to exist when he disappears in the grave, he must be compelled to affirm that he is the only creature in existence whom nature or providence has condescended to deceive and cheat by capacities for which there are no available objects. Wool or Leiden, Strange Story. The preface of Richard A. Proctor's latest work on astronomy, entitled Our Place Among Infinities, contains the following extraordinary words, it was their ignorance of the earth's place among infinities, which led the ancients to regard the heavenly bodies as ruling favorably or adversely the fates of men and nations, and to dedicate the days and sets of seven to the seven planets of their astrological system. Mr. Proctor makes two distinct assertions in this sentence, one, that the ancients were ignorant of the earth's place among infinities, and two, that they regarded the heavenly bodies as ruling, favorably or adversely, the fates of men and nations. We are very confident that there is at least good reason to suspect that the ancients were familiar with the movements, and placement, and mutual relations of the heavenly bodies. The testimony of Plutarch, Professor Draper, and Joet, are sufficiently explicit. But we would ask Mr. Proctor how it happens, if the ancient astronomers were so ignorant of the law of the birth and death of worlds that, 
In the fragmentary bits which the hand of time has spared us of ancient lore there should be albeit couched in obscure language so much information which the most recent discoveries of science have verified, beginning with the tenth page of the work under notice, Mr. Proctor. P. 254. Sketches for us the theory of the formation of our earth, and the successive changes through which it passed until it became habitable for man. In vivid colors he depicts the gradual accretion of cosmic matter into gaseous spheres surrounded with a liquid non-permanent shell, the condensation of both, the ultimate solidification of the external crust, the slow cooling of the mass, the chemical results following the action of intense heat upon the primitive earthy matter, the formation of soils and their distribution, the change in the constitution of the atmosphere, the appearance of vegetation and animal life, and, finally, the advent of man. Now, let us turn to the oldest written records left us by the Chaldeans, the Hermetic Book of Numbers, and see what we shall find in the allegorical language of Hermes, Cadmus, or Thuti, the thrice great Trismegistus. In the beginning of time the great invisible one had his holy hands full of celestial matter which he scattered throughout the infinity, and lo, behold, it became balls of fire and balls of clay, and they scattered like the moving metal into many smaller balls, and began their ceaseless turning and some of them which were balls of fire became balls of clay, and the balls of clay became balls of fire, and the balls of fire were waiting their time to become balls of clay, and the others envied them and bided their time to become balls of pure divine fire. Could anyone ask a clearer definition of the cosmic changes which Mr. Proctor so elegantly expounds? Here we have the distribution of matter throughout space, then its concentration into the spherical form, the separation of smaller spheres from the greater ones, axial rotation, the gradual change of orbs from the incandescent to the earthy consistence, and, finally, the total loss of heat which marks their entrance into the stage of planetary death. The change of the balls of clay into balls of fire would be understood by materialists to indicate some such phenomenon as the sudden ignition of the star in Cassiopeia, A.D. 1572, and the one in Serpentarius, in 1604, which was noted by Kepler. But, do the Chaldeans events in this expression a profounder philosophy than of our day? Does this change into balls of pure divine fire signify a continuous planetary existence? p. 255. Correspondent with the spirit life of man, beyond the awful mystery of death? If worlds have, as the astronomers tell us, their periods of embryo, infancy, adolescence, maturity, decadence, and death, may they not, like man, have their continued existence in a sublimated, ethereal, or spiritual form? The magians so affirm. They tell us that the fecund mother earth is subject to the same laws as every one of her children. At her appointed time she brings forth all created things, in the fullness of her days she is gathered to the tomb of worlds. Her gross, material body slowly parts with its atoms under the inexorable law which demands their new arrangement and other combinations. Her own perfected vivifying spirit obeys the eternal attraction which draws it toward that central spiritual sun from which it was originally evolved, and which we vaguely know under the name of God. And the heaven was visible in seven circles, and the planets appeared with all their signs, in star form, and the stars were divided and numbered with the rulers that were in them, and their revolving course was bounded with the air, and borne with a circular course, through the agency of the divine spirit. We challenge any one to indicate a single passage in the works of Hermes which proves him guilty of that crowning absurdity of the Church of Rome which assumed, upon the geocentric theory of astronomy, that the heavenly bodies were made for our use and pleasure, and that it was worthwhile for the only Son of God to descend upon this cosmic moat and die in expiation for our sins. Mr. Proctor tells us of a liquid non-permanent shell of uncongealed matter enclosing a viscous plastic ocean, within which there is another interior solid globe rotating. We on our part, turn to the Mahia Atomica of Eugenius Philolethes, published in 1650, and at page 12, we find him quoting from Trismegistus in the following terms, Hermes affirmeth that in the beginning the earth was a quagmire or quivering kind of jelly, it being nothing else but water congealed by the incubation and heat of the divine spirit, come ad uc, saith he, terra tremula esit, lucenti sol compacta est. In the same work Philolethes, speaking in his quaint, symbolical way, says, the earth is invisible, on my soul it is so, and which is more, the eye of man never saw the earth, nor can it be seen without art. To make this element invisible, is the greatest secret in magic, as for this fecalent, gross body upon which we walk, it is a compost, and no earth but it hath earth in it, in a word all the elements are visible but one, namely the earth, 
and when thou hast attained to so much perfection. P. 256. As to know why God hath placed the earth in abscondido, thou hast an excellent figure whereby to know God himself, and how he is visible, how invisible. Ages before savants of the nineteenth century came into existence, a wise man of the Orient thus expressed himself, in addressing the invisible deity, for thy almighty hand, that made the world a formless matter. There is much more contained in this language than we are willing to explain, but we will say that the secret is worth the seeking, perhaps in this formless matter, the pre-Adamite earth, is contained a potency with which Messrs. Tyndall and Huxley would be glad to acquaint themselves. p. 257. But to descend from universals to particulars, from the ancient theory of planetary evolution to the evolution of plant and animal life, as opposed to the theory of special creation, what does Mr. Proctor call the following language of Hermes but an anticipation of the modern theory of evolution of species? When God had filled his powerful hands with those things which are in nature, and in that which compasses nature, then shutting them close again, he said, Receive from me, O holy earth, that art ordained to be the mother of all lest thou shouldst want anything, when presently opening such hands as it becomes a god to have, he poured down all that was necessary to the constitution of things. Here we have primeval matter imbued with the promise and potency of every future form of life, and the earth declared to be the predestined mother of everything that should thenceforth spring from her bosom. More definite is the language of Marcus Antoninus in his discourse to himself. The nature of the universe delights not in anything so much as to alter all things, and present them under another form. This is her conceit to play one game and begin another. Matter is placed before her like a piece of wax and she shapes it to all forms and figures. Now she makes a bird, then out of the bird a beast now a flower, then a frog, and she is pleased with her own magical performances as men are with their own fancies. Before any of our modern teachers thought of evolution, the ancients taught us, through Hermes, that nothing can be abrupt in nature, that she never proceeds by jumps and starts that everything in our works is slow harmony, and that there is nothing sudden not even violent death. The slow development from pre-existing forms was a doctrine with the Rosicrucian Illuminati. The tracemeters showed Hermes the mysterious progress of their work, before they condescended to reveal themselves to medieval alchemists. Now, in the Hermetic dialect, these three mothers are the symbol of light, heat, and electricity, or magnetism, the two latter being as convertible as the whole of the forces or agents which have a place assigned them in the modern force correlation. Synesius mentions books of stone which he found in the Temple of Memphis, on which was engraved the following sentence, One nature delights in another, one nature overcomes another, one nature overrules another, and the whole of them are one. The inherent restlessness of matter is embodied in the saying of Hermes, Action is the life of the and Orpheus calls nature pi omicron lambda upsilon mu epsilon chi alpha nu omicron sigma mu epsilon tau epsilon rho, the mother that makes many things, or the ingenious, the contriving, the inventive mother. p. 258. Mr. Proctor says, all that that is upon and within the earth, all vegetable forms and all animal forms, our bodies, our brains, are formed of materials which have been drawn in from those depths of space surrounding us on all sides. The Hermetists and the later Rosicrucians held that all things visible and invisible were produced by the contention of light with darkness, and that every particle of matter contains within itself a spark of the divine essence or light, spirit which, through its tendency to free itself from its entanglement and return to the central source, produced motion in the particles, and from motion forms were born. Says Hargrave Jennings, quoting Robertus de Fluctibus, thus all minerals in the spark of life have the rudimentary possibility of plants and growing organisms. Thus all plants have rudimentary sensations which might, in the ages, enable them to perfect and transmute into locomotive new creatures, lesser or higher in their grade, or nobler or meaner in their functions, thus all plants, and all vegetation might pass off, by side roads, into more distinguished highways as it were, of independent, completer advance, allowing their original spark of light to expand and thrill with higher and more vivid force, and to urge forward with more abounding, and form purpose, all wrought by planetary influence directed by the unseen spirits, or workers, of the great original architect. Like the first mentioned in Genesis, is termed by the Kabbalists, Sephira, or the divine intelligence, the mother of all the Sephiroth, while the concealed wisdom is the father. Light is the first begotten, and the first emanation of the supreme, and light is life, says the evangelist. Both are electricity the life principle, 
the anima mundi, pervading the universe, the electric vivifier of all things. Light is the great protean magician, and under the divine will of the architect, its multifarious, omnipotent waves gave birth to every form as well as to every living being. From its swelling, electric bosom, springs matter and spirit. Within its beams are the beginnings of all physical and chemical action, and of all cosmic and spiritual phenomena, it vitalizes and disorganizes, it gives life and produces death, and from its primordial point gradually emerged into existence the myriads of worlds, visible and invisible celestial bodies. It was at the ray of this first mother, one and three, that God, according to Plato, lighted a fire, which we now call the sun, and, which is not the cause of either light or heat, but merely the focus, or, as we might say, the lens, by which the rays of the primordial light become materialized, or concentrated upon our solar system, and produce all the correlations of forces. p. 259. So much for the first of Mr. Proctor's two propositions, now for the second. The work which we have been noticing, comprises a series of twelve essays, of which the last is entitled Thoughts on Astrology. The author treats the subject with so much more consideration than is the custom of men of his class, that it is evident he has given it thoughtful attention. In fact, he goes so far as to say that, if we consider the matter right, we must concede, that of all the errors into which men have fallen and their desire to penetrate into futurity, astrology is the most respectable, we may even say the most reasonable. He admits that the heavenly bodies do rule the fates of men and nations in the most unmistakable manner, seeing that without the controlling and beneficent influences of the chief among those orbs the sun every living creature on the earth must perish. He admits, also, the influence of the moon, and sees nothing strange in the ancients reasoning by analogy, that if two among these heavenly bodies were thus potent in terrestrial influences, it was, natural that the other moving bodies known to the ancients, should be thought to possess also their special powers. Indeed, the professor sees nothing unreasonable in their supposition that the influences exerted by the slower moving planets might be even more potent than those of the sun himself. Mr. Proctor thinks that the system of astrology was formed gradually and perhaps tentatively. Some influences may have been inferred from observed events, the fate of this or that king or chief, guiding astrologers in assigning particular influences to such planetary aspects as were presented at the time of his nativity. Others may have been invented, and afterward have found general acceptance, because confirmed by some curious coincidences. A witty joke may sound very prettily, even in a learned treatise, and the word coincidence may be applied to anything we are unwilling to accept. But a sophism is not a truism, still less is it a mathematical demonstration, which alone ought to serve as a beacon to astronomers, at least. Astrology is a science as infallible as astronomy itself, with the condition, however, that its interpreters must be equally infallible, and it is this condition, sine qua non, so very difficult of realization, that has always proved a stumbling block to both. Astrology is to exact astronomy what psychology is to exact physiology. In astrology and psychology one has to step beyond the visible world of matter, and enter into the domain of transcendent spirit. It is the old struggle between the Platonic and Aristotelian schools, and it is not in our century of Sadducean. p. 260. Skepticism that the former will prevail over the latter. Mr. Proctor, in his professional capacity, is like the uncharitable person of the Sermon on the Mount, who is ever ready to attract public attention to the moat in his despised neighbor's eye, and overlook the beam in his own. Were we to record the failures and ridiculous blunders of astronomers, we are afraid they would outnumber by far those of the astrologers. Present events fully vindicate Nostradamus, who has been so much ridiculed by our skeptics. In an old book of prophecies, published in the 15th century, an edition of 1453, we read the following among other astrological predictions. In twice two hundred years, the bear. The crescent will assail. But if the cock and bull unite, the bear will not prevail. In twice ten years again, let Islam know and fear. The cross shall stand, the crescent wane. Dissolve and disappear. In just twice two hundred years from the date of that prophecy, we had the Crimean War during which the alliance of the Gallic cock and English bull interfered with the political designs of the Russian bear. In 1856 the war was ended, in Turkey, where the Crescent, closely escaped destruction. In the present year, 1876, the most unexpected events of a political character have just taken place, 
and twice ten years have elapsed since peace was proclaimed. Everything seems to bid fair for a fulfillment of the old prophecy, the future will tell whether the Muslim crescent, which seems, indeed, to be waning, will irrevocably wane, dissolve, and disappear, as the outcome of the present troubles. In explaining away the heterodox facts which he appears to have encountered in his pursuit of knowledge, Mr. Proctor is obliged more than once in his work, to fall back upon these curious coincidences. One of the most curious of these is stated by him in a footnote, page 301, as follows, I do not here dwell on the curious coincidence if, indeed, Chaldean astrologers had not discovered the ring of Saturn that they showed the god corresponding within a ring in triple. Very moderate optical knowledge such, indeed, as we may fairly infer from the p. 261. Presence of optical instruments among Assyrian remains might have led to the discovery of Saturnal rings and Jupiter's moons. Bell, the Assyrian Jupiter, he adds, was represented sometimes with four star-tipped wings. But it is possible that these are mere coincidences. In short, Mr. Proctor's theory of coincidence becomes finally more suggestive of miracle than the facts themselves. For coincidences are friends the skeptics appear to have an unappeasable appetite. We have brought sufficient testimony in the preceding chapter to show that the ancients must have used as good optical instruments as we have now. Were the instruments in possession of Nebuchadnezzar of such moderate power? and the knowledge of his astronomer so very contemptible, when, according to Rawlinson's reading of the tiles, the Burz Marud, or Temple of Borsippa, had seven stages, symbolical of the concentric circles of the seven spheres, each built of tiles and metals to correspond with the color of the ruling planet of the sphere typified? Is it a coincidence again, that they should have appropriated to each planet the color which our latest telescopic discovery showed to be the real one? Or is it again a coincidence? that Plato should have indicated in the Timaeus's knowledge of the indestructibility of matter, of conservation of energy, and correlation of forces? The latest word of modern philosophy, says Joet, is continuity and development, but to Plato this is the beginning and foundation of science. The radical element of the oldest religions was essentially sabaistic, and we maintain that their myths and allegories if once correctly and thoroughly interpreted, will dovetail with the most exact astronomical notions of our day. We will say more. There is hardly a scientific law whether pertaining to physical astronomy or physical geography that could not be easily pointed out in the ingenious combinations of their fables. They allegorize the most important as well as the most trifling causes of the celestial motions, the nature of every phenomenon was personified, and in the mythical biographies of the Olympic gods and goddesses, one well acquainted with the latest principles of physics and chemistry can find their causes, and her agencies, and mutual relations embodied in the deportment and course of action of the fickle deities. The atmospheric electricity in its neutral and latent states is embodied usually in demigods and goddesses, whose scene of action is more limited to earth and who, in their occasional flights to the higher deific regions, display their electric tempers always in strict proportion with the increase of distance from the earth's surface. The weapons of Hercules and Thor were. p. 262 never more mortal than when the gods soared into the clouds. We must bear in mind that before the time when the Olympian Jupiter was anthropomorphized by the genius of Phidias into the omnipotent god, the Maximus, the god of gods, and thus abandoned to the adoration of the multitudes, in the earliest and abstruse science of symbology he embodied in his person and attributes the whole of the cosmic forces. The myth was less metaphysical and complicated, but more truly eloquent as an expression of natural philosophy. Zeus, the male element of the creation with Thani Avesta, the earth, and Mades, the water, the first of the Oceanides, the feminine principles, was viewed according to Porphyry and Proclus as the zone exon, the chief of living beings. In the Orphic theology, the oldest of all, metaphysically speaking, he represented both the potentia and actis, the unrevealed cause in the demiurge, or the active creator as an emanation from the invisible potency. In the latter demiurgic capacity, in conjunction with his consorts, we find in him all the mightiest agents of cosmic evolution chemical affinity, atmospheric electricity, attraction, and repulsion. It is in following his representations in this physical qualification that we discover how well acquainted were the ancients with all the doctrines of physical science in their modern development. Later, in the Pythagorean speculations, Zeus became the metaphysical trinity, the monad evolving from its invisible self the active cause, effect, an intelligent will, the whole forming the tetractus. Still later we find the earlier Neoplatonists leaving the primal monad aside, 
on the ground of its utter incomprehensibleness to human intellect, speculating merely on the demiurgic triad of this deity as visible and intelligible in its effects, and thus the metaphysical continuation by Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus, and other philosophers of this view of Zeus the Father, Zeus Poseidon, or Dunamis, the Sun and Power, and the Spirit or Nu. This triad was also accepted as a whole by the Ironic school of the second century, the more substantial difference between the doctrines of the Neoplatonists and the Christians being merely the forcible amalgamation by the latter of the incomprehensible monad with its actualized creative trinity. In his astronomical aspect Zeus Dionysus has his origin in the zodiac, the ancient solar year. In Libya he assumed the form of a ram, and is identical with the Egyptian Amun, who begat Osiris, the Taurian god. Osiris is also a personified emanation of the father sun, and himself the sun in Taurus. The parent sun being the sun in Aries. As the latter, Jupiter, is in the guise of a ram, and as Jupiter Dionysus or Jupiter Osiris, he is the bull. This animal is, as it is well known, the symbol of the creative power, moreover the Kabbalah explains, through the medium of one of. p. 263. Its chief expounders, Simon ben Iochai the origin of this strange worship of the bulls and cows. It is neither Darwin nor Huxley the founders of the doctrine of evolution and its necessary complement, the transformation of species that can find anything against the rationality of this symbol, except, perhaps, a natural feeling of uneasiness upon finding that they were preceded by the ancients even in this particular modern discovery. Elsewhere, we will give the doctrine of the Kabbalists as taught by Simon ben Iochai. It may be easily proved that from time immemorial Saturn or Kronos, whose ring, most positively, was discovered by the Chaldean astrologers, and whose symbolism is no coincidence, was considered the father of Zeus, before the latter became himself the father of all the gods, and was the highest deity. He was the bell or bale of the Chaldeans, and originally imported among them by the Akkadians. Rawlinson insists that the latter came from Armenia, but if so, how can we account for the fact that Bel is but a Babylonian personification of the Hindu Shiva, or Bala, the fire god, the omnipotent creative, and at the same time, destroying deity, in many senses higher than Brahma himself? Zeus, says an Orphicim, is the first and the last, the head, and the extremities, from him have proceeded all things. He is a man and an immortal nymph, male and female element, the soul of all things, and the principal motor and fire, he is the sun and the moon the fountain of the ocean, the demiurgus of the universe, one power, one god, the mighty creator and governor of the cosmos. Everything, fire, water, earth, ether, night, the heavens, Mades, the primeval architecturist, the Sophia of the Gnostics, and the Sephira of the Kabbalists, the beautiful Eros, Cupid, all is included within the vast dimensions of his glorious body. This short hymn of laudation contains within itself the groundwork of every mythopoeic conception. The imagination of the ancients proved as boundless as the visible manifestations of the deity itself which afforded them the themes for their allegories. Still the latter, exuberant as they seem, never departed from the two principal ideas which may be ever found running parallel in their sacred imagery, a strict adherence to the physical as well as moral or spiritual aspect of natural law. Their metaphysical researches never clash with scientific truths, and their religions may be truly termed the psychophysiological creeds of the priests and scientists who built them on the traditions of the infant world, such as the unsophisticated minds of the primitive races receive them, and on their own experimental knowledge, hoary with all the wisdom of the intervening ages. p. 264. As the sun, what better image could be found for Jupiter emitting his golden rays and to personify this emanation in Diana, the all-illuminating virgin Artemis, whose oldest name was Zetina, literally the emitted ray, from the word Dikene. The moon is non-luminous, and it shines only by the reflected light of the sun, hence, the imagery of his daughter, the goddess of the moon, and herself, Luna, Astarte, or Diana. As the Cretan de Tina, she wears a wreath made of the magic plant Dictalmon, or Dictamus, the evergreen shrub whose contact is said, at the same time, to develop somnambulism and cure finally of it, and, as Althaea and Juno Pranuba, she is the goddess who presides over births, she is an Asculapian deity, and the use of the dictum this wreath, in association with the moon, shows once more the profound observation of the ancients. This plant is known in botany as possessing strongly sedative properties, it grows on Mount Dicta, a Cretan mountain, in great abundance. On the other hand, the moon, according to the best authorities on animal magnetism, 
acts upon the juices and ganglionic system, or nerve cells, the seed from whence proceed all the nerve fibers which play such a prominent part in mesmerization. During childbirth the Cretan women were covered with this plant, and its roots were administered as best calculated to soothe acute pain, and allay the irritability so dangerous at this period. They were placed, moreover, within the precincts of the temple sacred to the goddess, and, if possible, under the direct rays of the resplendent daughter of Jupiter the bright and warm eastern moon. The Hindu Brahmins and Buddhists have complicated theories on the influence of the sun and moon, the male and female elements, as containing the negative and positive principles, the opposites of the magnetic polarity. The influence of the moon on women is well known, read all the old authors on magnetism, and Anna Moser, as well as Du Petit, confirm the theories of the Hindu seers in every particular. The marked respect paid by the Buddhists to the sapphire stone which was also sacred to Luna, in every other country may be found based on something more scientifically exact than a mere groundless superstition. They ascribe to it a sacred magical power, which every student of psychological mesmerism will readily understand, for its polished and deep blue surface produces extraordinary somnambulic phenomena. The varied influence of the prismatic colors on the growth of vegetation, and especially that of the blue ray, has been recognized but recently. The academicians quarreled over the unequal heating power of the prismatic rays until a series of experimental demonstrations by General Pleasanton proved that under the blue ray, the most electric of all, animal and vegetable growth was increased to a magical. p. 265. Proportion. Thus Amoretti's investigations of the electric polarity of precious stones show that the diamond, the garnet, the amethyst, are, e, while the sapphire is plus e. Thus, we are enabled to show that the latest experiments of science only corroborate that which was known to the Hindu sages before any of the modern academies were founded. An old Hindu legend says that Brahma Prajapati, having fallen in love with his own daughter, Usha's, heaven, sometimes the dawn also, assumed the form of a buck, Rasiya, and Usha's that of a female deer, Rohit, and thus committed the first sin. Upon seeing such a desecration, the gods felt so terrified, that uniting their most fearful-looking bodies each god possessing as many bodies as he desires they produce Butavan, the spirit of evil, who was created by them on purpose to destroy the incarnation of the first sin committed by the Brahma himself. Upon seeing this, Brahma Haranyagarbha repented bitterly and began repeating the mantras, or prayers of purification, and, in his grief, dropped on earth a tear, the hottest that ever fell from an eye, and from it was formed the first sapphire. This half-sacred, Half popular legend shows that the Hindus knew which was the most electric of all the prismatic colors. Moreover, the particular influence of the sapphire stone was as well defined as that of all the other minerals. Orpheus teaches how it is possible to affect the whole audience by means of a lodestone. Pythagoras pays a particular attention to the color and nature of precious stones, while Apollonius of Tiana imparts to his disciples the secret virtues of each, and changes his jeweled rings daily using a particular stone for every day of the month and according to the laws of judicial astrology. The Buddhists assert that the sapphire produces peace of mind, equanimity, and chases all evil thoughts by establishing a healthy circulation in man. So does an electric battery, with its well-directed fluid, say our electricians. The sapphire, say the Buddhists, will open barred doors and dwellings, for the spirit of man, it produces a desire for prayer, and brings with it more peace than any other gem but he who would wear it must lead a pure and holy life. Diana Luna is the daughter of Zeus by Proserpina, who represents the earth and her active labor, and, according to Hesiod, as Diana Aelithia Lucina. p. 266. She is Juno's daughter. But Juno, devoured by Kronos or Saturn, and restored back to life by the Oceanid Mades, is also known as the earth. Saturn, as the evolution of time swallows the earth in one of the anti-historical cataclysms, and it is only when Mades, the waters, by retreating in her many beds, frees the continent, that Juno is said to be restored to her first shape. The idea is expressed in the ninth and tenth verses of the first chapter of Genesis. In the frequent matrimonial quarrels between Juno and Jupiter, Diana is always represented as turning her back on her mother and smiling upon her father, though she chides him for his numerous frolics. The Thessalian magicians are said to have been obliged, during such eclipses, to draw her attention to the earth by the power of their spells and incantations, and the Babylonian astrologers and magi never desisted in their spells until they brought about a reconciliation between the irritated couple, 
after which Juno radiantly smiled on the bright goddess Diana, who, encircling her brow with her crescent, returned to her hunting place in the mountains. It seems to us that the fable illustrates the different phases of the moon. We, the inhabitants of the earth, never see but one half of our bright satellite, who thus turns her back to her mother Juno. The sun, the moon, and the earth are constantly changing positions with relation to each other. With the new moon there is constantly a change of weather, and sometimes the wind and storms may well suggest a quarrel between the sun and earth, especially when the former is concealed by grumbling thunderclouds. Furthermore, the new moon, when her dark side is turned toward us, is invisible, and it is only after a reconciliation between the sun and the earth, that a bright crescent becomes visible on the side nearest to the sun, though this time Luna is not illuminated by sunlight directly received, but by sunlight reflected from the earth to the moon, and by her reflected back to us. Hence, the Chaldean astrologers and the magicians of Thessaly, who probably watched and determined as accurately as a bobbine the course of the celestial bodies, were said by their enchantments to force the moon to descend on earth, i.e., to show her crescent, which she could do but after receiving the radiant smile from her mother earth, who put it on after the conjugal reconciliation. Diana Luna, having adorned her head with her crescent, returns back to hunt in her mountains. As to calling in question the intrinsic knowledge of the ancients on the ground of their superstitious deductions from natural phenomena, it is as appropriate as it would be if, five hundred years hence, our descendants should regard the pupils of Professor Balfour Stewart as ancient ignoramuses, and himself a shallow philosopher. If modern science, and the person of this gentleman, can condescend to make experi. p. 267. Men's to determine whether the appearance of the spots on the sun's surface is in any way connected with the potato disease, and finds it is, and that, moreover, the earth is very seriously affected by what takes place in the sun, why should the ancient astrologers be held up as either fools or errant knaves? There is the same relation between natural and judicial or judiciary astrology, as between physiology and psychology, the physical and the moral. If in later centuries these sciences were degraded into charlatanry by some money-making impostors, is it just to extend the accusation to those mighty men of old who, by their persevering studies and holy lives, bestowed an immortal name upon Chaldea and Babylonia? Surely those who are now found to have made correct astronomical observations ranging back to within one hundred years from the flood, from the top observatory of the cloud and compass bell, as Professor Draper has it, can hardly be considered impostors. If their mode of impressing upon the popular minds the great astronomical truths differed from the system of education of our present century and appears ridiculous to some, the question still remains unanswered, which of the two systems was the best? With them science went hand in hand with religion, and the idea of God was inseparable from that of his works. And while in the present century there is not one person out of ten thousand who knows, if he ever knew the fact at all, that the planet Uranus is next to Saturn, and revolves about the sun in eighty-four years, and that Saturn is next to Jupiter, and takes twenty-nine and a half years to make one complete revolution in its orbit, while Jupiter performs his revolution in twelve years, the uneducated masses of Babylon and Greece, having impressed on their minds that Uranus was the father of Saturn, and Saturn that of Jupiter, considering them furthermore deities as well as all their satellites and attendants, we may perhaps infer from it, that while Europeans only discovered Uranus in 1781, a curious coincidence is to be noticed in the above myths. We have but to open the most common book on astrology, and compare the descriptions embraced in the fable of the twelve houses with the most modern discoveries of science as to the nature of the planets and the elements in each star, to see that without any spectroscope the ancients were perfectly well acquainted with the same. Unless the fact is again regarded as a coincidence, we can learn, to a certain extent, of the degree of the solar heat, light, and nature of the planets by simply studying their symbolic representations in the Olympic gods, and the twelve signs of the zodiac to each of which in astrology is attributed a particular quality. If the goddesses of our own planet vary in no particular. p. 268. From other gods and goddesses, but all have a like physical nature, does not this imply that the sentinels who watch from the top of Bell's Tower, by day as well as by night, holding communion with the humorized deities, had remarked, before ourselves, the physical unity of the universe and the fact that the planets above are made of precisely the same chemical elements as our own? The sun in Aries, Jupiter, is shown in astrology as a masculine, diurnal, cardinal, equinoctial, easterly sign, hot and dry, and answers perfectly to the character attributed to the fickle father of the gods. 
When angry Zeus Acrio snatches from his fiery belt the thunderbolts which he hurls forth from heaven, he rends the clouds and descends as Jupiter Pluvius in torrents of rain. He is the greatest and highest of gods, and his movements are as rapid as lightning itself. The planet Jupiter is known to revolve on its axis so rapidly that the point of its equator turns at the rate of 450 miles a minute. An immense excess of centrifugal force at the equator is believed to have caused the planet to become extremely flattened at the poles, and in Crete the personified god Jupiter was represented without ears. The planet Jupiter's disk is crossed by dark belts, varying in breadth, they appear to be connected with its rotation on its axis, and are produced by disturbances in its atmosphere. The face of Father Zeus, says Hesiod, became spotted with rage when he beheld the Titans ready to rebel. In Mr. Proctor's book, astronomers seem especially doomed by providence to encounter all kinds of curious coincidences, for he gives us many cases out of the multitude, and even of the thousands of facts, sick. To this list we may add the army of Egyptologists and archaeologists who of late have been the chosen pets of the capricious Dame Chance, who, moreover, generally selects well-to-do Arabs and other Eastern gentlemen, to play the part of benevolent genii to Oriental scholars in difficulties. Professor Ebers is one of the latest favored ones. It is a well-known fact, that whenever Champollion needed important links, he fell in with them in the most various and unexpected ways. Voltaire, the greatest of infidels of the 18th century, used to say, that if there were no God, people would have to invent one. Volney, another materialist, Noah throughout his numerous writings denies the existence of God. On the contrary, he plainly asserts several times that the universe is the work of the all-wise, and is convinced that there is a supreme agent, a universal and identical artificer, designated by the name of God. Voltaire becomes, toward the end of his life, Pythagoritzel, and concludes by saying, I have consumed forty. p. 269. Years of my pilgrimage, seeking the philosopher's stone called truth. I have consulted all the adepts of antiquity, Epicurus and Augustine, Plato and Malbranche, and I still remain in ignorance. All that I have been able to obtain by comparing and combining the system of Plato, of the tutor of Alexander, Pythagoras, and the Oriental, is this, chance is a word void of sense. The world is arranged according to mathematical laws. It is pertinent for us to suggest that Mr. Proctor's stumbling block is that which trips the feet of all materialistic scientists, whose views he but repeats, he confounds the physical and spiritual operations of nature. His very theory of the probable inductive reasoning of the ancients as to the subtle influences of the more remote planets, by comparison with the familiar and potent effects of the sun and moon upon our earth, shows the drift of his mind. Because science affirms that the sun imparts physical heat and light to us, and the moon affects the tides, he thinks that the ancients must have regarded the other heavenly bodies as exerting the same kind of influence upon us physically, and indirectly upon our fortunes. And here we must permit ourselves a digression. How the ancients regarded the heavenly bodies is very hard to determine, for one unacquainted with the esoteric explanation of their doctrines. While philology and comparative theology have begun the arduous work of analysis, they have as yet arrived at meager results. The allegorical form of speech has often led our commentators so far astray, that they have confounded causes with effects, and vice versa. In the baffling phenomenon of force correlation, even our greatest scientists would find it very hard to explain which of these forces is the cause, and which the effect, since each may be both by turns, and convertible. Thus, if we should inquire of the physicist, is it light which generates heat, or the latter which produces light? we would in all probability be answered that it is certainly light which creates heat. Very well, but how? Did the great artificer first produce light, or did he first construct the sun, which is said to be the sole dispenser of light, and, consequently, heat? These questions may appear at first glance indicative of ignorance, but, perhaps, if we ponder them deeply, they will assume another appearance. In Genesis, the Lord first creates light and three days and three nights are alleged to pass away before he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. This gross blunder against exact science has created much merriment among materialists, and they certainly would be warranted in laughing, if their doctrine that are light and heat are. p. 270. Derived from the sun were unassailable. Until recently, nothing has happened to upset this theory, which, for lack of a better one, according to the expression of a preacher, reigns sovereign in the empire of hypothesis. The ancient sun-worshippers regarded the great spirit as a nature god, 
identical with nature, and the Son is the deity, in whom the Lord of life dwells. Gama is the Son, according to the Hindu theology, and the Son is the source of the souls and of all life. Agni, the divine fire, the deity of the Hindu, is the Son, for the fire and sun are the same. Ormaz is light, the sun god, or the life giver. In the Hindu philosophy, the souls issue from the soul of the world, and return to it as sparks to the fire. But, in another place, it is said that the sun is the soul of all things, all has proceeded out of it, and will return to it, which shows that the sun is meant allegorically here, and refers to the central, invisible sun, God, whose first manifestation was Sephira, the emanation of Ensof light, in short. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, says Ezekiel, I, 4, 22, etc., and the likeness of a throne, and as the appearance of a man above upon it, and I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about it. And Daniel speaks of the Ancient of Days, the Kabbalistic Ansof, whose throne was the fiery flame, his wheels burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Like the pagan Saturn, who had his castle of flame in the seventh heaven, the Jewish Jehovah had his castle of fire over the seventh heavens. If the limited space of the present work would permit we might easily show that none of the ancients, the sun worshippers included, regarded our visible sun otherwise than as an emblem of their metaphysical and visible central sun god. Moreover, they did not believe what our modern science teaches us, namely, that light and heat proceed from our sun, and that it is this planet which imparts all life to our visible nature. His radiance is undecaying, says the Rigveda, the intensely shining, all-pervading, unceasing, undecaying rays of Agni desist not, neither night nor day. This evidently related to the spiritual, central sun, whose rays are all-pervading and unceasing, the eternal and boundless life-giver. He the point, the center, which is everywhere, of the circle, which is nowhere, the ethereal, spiritual fire, the soul and spirit of the all-pervading, mysterious ether, the despair and puzzle of the materialist, who will some day find that that which causes the numberless kiz. P. 271. Like forces to manifest themselves in eternal correlation is but a divine electricity, or rather galvanism, and that the sun is but one of the myriad magnets disseminated through space a reflector as General Pleasanton has it. That the sun has no more heat in it than the moon or the space crowding hosts of sparkling stars. That there is no gravitation in the Newtonian sense, but only magnetic attraction and repulsion and that it is by their magnetism that the planets of the solar system have their motions regulated in their respective orbits by the still more powerful magnetism of the sun, not by their weight or gravitation. This and much more they may learn, but, until then we must be content with being merely laughed at, instead of being burned alive for impiety, or shut up in an insane asylum. The laws of Mano are the doctrines of Plato, Philo, Zoroaster, Pythagoras, and of the Kabbalah. The esotericism of every religion may be solved by the latter. The Kabbalistic doctrine of the allegorical father and son, or Pi Alpha Tau Epsilon Rho and Lambda Omicron Gamma Omicron Sigma is identical with the groundwork of Buddhism. Moses could not reveal to the multitude the sublime secrets of religious speculation, nor the cosmogony of the universe, the whole resting upon the Hindu illusion, a clever mass failing the sanctum sanctorum, and which has misled so many theological commentators. P. 272. The Kabbalistic heresies receive an unexpected support in the heterodox theories of General Pleasanton. According to his opinions, which he supports on far more unimpeachable facts than orthodox scientists theirs, the space between the sun and the earth must be filled with a material medium, which, so far as we can judge from his description, answers to our Kabbalistic astral light. The passage of light through this must produce enormous friction. Friction generates electricity, and it is this electricity and its correlative magnetism which forms those tremendous forces of nature that produce in, on, and about our planet the various changes which we everywhere encounter. He proves that terrestrial heat cannot be directly derived from the sun, for heat ascends. The force by which heat is affected is a repellent one, he says, and as it is associated with positive electricity, it is attracted to the upper atmosphere by its negative electricity, always associated with cold, which is opposed to positive electricity. He strengthens his position by showing that the earth, which when covered with snow cannot be affected by the sun's rays, is warmest where the snow is deepest. This he explains upon the theory that the radiation of heat from the interior of the earth, positively electrified, 
meeting at the surface of the earth with the snow in contact with it, negatively electrified, produces the heat. Thus he shows that it is not at all to the sun that we are indebted for light and heat, that light is a creation sui generis, which sprung into existence at the instant when the deity willed, and uttered the fiat, let there be light, and that it is this independent material agent which produces heat by friction, on account of its enormous and incessant velocity. In short, it is the first cabalistic emanation to which General Pleasanton introduces us, that sephira or divine intelligence, the female principle, which, in unity with Ensof, or divine wisdom, male principle, produced everything visible and invisible. He laughs at the current theory of the incandescence of the sun and its gaseous substance. The reflection from the photosphere of the sun, he says, passing through planetary and stellar spaces, must have thus created a vast amount of electricity and magnetism. Electricity, by the union of its opposite polarities, evolves heat and imparts magnetism to all substances capable of receiving it. The sun, planets, stars, and nebulae are all magnets, etc. If this courageous gentleman should prove his case, future generations will have but little disposition to laugh at Paracelsus and his sidereal or astral light, and at his doctrine of the magnetic influence exercised by p. 273. The stars and planets upon every living creature, plant, or mineral of our globe. Moreover, if the Pleasanton hypothesis is established, the transcendent glory of Professor Tyndall will be rather obscured. According to public opinion, the general makes a terrible onslaught on the learned physicist, for attributing to the sun calorific effects experienced by him in an alpine ramble, that were simply due to his own vital electricity. The prevalence of such revolutionary ideas in science, embolden us to ask the representatives of science whether they can explain why the tides follow the moon in their circling motion? The fact is, they cannot demonstrate even so familiar a phenomenon as this, one that has no mystery for even the neophytes in alchemy and magic. We would also like to learn whether they are equally incapable of telling us why the moon's rays are so poisonous, even fatal, to some organisms, why in some parts of Africa and India a person sleeping in the moonlight is often made insane why the crises of certain diseases correspond with lunar changes, why somnambulists are more affected at her full, and why gardeners, farmers, and woodmen cling so tenaciously to the idea that vegetation is affected by lunar influences. Several of the mimosa alternately open and close their petals as the full moon emerges from or is obscured by clouds. And the Hindus of Travancore have a popular but extremely suggestive proverb which says, soft words are better than harsh, the sea is attracted by the cool moon and not by the hot sun. Perhaps the one man or the many men who launched this proverb on the world knew more about the cause of such attraction of the waters by the moon than we do. Thus if science cannot explain the cause of this physical influence, what can she know of the moral and occult influences that may be exercised by the celestial bodies on men and their destiny, and why contradict that which it is impossible for her to prove false? If certain aspects of the moon affect tangible results so familiar in the experience of men throughout all time, what violence are we doing to logic in assuming the possibility that a certain combination of sidereal influences may also be more or less potential? If the reader will recall what is said by the learned authors of the p. 274. Unseen Universe, as to the positive effect produced upon the universal ether by so small a cause as the evolution of thought in a single human brain. How reasonable will it not appear that the terrific impulses imparted to this common medium by the sweep of the merry blazing orbs that are rushing through the interstellar depths, should affect us in the earth upon which we live, in a powerful degree? If astronomers cannot explain to us the occult law by which the drifting particles of cosmic matter aggregate into worlds, and then take their places in the majestic procession which is ceaselessly moving around some central point of attraction, how can anyone assume to say what mystic influences may or may not be darting through space and affecting the issues of life upon this and other planets? Almost nothing is known of the laws of magnetism and the other imponderable agents, almost nothing of their effects upon our bodies and minds, even that which is known and moreover perfectly demonstrated, is attributed to chance, and curious coincidences. But we do know, by these coincidences, that there are periods when certain diseases, propensities, fortunes, and misfortunes of humanity are more rife than at others. There are times of epidemic in moral and physical affairs. In one epoch the spirit of religious controversy will arouse the most ferocious passions of which human nature is susceptible, provoking mutual persecution, bloodshed, and wars. At another, an epidemic of resistance to constituted authority will spread over half the world, as in the year 1848, 
rapid and simultaneous as the most virulent bodily disorder. Again, the collective character of mental phenomena is illustrated by an anomalous psychological condition invading and dominating over thousands upon thousands, depriving them of everything but automatic action, and giving rise to the popular opinion of demoniacal possession, an opinion in some sense justified by the satanic passions, emotions, and acts which accompany the condition. At one period, the aggregate tendency is to retirement and contemplation, hence, the countless votaries of monarchism and anchoritism, at another the mania is directed toward action, having for its proposed end some utopian scheme, equally impracticable and useless, hence, the myriads who have forsaken their kindred, their homes, and their country, to seek a land whose stones were gold, or to wage exterminating war for the possession of worthless cities and trackless deserts. p. 275. The author from whom the above is quoted says that the seeds of vice and crime appear to be sown under the surface of society, and to spring up and bring forth fruit with appalling rapidity and paralyzing succession. In the presence of these striking phenomena science stands speechless, she does not even attempt to conjecture as to their cause, and naturally, for she has not yet learned to look outside of this ball of dirt upon which we live, and its heavy atmosphere, for the hidden influences which are affecting us day by day, and even minute by minute. But the ancients, whose ignorance is assumed by Mr. Proctor, fully realize the fact that the reciprocal relations between the planetary bodies is as perfect as those between the corpuscles of the blood, which float in a common fluid, and that each one is affected by the combined influences of all the rest, as each in its turn affects each of the others. As the planets differ in size, distance, and activity, so differ in intensity their impulses upon the ether or astral light, and the magnetic and other subtle forces radiated by them in certain aspects of the heavens. Music is the combination and modulation of sounds, and sound is the effect produced by the vibration of the ether. Now, if the impulses communicated to the ether by the different planets may be likened to the tones produced by the different notes of a musical instrument, it is not difficult to conceive that the Pythagorean music of the spheres is something more than a mere fancy, and that certain planetary aspects may imply disturbances in the ether of our planet, and certain others rest in harmony. Certain kinds of music throw us into frenzy some exalt the soul to religious aspirations. In fine, there is scarcely a human creation which does not respond to certain vibrations of the atmosphere. It is the same with colors, some excite us, some soothe and please. The nun clothes herself in black to typify the despondency of a faith crushed under the sense of original sin, the bride robes herself in white, red inflames the anger of certain animals. If we and the animals are affected by vibrations acting upon a very minute scale, why may we not be influenced in the mass by vibrations acting upon a grand scale as the effect of combined stellar influences? We know, says Dr. Elam, that certain pathological conditions have a tendency to become epidemic, influenced by causes not yet investigated. We see how strong is the tendency of opinion once promulgated to run into an epidemic form no opinion, no delusion, is too absurd to assume this collective character. We observe, also, how remarkably the same ideas reproduce themselves and reappear in successive ages, no crime is too horrible to become popular, homicide, infanticide, suicide, poisoning, or any other diabolical human conception. p. 276. In epidemics, the cause of the rapid spread at that particular period remains a mystery. These few lines contain an undeniable psychological fact, sketched with a masterly pen and at the same time a half-confession of utter ignorance causes not yet investigated. Why not be honest and add at once, impossible to investigate with present scientific methods? Noticing an epidemic of incendiarism, Dr. Elam quotes from the Annalite Hygiene Publique the following cases, a girl about 17 years of age was arrested on suspicion, she confessed that twice she had set fire to dwellings by instinct, by irresistible necessity. A boy about 18 committed many acts of this nature. He was not moved by any passion, but the bursting out of the flames excited a profoundly pleasing emotion. Who but has noticed in the columns of the daily press similar incidents? They meet the eye constantly. In cases of murder, of every description, and of other crimes of a diabolical character, the act is attributed, in nine cases out of ten, by the offenders themselves, to irresistible obsessions. Something whispered constantly in my ear. Somebody was incessantly pushing and leading me on. Such are the two frequent confessions of the criminals. Physicians attribute them to hallucinations of disordered brains, 
and call the homicidal impulse temporary lunacy. But is lunacy itself well understood by any psychologist? Has its cause ever been brought under a hypothesis capable of withstanding the challenge of an uncompromising investigator? Let the controversial works of our contemporary alienists answer for themselves. Plato acknowledges man to be the toy of the element of necessity, which he enters upon in appearing in this world of matter. He is influenced by external causes, and these causes are daimonia, like that of Socrates. Happy is the man physically pure, for if his external soul, body, is pure, it will strengthen the second one, astral body, or the soul which is termed by him the higher mortal soul, which still liable to err from its own motives, will always side with reason against the animal proclivities of the body. The lust of man arise in consequence of his perishable material body, so do other diseases, but though he regards crimes as involuntary sometimes, for they result like bodily disease from external causes, Plato clearly makes a wide distinction between these causes. The fatalism which he concedes to humanity, does not preclude the possibility of avoiding them, for though pain, fear, anger, and other failings are given to men by necessity, if they conquered these they would live righteously, and if they were conquered by them, unrighteously. The p. 277. Dual man, i.e., one from whom the divine immortal spirit has departed, leaving but the animal form and astral body, Plato's higher mortal soul, is left merely to his instincts, for he was conquered by all the evils entailed on matter, hence, he becomes a docile tool in the hands of the invisible beings of sublimated matter, hovering in our atmosphere, and ever ready to inspire those who are deservedly deserted by their immortal counselor, the divine spirit, called by Plato genius. According to this great philosopher and initiate, one who lived well during his appointed time would return to the habitation of his star, and there have a blessed and suitable existence. But if he failed in attaining this in the second generation he would pass into a woman become helpless and weak as a woman, and should he not cease from evil in that condition, he would be changed into some brute, which resembled him in his evil ways, and would not cease from his toils and transformations until he followed the original principle of sameness and likeness within him, and overcame, by the help of reason, the latter secretions of turbulent and irrational elements, elementary demons, composed of fire and air, and water and earth and return to the form of his first and better nature. But Dr. Elam thinks otherwise. On page 194 of his book, A Physician's Problems, he says that the cause of the rapid spread of certain epidemics of disease which he is noticing remains a mystery, but as regards the incendiarism he remarks that in all this we find nothing mysterious, though the epidemic is strongly developed. Strange Contradiction De Quincey, in his paper, entitled Murder Considered as One of the Fine Arts, treats of the epidemic of assassination, between 1588 and 1635, by which seven of the most distinguished characters of p. 278. The time lost their lives at the hands of assassins, and neither he, nor any other commentator has been able to explain the mysterious cause of this homicidal mania. If we press these gentlemen for an explanation, which as pretended philosophers they are bound to give us, we are answered that it is a great deal more scientific to assign for such epidemics agitation of the mind, a time of political excitement, 1830, imitation and impulse, excitable and idle boys, and hysterical girls, than to be absurdly seeking for the verification of superstitious traditions in a hypothetical astral light. It seems to us that if, by some providential fatality, hysteria were to disappear entirely from the human system, the medical fraternity would be entirely at a loss for explanations of a large class of phenomena now conveniently classified under the head of normal symptoms of certain pathological conditions of the nervous centers. Hysteria has been hitherto the sheet anchor of skeptical pathologists. Does a dirty peasant girl begin suddenly to speak with fluency different foreign languages hitherto unfamiliar to her, and to write poetry hysterics? Is a medium levitated, in full view of a dozen of witnesses, and carried out of one third-story window and brought back through another disturbance of the nervous centers, followed by a collective hysterical delusion. A Scotch terrier, caught in the room during a manifestation, is hurled by an invisible hand across the room, breaks to pieces, and is salto mortali, a chandelier, under a ceiling eighteen feet high, to fall down killed, canine hallucination. True science has no belief, says Dr. Fennick, in Bulwer Light and Strange Story, True science knows but three states of mind, denial, conviction, and the vast interval between the two, which is not belief, but the suspension of judgment. Such, perhaps, was true science in Dr. Fennick's days. 
but the true science of our modern times proceeds otherwise, it either denies point blank, without any preliminary investigation, or sits in the interim, between denial and conviction, and, dictionary in hand, invents new Greco-Latin appellations for non-existing kinds of hysteria. How often have powerful clairvoyants and adepts in mesmerism described the epidemics in physical, though to others invisible, manifestations which science attributes to epilepsy, hematonervous disorders, and whatnot, of somatic origin, as their lucid vision saw them in the astral light. They affirm that the electric waves were in violent perturbation, and that they discern a direct relation between this ethereal disturbance in the mental or physical epidemic then raging. But, p. 279. Science has heeded them not, but gone on with her encyclopedic labor of devising new names for old things. History, says Dupatet, the prince of French mesmerists, keeps but too well the sad records of sorcery. These facts were but too real, and lent themselves but too readily to dreadful malpractices of the art, to monstrous abuse, but how did I come to find out that art? Where did I learn it? In my thoughts? No, it is nature herself which discovered to me the secret. And how? By producing before my own eyes, without waiting for me to search for it, indisputable facts of sorcery and magic. What is, after all, somnambulistic sleep? A result of the potency of magic. And what is it which determines these attractions, these sudden impulses, these raving epidemics, rages, antipathies, crises, these convulsions which you can make durable? What is it which determines them, if not the very principle we employ, the agent so decidedly well known to the ancients? What you call nervous fluid or magnetism, the men of old called occult power, or the potency of the soul, subjection, magic. Magic is based on the existence of a mixed world place without, not within us, and with which we can enter in communication by the use of certain arts and practices. An element existing in nature, unknown to most men, gets hold of a person and withers and breaks him down, as the fearful hurricane does a bulrush, it scatters men far away, it strikes them in a thousand places at the same time, without their perceiving the invisible foe, or being able to protect themselves, all this is demonstrated, but that this element could choose friends and select favorites, obey their thoughts, answer to the human voice, and understand the meaning of trace signs, that is what people cannot realize, and what the reason rejects, and that is what I saw and I say it here most emphatically, that for me it is a fact and a truth demonstrated forever. If I entered into greater details, one could readily understand that there do exist around us, as in ourselves, mysterious beings who have power and shape, who enter and go out at will, notwithstanding the well-closed doors. Further, the great mesmerizer teaches us that the faculty of directing this fluid is a physical property, resulting from our organization, it passes through all bodies, everything can be used as a conductor for magical operations, and it will retain the power of producing effects in its turn. This is a theory common to all hermetic philosophers. Such is the power of the fluid, that no chemical or physical forces are able to destroy it. There is very little analogy between p. 280. The imponderable fluids known to physicists and this animal magnetic fluid. If we now refer to medieval ages, we find, among others, Cornelius Agrippa telling us precisely the same, the ever-changing universal force, the soul of the world, can fecundate anything by infusing in it its own celestial properties. Arranged according to the formula taught by science, these objects receive the gift of communicating to us their virtue. It is sufficient to wear them, to feel them immediately operating on the soul as on the body. Human soul possesses, from the fact of its being of the same essence as all creation, a marvelous power. One who possesses the secret is enabled to rise in science and knowledge as high as his imagination will carry him, but he does that only on the condition of becoming closely united to this universal force. Truth, even the future, can be then made ever present to the eyes of the soul, and this fact has been many times demonstrated by things coming to pass as they were seen and described beforehand. Time and space vanish before the evil eye of the immortal soul. Her power becomes boundless. She can shoot through space and envelop with her presence man, no matter at what distance. She can plunge and penetrate him through, and make him hear the voice of the person she belongs to, as if that person were in the room. If unwilling to seek for proof or receive information from medieval, hermetic philosophy, we may go still further back into antiquity, and select, out of the great body of philosophers of the pre-Christian ages, one who can least be accused of superstition and credulity Cicero. Speaking of those whom he calls gods, and who are either human or atmospheric spirits, 
we know, says the old orator, that of all living beings man is the best formed, and, as the gods belong to this number, they must have a human form. I do not mean to say that the gods have body and blood in them, but I say that they seem as if they had bodies with blood in them. Epicurus, for whom hidden things were as tangible as if he had touched them with his finger, teaches us that gods are not generally visible, but that they are intelligible, that they are not bodies having a certain solidity, but that we can recognize them by their passing images, that is there are atoms enough in the infinite space to produce such images, these are produced before us, and make us realize what are these happy, immortal beings. When the initiate, says Levi, in his turn, has become quite lucid. P. 281. He communicates and directs at will the magnetic vibrations in the mass of astral light. Transformed in human light at the moment of the conception, it, the light, becomes the first envelope of the soul, by combination with the subtlest fluids it forms an ethereal body, or the sidereal phantom, which is entirely disengaged only at the moment of death. To project this ethereal body, at no matter what distance, to render it more objective and tangible by condensing over its fluidic form the waves of the parent essence, is the great secret of the adept magician. Theurgical magic is the last expression of occult psychological science. The academicians reject it as the hallucination of diseased brains, or brand new with the opprobrium of charlatanry. We deny to them most emphatically the right of expressing their opinion on a subject which they have never investigated. They have no more right, in their present state of knowledge, to judge of magic and spiritualism than a Fiji islander to venture his opinion about the labors of Faraday or Agassi. About all they can do on any one day is to correct the errors of the preceding day. Nearly three thousand years ago, earlier than the days of Pythagoras, the ancient philosophers claimed that light was ponderable hence matter, and that light was force. The corpuscular theory, owing to certain Newtonian failures to account for it, was laughed down, and the undulatory theory, which proclaimed light imponderable, accepted. And now the world is startled by Mr. Doc Crooks weighing light with his radiometer. The Pythagoreans held that neither the sun nor the stars were the sources of light and heat, and that the former was but an agent, but the modern schools teach the contrary. The same may be said respecting the Newtonian law of gravitation. Following strictly the Pythagorean doctrine, Plato held that gravitation was not merely a law of the magnetic attraction of lesser bodies to larger ones, but a magnetic repulsion of similars and attraction of the similars. Things brought together, says he, contrary to nature, or naturally at war, and repel one another. This cannot be taken to mean that repulsion occurs of necessity between bodies of dissimilar properties, but simply that when naturally antagonistic bodies are brought together they repel one another. The researches of Bart and Schwiger leave us in little or no doubt that the ancients were well acquainted with the mutual attractions of iron and the lodestone, as well as with the positive and negative properties of electricity, by whatever name they may have called. P. 282. It. The reciprocal magnetic relations of the planetary orbs, which are all magnets, was with them an accepted fact, and aerolites were not only called by them magnetic stones, but used in the mysteries for purposes to which we now apply the magnet. When, therefore, Professor A. M. Meyer, of the Stevens Institute of Technology, in 1872, told the Yale Scientific Club that the Earth is a great magnet, and that on any sudden agitation of the sun's surface the magnetism of the earth receives a profound disturbance in its equilibrium, causing fitful tremors in the magnets of our observatories, and producing those grand outbursts of the polar lights, whose lambent flames dance in rhythm to the quivering needle, he only restated, in good English, what was taught in good Doric untold centuries before the first Christian philosopher saw the light. The prodigies accomplished by the priests of theurgical magic are so well authenticated, and the evidence of human testimony is worth anything at all is so overwhelming, that, rather than confess that the pagan theurgists far outrivaled the Christians in miracles, Sir David Brewster piously concedes to the former the greatest proficiency in physics, in everything that pertains to natural philosophy. Science finds herself in a very disagreeable dilemma. She must either confess that the ancient physicists were superior in knowledge to her modern representatives, or that there exists something in nature beyond physical science and that spirit possesses powers of which our philosophers never dreamed. The mistake we make in some science we have specially cultivated, says bulwer Leiden, is often only to be seen by the light of a separate science as especially cultivated by another. Nothing can be easier accounted for than the highest possibilities of magic. By the radiant light of the universal magnetic ocean, whose electric waves bind the cosmos together, 
and in their ceaseless motion penetrate every atom and molecule of the boundless creation. The disciples of mesmerism, howbeit insufficient, their various experiments intuitionally perceive the alpha and omega of the great mystery. Alone, the study of this agent, which is the divine breath, can unlock the secrets of psychology and physiology, of cosmical and spiritual phenomena. Magic, says Celis, formed the last part of the sacerdotal science. It investigated the nature, power, and quality of everything sublunary, of the elements in their parts, of animals, all various plants and their fruits, of stones and herbs. In short, it explored the essence and power of everything. From hence, therefore, it produced its effects. p. 283. And it formed statues, magnetized, which procure health, and made all various figures and things, talismans, which could equally become the instruments of disease as well as of health. Often, too, celestial fire is made to appear through magic, and then statues laugh and lamps are spontaneously enkindled. If Govani's modern discovery can set in motion the limbs of a dead frog, and force a dead man's face to express, by the distortion of its features, the most varied emotions, from joy to diabolical rage, despair, and horror, the pagan priests, unless the combined evidence of the most trustworthy men of antiquity is not to be relied upon, accomplish the still greater wonders of making their stone and metal statues to sweat and laugh. The celestial, pure fire of the pagan altar was electricity drawn from the astral light. Statues, therefore, if properly prepared, might, without any accusation of superstition, be allowed to have the property of imparting health and disease by contact, as well as any modern galvanic belt, or overcharged battery. Scholastic skeptics, as well as ignorant materialists, have greatly amused themselves for the last two centuries over the absurdities attributed to Pythagoras by his biographer, Iamblichus. The Simeon philosopher is said to have persuaded Aishi Bear to give up eating human flesh, to have forced the white eagle to descend to him from the clouds, and to have subdued him by stroking him gently with the hand, and by talking to him. On another occasion, Pythagoras actually persuaded an ox to renounce eating beans, by merely whispering in the animal's ear. Oh! ignorance and superstition of our forefathers, how ridiculous they appear in the eyes of our enlightened generations. Let us, however, analyze this absurdity. Every day we see unlettered men, proprietors of strolling menageries, taming and completely subduing the most ferocious animals, merely by the power of their irresistible will. Nay, we have at the present moment in Europe several young and physically weak girls, under twenty years of age, fearlessly doing the same thing. Everyone has either witnessed or heard of the seemingly magical power of some mesmerizers and psychologists. They are able to subjugate their patients for any length of time. Regazzoni, the mesmerist who excited such wonder in France and London, has achieved far more extraordinary feats than what is above attributed to Pythagoras. Why, then, accuse the ancient biographers of such men as Pythagoras and Apollonius of Kiano of either willful misrepresentation or absurd superstition? When we realize that, p. 284. The majority of those who are so skeptical as to the magical powers possessed by the ancient philosophers, who laugh at the old theogonies and the fallacies of mythology, nevertheless have an implicit faith in the records and inspiration of their Bible, hardly daring to doubt even that monstrous absurdity that Joshua arrested the course of the sun. We may well say amen to Godfrey Higgins' just rebuke, when I find, he says, learned men believing Genesis literally, which the ancients, with all their failings, had too much sense to receive except allegorically, I am tempted to doubt the reality of the improvement of the human mind. One of the very few commentators on old Greek and Latin authors, who have given their just dues to the ancients for their mental development, is Thomas Taylor. In his translation of Iamblichus Life of Pythagoras, we find him remarking as follows, since Pythagoras, as Iamblichus informs us, was initiated in all the mysteries of Biblis entire, in the sacred operations of the Syrians, and in the mysteries of the Phoenicians, and also that he spent two and twenty years in the Adida of temples in Egypt, associated with the Magians in Babylon, and was instructed by them in their venerable knowledge, it is not at all wonderful that he was skilled in magic, or theurgy, and was therefore able to perform things which surpass merely human power, and which appear to be perfectly incredible to the vulgar. The universal ether was not, in their eyes, simply as something stretching, tenantless, Throughout the expanse of heaven, it was a boundless ocean peopled like our familiar seas with monstrous and minor creatures, and having in its every molecule the germs of life. 
Like the finny tribes which swarm in our oceans in smaller bodies of water, each kind having its habitat in some spot to which it is curiously adapted, some friendly and some inimical to man, some pleasant and some frightful to behold, some seeking the refuge of quiet nooks and landlocked harbors, and some traversing great areas of water, the various races of the elemental spirits were believed by them to inhabit the different portions of the great ethereal ocean, and to be exactly adapted to their respective conditions. If we will only bear in mind the fact that the rushing of planets through space must create as absolute a disturbance in this plastic and attenuated medium, as the passage of a cannon shot does in the air or that of a steamer in the water, and on a cosmic scale, we can understand that certain planetary aspects, admitting our premises to be true, may produce much more violent agitation and cause much stronger currents to flow in a given direction, than others. With the same premises conceded, we may also see why, by such various aspects of the stars, Shoals of P. 285. Friendly or hostile elementals might be poured in upon our atmosphere, or some particular portion of it, and make the fact appreciable by the effects which ensue. According to the ancient doctrines, the soulless elemental spirits were evolved by the ceaseless motion inherent in the astral light. Light is force, and the latter is produced by the will. As this will proceeds from an intelligence which cannot err, for it has nothing of the material organs of human thought in it, being the superfine pure emanation of the highest divinity itself Plato's father, it proceeds from the beginning of time, according to immutable laws, to evolve the elementary fabric requisite for subsequent generations of what we term human races. All of the latter, whether belonging to this planet or to some other of the myriads in space, have their earthly bodies evolved in the matrix out of the bodies of a certain class of these elemental beings which have passed away in the invisible worlds. In the ancient philosophy there was no missing link to be supplied by what Tyndall calls an educated imagination, no height is to be filled with volumes of materialistic speculations made necessary by the absurd attempt to solve an equation with but one set of quantities, our ignorant ancestors traced the law of evolution throughout the whole universe. As by gradual progression from the star cloudlet to the development of the physical body of man, the rule holds good, so from the universal ether to the incarnate human spirit they trace one uninterrupted series of entities. These evolutions were from the world of spirit into the world of gross matter, and threw that back again to the source of all things. The descent of species was to them a descent from the spirit, primal source of all, to the degradation of matter. In this complete chain of unfoldings the elementary, spiritual beings had as distinct a place, midway between the extremes, as Mr. Darwin's missing link between the ape and man. No author in the world of literature ever gave a more truthful or more poetical description of these beings than Sir E. Bulwer Lytton, the author of Zanoni. Now, himself a thing not of matter but an idea of joy and light, his words sound more like the faithful echo of memory than the exuberant outflow of mere imagination. Man is arrogant in proportion of his ignorance, he makes the wise mainer say to Glyndon. For several ages he saw in the countless worlds that sparkle through space like the bubbles of a shoreless ocean, only the petty candles, that providence has been pleased to light for no other purpose but to make the night more agreeable to man. Astronomy has corrected this delusion of human vanity, and man now reluctantly confesses that the stars are worlds, larger and more glorious than his own. Everywhere, then, in this immense design, science. p. 286. Brings new life to light. Reasoning, then, by evident analogy, if not a leaf, if not a drop of water, but is, no less than yonder star, a habitable and breathing world nay, if even man himself, is a world to other lives, and millions and myriads dwell in the rivers of his blood, and inhabit man's frame, as man inhabits earth common sense, if our schoolmen had it, would suffice to teach that the circumfluent infinite which you call space the boundless and palpable which divides earth from the moon and stars is filled also with its correspondent and appropriate life. Is it not a visible absurdity to suppose that being is crowded upon every leaf? and yet absent from the immensities of space. The law of the great system forbids the waste even of an atom, it knows no spot where something of life does not breathe. Well, then, can you conceive that space, which is the infinite itself, is alone a waste, is alone lifeless, is less useful to the one design of universal being, than the people leaf, than the swarming globule? The microscope shows you the creatures on the leaf. No mechanical tube is yet invented to discover the nobler and more gifted things that hover in the illimitable air. Yet between these last and man is a mysterious and terrible affinity. But first, to penetrate this barrier, the soul with which you listen must be sharpened by intense enthusiasm, purified from all earthly desires. 
When thus prepared, signs can be brought to aid it, the sight itself may be rendered more subtle, the nerves more acute, the spirit more alive and outward, and the element itself the air, the space may be made, by certain secrets of the higher chemistry, more palpable and clear. And this, too, is not magic as the credulous call it, as I have so often said before, magic, a science that violates nature, exists not, it is but the science by which nature can be controlled. Now, in space there are millions of beings, not literally spiritual, for they have all, like the animalcula unseen by the naked eye, certain forms of matter, though matter so delicate, air-drawn, and subtle, that it is, as it were, but a film, a gossamer, that clothes the spirit. Yet, in truth, these races differ most widely, some of surpassing wisdom, some of horrible malignity, some hostile as fiends to men, others gentle as messengers between earth and heaven. Amid the dwellers of the threshold is one, two, surpassing a malignity and hatred all our tribe, one whose eyes have paralyzed the bravest, and whose power increases over the spear precisely in proportion to its fear. Such is the insufficient sketch of elemental beings void of divine spirit, given by one whom many with reason believed to know more than he was prepared to admit in the face of an incredulous public. p. 287. In the following chapter we will contrive to explain some of the esoteric speculations of the initiates of the sanctuary, as to what man was, is, and may yet be. The doctrines they taught in the mysteries the source from which sprang the Old and partially the New Testament, belong to the most advanced notions of morality, and religious revelations. While the literal meaning was abandoned to the fanaticism of the unreasoning lower classes of society, the higher ones, the majority of which consisted of initiates, pursued their studies in the solemn silence of the temples, and their worship of the one God of heaven. The speculations of Plato, in the banquet, on the creation of the primordial men, and the essay on cosmogony in the Timaeus, must be taken allegorically, if we accept them at all. It is this hidden Pythagorean meaning in Timaeus, Cretilus, and Parmenides, and a few other trilogies and dialogues, that the Neoplatonists ventured to expound, as far as the theurgical vow of secrecy would allow them. The Pythagorean doctrine that God is the universal mind diffused through all things, and the dogma of the soul's immortality, are the leading features in these apparently incongruous teachings. His piety and the great veneration Plato felt for the mysteries, are sufficient warrant that he would not allow his indiscretion to get the better of that deep sense of responsibility which is felt by every adept. Constantly perfecting himself in perfect mysteries, a man in them alone becomes truly perfect, says he in the Phaedrus. He took no pains to conceal his displeasure that the mysteries had become less secret than formerly. Instead of profaning them by putting them within the reach of the multitude, he would have guarded them with jealous care against all but the most earnest and worthy of his disciples. While mentioning the gods, on every page, his monotheism is unquestionable, for the whole thread of his discourse indicates that by the term gods he means a class of beings far lower in the scale than deities, and but one grade higher than men. Even Josephus perceived and acknowledged this fact, despite the natural prejudice of his race. In his famous onslaught upon Oppian, this historian says, those, however, among the Greeks who philosophized in accordance with truth, were not ignorant of anything, nor did they fail to perceive the chilling. p. 288. Superficialities of the mythical allegories, on which account they justly despise them. By which thing Plato, being moved, says it is not necessary to admit any one of the other poets into the commonwealth, and he dismisses Homer blandly, after having crowned him and pouring unguent upon him, in order that indeed he should not destroy, by his myths, the orthodox belief respecting one god. Those who can discern the true spirit of Plato's philosophy, will hardly be satisfied with the estimate of the same which Joet lays before his readers. He tells us that the influence exercised upon posterity by the Timaeus is partly due to a misunderstanding of the doctrine of its author by the Neoplatonists. He would have us believe that the hidden meanings which they found in this dialogue, are quite at variance with the spirit of Plato. This is equivalent to the assumption that Joet understands what this spirit really was, whereas his criticism upon this particular topic rather indicates that he did not penetrate it at all. If, as he tells us, the Christians seem to find in his work their trinity, the word, the church, and the creation of the world, in a Jewish sense, it is because all this is there, and therefore it is but natural that they should have found it. The hour of building is the same, but the spirit which animated the dead letter of the philosopher's teaching has fled, and we would seek for it in vain through the arid dogmas of Christian theology. 
The Sphinx is the same now, as it was four centuries before the Christian era, but the Oedipus is no more. He is slain because he has given to the world that which the world was not ripe enough to receive. He was the embodiment of truth, and he had to die, as every grand truth has too, before, like the phoenix of old, it revives from its own ashes. Every translator of Plato's works remarked the strange similarity between the philosophy of the esoterists and the Christian doctrines, and each of them has tried to interpret it in accordance with his own religious feelings. So Cory, in his ancient fragments, tries to prove that it is but an outward resemblance, and does his best to lower the Pythagorean monad in the public estimation and exalt upon its ruins the later anthropomorphic deity. Taylor, advocating the former, acts as unceremoniously with the Mosaic God. Zeller boldly laughs at the pretensions of the fathers of the church, who, notwithstanding history and its chronology, and whether people will have it or not, insist that Plato and his school have robbed Christianity of its leading features. It is as fortunate for us as it is unfortunate for the Roman church that such clever sleight of hand as that resorted to by Eusebius is rather difficult in our century. It was easier to pervert chronology for the sake of making synchronisms, in the days of the bishop of Caesarea, than it is now and while history exists, no one can help people knowing that Plato lived 600 years before. p. 289. Irenaeus took it into his head to establish a new doctrine from the ruins of Plato's older academy. This doctrine of God being the universal mind diffused through all things, underlies all ancient philosophies. The Buddhistic tenets which can never be better comprehended than when studying the Pythagorean philosophy its faithful reflection are derived from the source as well as the Brahmanical religion and early Christianity. The purifying process of transmigrations and metempsychoses however grossly anthropomorphized at a later period, must only be regarded as a supplementary doctrine, disfigured by theological sophistry with the object of getting a firmer hold upon believers through a popular superstition. Neither Gautama Buddha nor Pythagoras intended to teach this purely metaphysical allegory literally. Esoterically, it is explained in the mystery of the Kambum, and relates to the purely spiritual peregrinations of the human soul. It is not in the dead letter of Buddhistical sacred literature that scholars may hope to find the true solution of its metaphysical subtleties. The latter wear the power of thought by the inconceivable profundity of its ratiocination, and the student is never farther from truth than when he believes himself nearest its discovery. The mastery of every doctrine of the perplexing Buddhist system can be attained only by proceeding strictly according to the Pythagorean and Platonic method, from universals down to particulars. The key to it lies in the refined and mystical tenets of the spiritual influx of divine life. Whoever is unacquainted with my law, says Buddha, and dies in that state, must return to the earth till he becomes a perfect Samanian. To achieve this object, he must destroy within himself the trinity of Maya. He must extinguish his passions, unite and identify himself with the law, the teaching of the secret doctrine, and comprehend the religion of annihilation. Here, annihilation refers but to matter, that of the visible as well as of the invisible body, for the astral soul, perisprit, is still matter, however sublimated. The same book says that what Pho, Buddha, meant to say was, that the primitive substance is eternal and unchangeable. Its highest revelation is the pure, luminous ether, the boundless infinite space, not a void resulting from the absence of forms, but, on the contrary, the foundation of all forms, and anterior to them. But the very presence of forms denotes it to be the creation of Maya, and all her works are as nothing before the uncreated being, spirit, in whose profound and sacred repose all motion must cease forever. p. 290. Thus annihilation means, with the Buddhistical philosophy, only a dispersion of matter, in whatever form or semblance of form it may be, for everything that bears a shape was created, and thus must sooner or later perish, i.e., change that shape, therefore, as something temporary, though seeming to be permanent, it is but an illusion, maya, for, as eternity has neither beginning nor end, the more or less prolonged duration of some particular form passes, as it were, like an instantaneous flash of lightning. Before we have the time to realize that we have seen it, it is gone and passed away forever, Hence, even our astral bodies, pure ether, are but illusions of matter, so long as they retain their terrestrial outline. The latter changes, says the Buddhist, according to the merits or demerits of the person during his lifetime, and this is metempsychosis. When the spiritual entity breaks loose forever from every particle of matter, then only it enters upon the eternal and unchangeable nirvana. He exists in spirit, in nothing, as a form, a shape, 
a semblance, he is completely annihilated, and thus will die no more. Her spirit alone is no Maya, but the only reality in an illusionary universe of ever-passing forms. It is upon this Buddhist doctrine that the Pythagoreans grounded the principal tenets of their philosophy. Can that spirit, which gives life and motion, and partakes of the nature of light, be reduced to non-entity? They asked. Can that sensitive spirit in brutes which exercises memory, one of the rational faculties, die, and become nothing? And Whitelock Bulstrode, in his able defense of Pythagoras, expounds this doctrine by adding, if you say, they, the brutes, breathe their spirits into the air, and there vanish, that is all I contend for. The air, indeed, is the proper place to receive them, being, according to Laertius, full of souls, and, according to Epicurus, full of atoms, the principles of all things, for even this place wherein we walk and birds fly has so much of a spiritual nature, that it is invisible, and, therefore, may well be the receiver of forms, since the forms of all bodies are so, we can only see and hear its effects, the air itself is too fine, and above the capacity of the age. What then is the ether in the region above, and what are the influences or forms that descend from thence? The spirits of creatures, the Pythagoreans hold, who are emanations of the most sublimated portions of ether, emanations, breaths, but not forms. Ether is incorruptible, all philosophers agree in that, and what is incorruptible so far from being annihilated when it gets rid of the form, that it lays a good claim to immortality. But what is that which has no body, no form, which is imponderable, invisible and indivisible, that which exists and yet is not? Ask the Buddhists. It is nirvana, is the answer. It is nothing, not a region, but rather a state. When once nirvana is. p. 291. Reached, man is exempt from the effects of the four truths, for an effect can only be produced through a certain cause, and every cause is annihilated in the state. These four truths are the foundation of the whole Buddhist doctrine of nirvana. They are, says the book of Prajnaparamita, 1. The existence of pain. 2. The production of pain. 3. The annihilation of pain. 4. The way to the annihilation of pain. What is the source of pain? Existence. Birth existing, decrepitude and death ensue, for wherever there is a form, there is a cause for pain and suffering. Spirit alone has no form, and therefore cannot be said to exist. Whenever man, the ethereal, inner man, reaches that point when he becomes utterly spiritual, hence, formless, he has reached a state of perfect bliss. Man as an objective being becomes annihilated, but the spiritual entity with its subjective life, will live forever, for spirit is incorruptible and immortal. It is by the spirit of the teachings of both Buddha and Pythagoras, that we can so easily recognize the identity of their doctrines. The all-pervading, universal soul, the anima mundi, is nirvana, and Buddha, as a generic name, is the anthropomorphized monad of Pythagoras. When resting in nirvana, the final bliss, Buddha is the silent monad, dwelling in darkness and silence. He is also the formless Brahm, the sublime but unknowable deity, which pervades invisibly the whole universe. Whenever it is manifested, desiring to impress itself upon humanity in a shape intelligent to our intellect, whether we call it an avatar, or a king messiah, or a permutation of divine spirit, logos, Christos, it is all one and the same thing. In each case it is the Father, who is in the Son, and the Son in the Father. The immortal spirit overshadows the mortal man. It enters into him, and pervading his whole being, makes of him a god, who descends into his earthly tabernacle. Every man may become a Buddha, says the doctrine. And so throughout the interminable series of ages we find now and then men who more or less succeed in uniting themselves with God, as the expression goes, with their own spirit, as we ought to translate. The Buddhists call such men Arit. An Arit is next to a Buddha, and none is equal to him either in infused science, or miraculous powers. Certain fakirs demonstrate the theory well in practice, as Jacolio has proved. Even the so-called fabulous narratives of certain Buddhistical books, when stripped of their allegorical meaning, are found to be the secret doctrines taught by Pythagoras. And the Pali books called the Jutakas, are given the 550 incarnations or metempsychoses of Buddha. They p. 292 Narrate how he has appeared in every form of animal life, and animated every sentient being on earth, from infinitesimal insect to the bird, the beast, and finally man, the microcosmic image of God on earth. 
Must this be taken literally? Is it intended as a description of the actual transformations in existence of one and the same individual immortal, divine spirit, which by turns has animated every kind of sentient being? Are we not rather to understand, with Buddhist metaphysicians, that though the individual human spirits are numberless, collectively they are one, as every drop of water drawn out of the ocean, metaphorically speaking, may have an individual existence and still be one with the rest of the drops going to form that ocean, for each human spirit is the scintilla of the one all-pervading light. That this divine spirit animates the flower, the particle of granite on the mountainside, the lion, the man? Egyptian hierophants, like the Brahmins, and the Buddhists of the East, and some Greek philosophers, maintained originally that the same spirit that animates the particle of dust, lurking latent in it, animates man, manifesting itself in him in its highest state of activity. The doctrine, also, of a gradual refusion of the human soul into the essence of the primeval parent spirit, was universal at one time. But this doctrine never implied annihilation of the higher spiritual ego only the dispersion of the external forms of man, after his terrestrial death, as well as during his abode on earth. Who is better fated to impart to us the mysteries of after death, so erroneously thought impenetrable, than those men who having through self-discipline and purity of life and purpose, succeeded in uniting themselves with their God, were afforded some glimpses, however imperfect, of the great truth. And these seers tell us strange stories about the variety of forms assumed by disembodied astral souls, forms of which each one is a spiritual though concrete reflection of the abstract state of the mind, and thoughts of the once living man. To accuse Buddhistical philosophy of rejecting a supreme being God, and the soul's immortality, of atheism, in short, on the ground that according to their doctrines, nirvana means annihilation, and Svabhavad is not a person, but nothing, is simply absurd. The N, or Ayan, of the Jewish N Sof, also means nihil or nothing, that which is not, Quoad knows, but no one has ever ventured to twit the Jews with atheism. In both cases the real meaning of the term nothing carries with it the idea that God is not a thing, not a concrete or visible being to which a name expressive of any object known to us on earth may be applied with propriety. Chapter 9. Thou canst not call that madness of which thou art proved to know nothing. Tertullian, Apology. This is not a matter of today, or yesterday, but hath been from all times. And none hath told us whence it came or how. Sophocles. Belief in the supernatural is a fact natural, primitive, universal, and constant in the life and history of the human race. Unbelief in the supernatural begets materialism, materialism, sensuality, sensuality, social convulsions, amid whose storms man again learns to believe and pray. Gaio. If any one think these things incredible, let him keep his opinions to himself, and not contradict those who, by such events, are incited to the study of virtue. Josephus. From the Platonic and Pythagorean views of matter and force, we will now turn to the Kabbalistic philosophy of the origin of man, and compare it with the theory of natural selection enunciated by Darwin and Wallace. It may be that we shall find as much reason to credit the ancients with originality in this direction as in that which we have been considering. To our mind, no stronger proof of the theory of cyclical progression need be required than the comparative enlightenment of former ages and that of the patristic church, as regards the form of the earth, and the movements of the planetary system. Even were other evidence wanting, the ignorance of Augustine and Lactantius, misleading the whole of Christendom upon these questions until the period of Galileo, would mark the eclipses through which human knowledge passes from age to age. The coats of skin, mentioned in the third chapter of Genesis as given to Adam and Eve, are explained by certain ancient philosophers to mean the fleshy bodies with which, in the progress of the cycles, the progenitors of the race became clothed. They maintain that the godlike physical form became grosser and grosser, until the bottom of what may be termed the last spiritual cycle was reached, and mankind entered upon the ascending arc of the first human cycle. Then began an uninterrupted series of cycles or yugas, the precise number of years of which each of them consisted remaining an inviolable mystery within the precincts of the sanctuaries and disclosed only to the initiates. As soon as humanity entered upon a new one, the Stone Age, with which the preceding cycle had closed, began to gradually merge into the following and next higher age. With each successive age, or epoch, men grew more refined, until p. 294. The acme of perfection possible in that particular cycle had been reached. Then the receding wave of time carried back with it the vestiges of human, social, and intellectual progress. 
Cycle succeeded cycle, by imperceptible transitions, highly civilized flourishing nations, waxed in power, attained the climax of development, waned, and became extinct, and mankind, when the end of the lower cyclic arc was reached, was replunged into barbarism as at the start. Kingdoms have crumbled and nation succeeded nation from the beginning until our day, the races alternately mounting to the highest and descending to the lowest points of development. Draper observes that there is no reason to suppose that any one cycle applied to the whole human race. On the contrary, while man in one portion of the planet was in a condition of retrogression, in another he might be progressing in enlightenment and civilization. How analogous this theory is to the law of planetary motion, which causes the individual orbs to rotate on their axes, the several systems to move around their respective suns, and the whole stellar host to follow a common path around a common center. Life and death, light and darkness, day and night on the planet, as it turns about its axis and traverses the zodiacal circle representing the lesser and the greater cycles. Remember the hermetic axiom, as above, so below, as in heaven, so on earth. Mr. Alfred R. Wallace argues with sound logic, that the development of man has been more marked in his mental organization than in his external form. Man, he conceives to differ from the animal, by being able to undergo great changes of conditions and of his entire environment, without very marked alterations in bodily form and structure. The changes of climate he meets with a corresponding alteration in his clothing, shelter, weapons, and implements of husbandry. His body may become less hairy, more erect, and of a different color and proportions, the head and face is immediately connected with the organ of the mind, and as being the medium, expressing the most refined motions of his nature alone change with the development of his intellect. There was a time when he had not yet acquired that wonderfully developed brain, the organ of the mind, which now, even in his lowest examples, raises him far above the highest brutes, at a period when he had the form, but hardly the nature of man, when he neither possessed human speech nor sympathetic and moral feelings. Further, Mr. Wallace says that man may have been indeed, I believe must have been, once a homogeneous. P. 295. Race, in man, the hairy covering of the body has almost entirely disappeared. Of the cavemen of Lay Az, Mr. Wallace remarks further, the great breadth of the face, the enormous development of the ascending ramus of the lower jaw, indicate enormous muscular power and the habits of a savage and brutal race. Such are the glimpses which anthropology affords us of men, either arrived at the bottom of a cycle or starting in a new one. Let us see how far they are corroborated by clairvoyant psychometry. Professor Denton submitted a fragment of fossilized bone to his wife's examination, without giving Mrs. Denton any hint as to what the article was. It immediately called up to her pictures of people and scenes which he thinks belong to the Stone Age. She saw men closely resembling monkeys, with a body very hairy, and as if the natural hair answered the purpose of clothing. I question whether he can stand perfectly upright. His hip joints appear to be so formed, he cannot, she added. Occasionally I see part of the body of one of those beings that looks comparatively smooth. I can see the skin, which is lighter colored, I do not know whether he belongs to the same period. At a distance the face seems flat, the lower part of it is heavy, they have what I suppose would be called prognathous jaws. The frontal region of the head is low, and the lower portion of it is very prominent, forming a round ridge across the forehead immediately above the eyebrows. Now I see a face that looks like that of a human being, though there is a monkey-like appearance about it. All these seem of that kind, having long arms and hairy bodies. Whether or not the men of science are willing to concede the correctness of the hermetic theory of the physical evolution of man from higher and more spiritual natures, they themselves show us how the race has progressed from the lowest observed point to its present development. And, as all nature seems to be made up of analogies, is it unreasonable to affirm that the same progressive development of individual forms has prevailed among the inhabitants of the unseen universe? If such marvelous effects have been caused by evolution upon our little insignificant planet, producing reasoning and intuitive men from some higher type of the ape family, why well, suppose that the boundless realms of space are inhabited only by disembodied angelic forms? Why well, not give place in that vast domain to the spiritual duplicates of these hairy, long-armed and half-reasoning ancestors, their predecessors, and all their successors, down to our time? Of course, the spiritual parts of such primeval members of the human family would be as uncouth and undeveloped as were. P. 296. Their physical bodies. 
While they made no attempt to calculate the duration of the grand cycle, the Hermetic philosophers yet maintain that, according to the cyclic law, the living human race must inevitably and collectively return one day to that point of departure, where man was first clothed with coats of skin, or, to express it more clearly, the human race must, in accordance with the law of evolution, be finally physically spiritualized. Unless Messrs. Darwin and Huxley are prepared to prove that the man of our century has attained, as a physical and moral animal, the acne of perfection, and evolution, having reached its apex, must stop all further progress with the modern genus Homo, we do not see how they can possibly confute such a logical deduction. In his lecture on the action of natural selection on man, Mr. Alfred R. Wallace concludes his demonstrations as to the development of human races under that law of selection by saying that, if his conclusions are just, it must inevitably follow that the higher the more intellectual and moral must displace the lower and more degraded races, and the power of natural selection, still acting on his mental organization, must ever lead to the more perfect adaptation of man's higher faculties to the condition of surrounding nature, and to the exigencies of the social state. While his external form will probably ever remain unchanged, except in the development of that perfect beauty, refined and ennobled by the highest intellectual faculties and sympathetic emotions, his mental constitution may continue to advance and improve, till the world is again inhabited by a single, nearly homogeneous race, no individual of which will be inferior to the noblest specimens of existing humanity. Sober, scientific methods and cautiousness and hypothetical possibilities have evidently their share in this expression of the opinions of the great anthropologist. Still, what he says above clashes in no way with our cabalistic assertions. Allow to ever-progressing nature, to the great law of the survival of the fittest, one step beyond Mr. Wallace's deductions, and we have in future the possibility nay, the assurance of a race, which, like the Vrilya of Bulwer Leiden's coming race, will be but one removed from the primitive sons of God. It will be observed that this philosophy of cycles, which was allegorized by the Egyptian hierophants in the circle of necessity, explains at the same time the allegory of the fall of man. According to the Arabian descriptions, each of the seven chambers of the pyramids those grandest of all cosmic symbols was known by the name of a planet. The peculiar architecture of the pyramids shows in itself the drift of the metaphysical thought of their builders. The apex is lost in the clear blue sky of the land of the pharaohs, and typifies the primordial. p. 297. Point lost in the unseen universe from whence started the first race of the spiritual prototypes of man. Each mummy, from the moment that it was embalmed, lost its physical individuality in one sense, it symbolized the human race. Placed in such a way as was best calculated to aid the exit of the soul, the latter had to pass through the seven planetary chambers before it made its exit through the symbolical apex. Each chamber typified, at the same time, one of the seven spheres, and one of the seven higher types of physico-spiritual humanity alleged to be above our own. Every three thousand years, the soul, representative of its race, had to return to its primal point of departure before it underwent another evolution into a more perfected spiritual and physical transformation. We must go deep indeed into the abstruse metaphysics of Oriental mysticism before we can realize fully the infinitude of the subjects that were embraced at one sweep by the majestic thought of its exponents. Starting as a pure and perfect spiritual being, the Adam of the second chapter of Genesis, not satisfied with the position allotted to him by the Demiurgus, who is the eldest first begotten, the Adam Codman, Adam the Second, the man of dust, strives in his pride to become creator in his turn. Of all that of the androgynous Codman, this Adam is himself an androgen, for, according to the oldest beliefs presented allegorically in Plato's Timaeus, the prototypes of our races were all enclosed in the microcosmic tree which grew and developed within and under the great mundane or macrocosmic tree. Divine spirit being considered a unity, however numerous the rays of the great spiritual sun, Man has still had his origin like all other forms, whether organic or otherwise, in this one found of eternal light. Were we even to reject the hypothesis of an androgynous man, in connection with physical evolution, the significance of the allegory in its spiritual sense, would remain unimpaired. So long as the first god-man, symbolizing the two first principles of creation, the dual male and female element, had no thought of good and evil he could not hypostasize woman, for she was in him as he was in her. It was only when, as a result of the evil hints of the serpent, matter, the latter condensed itself and cooled on the spiritual man in its contact with the elements, that the fruits of the man-tree who is himself that tree of knowledge appeared to his view. From this moment the androgynal union ceased, 
man evolved out of himself the woman as a separate entity. They have broken the thread between pure spirit and pure matter. Henceforth they will create no more spiritually, and by the sole power of their will, man has become a physical creator, and the kingdom of spirit can be won only by a long imprisonment in matter. The meaning of Gogard, the Hellenic tree of life, the sacred Okamong. P. 298. Whose luxuriant branches a serpent dwells, and cannot be dislodged, thus becomes apparent. Creeping out from the primordial illus, the mundane snake grows more material and waxes in strength and power with every new evolution. The Adam Primus, or Codman, the logos of the Jewish mystics, is the same as the Grecian Prometheus, who seeks to rival with the divine wisdom, he is also the Pymander of Hermes, or the power of the thought divine, in its most spiritual aspect, for he was less hypostasized by the Egyptians than the two former. These all create men, but fail in their final object. Desiring to endow man with an immortal spirit, in order that by linking the Trinity in one, he might gradually return to his primal spiritual state without losing his individuality, Prometheus fails in his attempt to seal the divine fire, in a sense to expiate his crime on Malchus Beck. Prometheus is also the logos of the ancient Greeks, as well as Heracles. In the Codex Nazareus we see Bahaxivo deserting the heaven of his father, confessing that though he is the father of the genii, he is unable to construct creatures, for he is equally unacquainted with Orcus as with the consuming fire which is wanting in light. And Fetahil, one of the powers, sits in the mud, matter, and wonders why the living fire is so changed. All of these Logoi strove to endow man with the immortal spirit, failed, and nearly all are represented as being punished for the attempt by severe sentences. Those of the early Christian fathers who like Origen and Clemens Alexandrinus, were well versed in pagan symbology, having begun their careers as philosophers, felt very much embarrassed. They could not deny the anticipation of their doctrines in the oldest myths. The latest logos, according to their teachings, had also appeared in order to show mankind the way to immortality, and in his desire to endow the world with eternal life through the Pentecostal fire had lost his life agreeably to the traditional program. Thus was originated the very awkward explanation of which our modern clergy freely avail themselves, that all these mythic types show the prophetic spirit which, through the Lord's mercy, was afforded even to the heathen idolaters. The pagans, they assert, had presented in their imagery the great drama of Calvary hence the resemblance. On the other hand, the philosophers maintained, with unassailable logic, that the pious fathers had simply helped themselves to a ready-made groundwork, either finding it easier than to exert their own imagination, or because of the greater number of ignorant proselytes who were attracted to the new doctrine. p. 299. By such an extraordinary resemblance with their mythologies, at least as far as the outward form of the most fundamental doctrines goes. The allegory of the fall of man and the fire of Prometheus is also another version of the myth of the rebellion of the proud Lucifer, hurled down to the bottomless pit Orcus. In the religion of the Brahmins, Moisher, the Hindu Lucifer, becomes envious of the Creator's resplendent light, and at the head of a legion of inferior spirits rebels against Brahma, and declares war against him. Like Hercules, the faithful Titan, who helps Jupiter and restores to him his throne, Shiva, the third person of the Hindu Trinity, hurls them all from the celestial abode in Hundra, the region of eternal darkness. But here the fallen angels are made to reap in of their evil deed, and in the Hindu doctrine they are all afforded the opportunity to progress. In the Greek fiction, Hercules, the sun god, descends to Hades to deliver the victims from their tortures, and the Christian church also makes her incarnate god descend to the dreary Plutonic regions and overcome the rebellious ex-archangel. In their turn the Kabbalists explain the allegory in a semi-scientific way. Adam the second, or the first created race which Plato calls gods, in the Bible the Elohim, was not triple in his nature like the earthly man, i.e., he was not composed of soul, spirit, and body, but was a compound of sublimated astral elements into which the Father had breathed an immortal, divine spirit. The latter, by reason of its godlike essence, was ever struggling to liberate itself from the bonds of even that flimsy prison, hence the sons of God, in their imprudent efforts, were the first to trace a future motto for the cyclic will. But, man must not be like one of us, says the creative deity one of the alone entrusted with the fabrication of the lower animal. And thus it was, when the men of the first race had reached the summit of the first cycle, they lost their balance, and their second envelope, the grosser clothing, astral body, dragged them down the opposite arc. This Kabbalistic version of the sons of God, or of light, 
is given in the Codex Nazareus. The Haxivo, the father of Genia, is ordered to construct creatures. But, as he is ignorant of Orcus, he fails to do so and calls in Fetahil a still purest spirit to his aid, who fails still worse. Then steps on the stage of creation the spirit, which properly ought to be translated soul, for it is the anima mundi, in which. p. 300. With the Nazarenes and the Gnostics was feminine, in perceiving that for Fetahil, the newest man, the latest, the splendor was changed, and that for splendor existed decrease in damage, awakes corrupt on us, who is frantic and without sense and judgment, and says to him, Rise, see, the splendor, light, of the newest man, Fetahil, has failed, to produce or create men, the decrease of this splendor is visible. Rise up, come with thy mother, the spirit is, and free thee from limits by which thou art held, and those more ample than the whole world. After which follows the union of the frantic and blind matter, guided by the insinuations of the spirit, not the divine breath, but the astral spirit, which by its double essence is already tainted with matter, and the offer of the mother being accepted the spirit is conceived seven figures, which Irenaeus is disposed to take for the seven stellars, planets, but which represent the seven capital sins, the progeny of an astral soul separated from its divine source, spirit, and matter, the blind demon of concupiscence. Seeing this, Fetihil extends his hand toward the abyss of matter, and says, Let the earth exist, just as the abode of the powers has existed. Dipping his hand in the chaos, which he condenses, he creates our planet. Then the Codex proceeds to tell how Bahaxivo was separated from the spiritus, and the genii, or angels, from the rebels. Then Mono, the greatest, who dwells with the greatest Fro, calls Kebarzivo, known also by the name of Nabat I ever bar Ufen I Fafen, Helm and Vine of the Food of Life he being the third life, and, commiserating the rebellious and foolish genii, on account of the magnitude of their ambition, says, Lord of the genii, eons, see what the genii, the rebellious angels do, and about what they are consulting. They say, Let us call forth the world, and let us call the powers into existence. The genii are the principes, the sons of light, but thou art the messenger of life. p. 301. And in order to counteract the influence of the seven badly disposed principles, the progeny of spirit is, Caberzio, the mighty lord of splendor, procreates seven other lives, the cardinal virtues, who shine in their own form and light from on high and thus re-establishes the balance between good and evil, light and darkness. But this creation of beings, without the requisite influx of divine pure breath in them, which was known among the Kabbalists as the living fire, produced but creatures of matter and astral light. Thus were generated the animals which preceded man on this earth. The spiritual beings, the sons of light, those who remain faithful to the great for Ho, the first cause of all, constitute the celestial or angelic hierarchy, the Adonim, and the legions of the never-embodied spiritual men. The followers of the rebellious and foolish genii, and the descendants of the witless seven spirits begotten by corrupt Hanas and the Spiritus, became, in course of time, the men of our planet, after having previously passed through every creation of every one of the elements. From this stage of life they have been traced by Darwin, who shows us how our highest forms have been evolved out of the lowest. Anthropology dares not follow the Kabbalist and his metaphysical flights beyond this planet, and it is doubtful if its teachers have the courage to search for the missing link in the old Kabbalistic manuscripts. Thus was set in motion the first cycle, which in its rotations downward, brought an infinitesimal part of the creative lives to our planet of mud. Arrived at the lowest point of the arc of the cycle which directly preceded life on this earth, the pure divine spark still lingering in the atom made an effort to separate itself from the astral spirit, for man was falling gradually into generation, and the fleshy coat was becoming with every action more and more dense. And now comes a mystery, a sod, a seeker which rabbi. p. 302. Simeon imparted but to very few initiates. It was enacted once every seven years during the mysteries of Samothrace, and the records of it are found self-printed on the leaves of the Tibetan sacred tree, the mysterious Kambum, and the Lamasery of the Holy Adepts. And the shoreless ocean of space radiates the central, spiritual, and invisible sun. The universe is his body, spirit and soul, and after this ideal model are framed all things. These three emanations are the three lives, the three degrees of the Gnostic Pleroma, the three Kabbalistic faces, where the Ancient of the Ancient, the Holy of the Aged, the Great and Soft, has a form and then he has no form. 
The invisible assumed a form when he called the universe into existence, says the Sohar, the Book of Splendor. The first light is his soul, the infinite, boundless, and immortal breath, under the efflux of which the universe heaves its mighty bosom, infusing intelligent life throughout creation. The second emanation condenses cometary matter and produces forms within the cosmic circle, sets the countless worlds floating in the electric space, and infuses the unintelligent, blind life principle into every form. The third, produces a whole universe of physical matter, and as it keeps gradually receding from the central divine light its brightness wanes and it becomes darkness in the bad pure matter, the gross purgations of the celestial fire of the Hermetis. When the central invisible, the Lord Ferho, saw the efforts of the divine scintilla, unwilling to be dragged lower down into the degradation of matter, to liberate itself, he permitted it to shoot out from itself a monad, over which, attached to it as by the finest thread, the divine scintilla, the soul, had to watch during its ceaseless peregrinations from one form to another. Thus the monad was shot down into the first form of matter and became encased in stone. Then, in course of time, through the combined efforts of living fire and living water, both of which shone their reflection upon the stone, the monad crept out of its prison to sunlight as a lichen. From change to change it went higher and higher, the monad, with every new transformation borrowing more of the radiance of its parent, scintilla, which approached it nearer at every transmigration. For the first cause, had willed it to proceed in this order and destined it to creep on higher until its physical form became once more the atom of dust, shaped in the image of the atom codman. Before undergoing its last earthly transformation, the external covering of the monad, from the moment of its conception as an embryo, passes in turn, once more, through the phases of the several kingdoms. N. P. 303. Its fluidic prison it assumes a vague resemblance at various periods of the gestation to plant, reptile, bird, and animal, until it becomes a human embryo. At the birth of the future man, the monad, radiating with all the glory of its immortal parent which watches it from the seventh sphere, becomes senseless. It loses all recollection of the past, and returns to consciousness but gradually, when the instinct of childhood gives way to reason and intelligence. After the separation between the life principle, astral spirit, and the body takes place, the liberated soul monad, exultingly rejoins the mother and father spirit, the radiant ogoides, and the two, merged into one, forever form, with a glory proportion to the spiritual purity of the past earth life, the atom who has completed the circle of necessity, and is free from the last vestige of his physical encasement. Henceforth, growing more and more radiant at each step of his upward progress, he mounts the shining path that ends at the point from which he started around the grand cycle. The whole Darwinian theory of natural selection is included in the first six chapters of the book of Genesis. The man of chapter 1 is radically different from the Adam of chapter 2, for the former was created male and female that is, by sexton in the image of God, while the latter, according to verse 7, was formed of the dust of the ground, and became a living soul, after the Lord God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Moreover, this Adam was a male being, and in verse 20 we are told that there was not found a help meet for him. The Adonai, being pure spiritual entities, had no sex, or rather had both sexes united in themselves, like their creator, and the ancients understood this so well that they represented many of their deities as of dual sex. The biblical student must either accept this interpretation, or make the passages in the two chapters alluded to absurdly contradict each other. It was such literal acceptance of passages that warranted the atheists in covering the Mosaic account with ridicule, and it is the dead letter of the old text that begets the materialism of our age. Not only are these two races of beings thus clearly indicated in Genesis, but even a third and a fourth one are ushered before the reader in chapter 4, where the sons of God and the race of giants are spoken of. As we write, there appears in an American paper, the Kansas City Times, an account of important discoveries of the remains of a prehistorical race of giants, which corroborates the statements of the Kabbalists and the Bible allegories at the same time. It is worth preserving. p. 304. In his researches among the forests of western Missouri, Judge E.P. West has discovered a number of conical-shaped mounds, similar in construction to those found in Ohio and Kentucky. These mounds are found upon the high bluffs overlooking the Missouri River, the largest and more prominent being found in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Until about three weeks ago it was not suspected that the mound builders had made this region their home in the prehistoric days, 
but now it is discovered that this strange and extinct race once occupied this land, and have left an extensive graveyard and a number of high mounds upon the Clay County Bluffs. As yet, only one of these mounds has been opened. Judge West discovered a skeleton about two weeks ago, and made a report to other members of the society. They accompanied him to the mound, and not far from the surface excavated and took out the remains of two skeletons. The bones are very large so large, in fact, when compared with an ordinary skeleton of modern date, they appear to have formed part of a giant. The head bones, such as have not rotted away, are monstrous in size. The lower jaw of one skeleton is in a state of preservation, and is double the size of the jaw of a civilized person. The teeth in this jawbone are large, and appear to have been ground down and worn away by contact with roots and carnivorous food. The jawbone indicates immense muscular strength. The thigh bone, when compared with that of an ordinary modern skeleton, looks like that of a horse. The length, thickness, and muscular development are remarkable. But the most peculiar part about the skeleton is the frontal bone. It is very low, and differs radically from any ever seen in this section before. It forms one thick ridge of bone about one inch wide, extending across the eyes. It is a narrow but rather heavy ridge of bone which, instead of extending upward, as it does now in these days of civilization, receded back from the eyebrows, forming a flat head, and thus indicates a very low order of mankind. It is the opinion of the scientific gentlemen who are making these discoveries that these bones are the remains of a prehistoric race of men. They do not resemble the present existing race of Indians, nor are the mounds constructed upon any pattern or model known to have been in use by any race of men now in existence in America. The bodies are discovered in a sitting posture in the mounds, and among the bones are found stone weapons, such as flint knives, flint scrapers, and all of them different in shape to the arrowheads, or hatchets, and other stone tools and weapons known to have been in use by the aboriginal Indians of this land when discovered by the whites. The gentlemen who have these curious bones in charge have deposited them with Dr. Foe, on Main Street. It is their intention to make further and closer researches in the mounds on. p. 305. The Bluffs Opposite the City they will make a report of their labors at the next meeting of the Academy of Science, by which time they expect to be able to make some definite report as to their opinions. It is pretty definitely settled, however, that the skeletons are those of a race of men not now in existence. The author of a recent and very elaborate work finds some cause for merriment over the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men, who were fair, as alluded to in Genesis, and described at great length in that wonderful legend, the Book of Enoch. More is the pity, that our most learned and liberal men do not employ their close and merciless logic to repair its one-sidedness by seeking the true spirit which dictated these allegories of old. This spirit was certainly more scientific than skeptics are yet prepared to admit. But with every year some new discovery may corroborate their assertions, until the whole of antiquity is vindicated. One thing, at least, has been shown in the Hebrew text, viz., that there was one race of purely physical creatures, another purely spiritual. The evolution and transformation of species required to fill the gap between the two has been left to abler anthropologists. We can only repeat the philosophy of men of old, which says that the union of these two races produced a third the Adamite race. Sharing the natures of both its parents, it is equally adapted to an existence in the material and spiritual worlds. Allied to the physical half of man's nature is reason, which enables him to maintain his supremacy over the lower animals, and to subjugate nature to his uses. Allied to his spiritual part is his conscience, which will serve as his unerring guide through the besetments of the senses, for conscience is that instantaneous perception between right and wrong, which can only be exercised by the spirit, which, being a portion of the divine wisdom and purity, is absolutely pure and wise. Its promptings are independent of reason, and it can only manifest itself clearly, when unhampered by the baser attractions of our dual nature. Reason being a faculty of our physical brain, one which is justly defined as that of deducing inferences from premises, and being wholly dependent on the evidence of other senses, cannot be a quality pertaining directly to our divine spirit. The latter knows hence, all reasoning which implies discussion and argument would be useless. So an entity, which, if it must be considered as a direct emanation from the eternal spirit of wisdom, has to be viewed as possessed of the same tree. p. 306 Beauties as the essence or the whole of which it is a part. Therefore, it is with a certain degree of logic that the ancient theorists maintain that the rational part of man's soul, spirit, never entered wholly into the man's body, 
but only overshadowed him more or less through the irrational or astral soul, which serves as an intermediatory agent, or a medium between spirit and body. The man who has conquered matter sufficiently to receive the direct light from his shining ogoides, feels truth intuitionally, he could not err in his judgment, notwithstanding all the sophisms suggested by cold reason, for he is illuminated. Hence, prophecy, vaticination, and the so-called divine inspiration are simply the effects of this illumination from above by our own immortal spirit. Swedenborg, following the mystical doctrines of the hermetic philosophers, devoted a number of volumes to the elucidation of the internal sense of Genesis. Swedenborg was undoubtedly a natural-born magician, a seer, he was not an adept. Thus, however closely he may have followed the apparent method of interpretation used by the alchemists and mystic writers, he partially failed, the more so, that the model chosen by him in this method was one who, albeit a great alchemist, was no more of an adept than the Swedish seer himself, in the fullest sense of the word. Eugenius Philolethes had never attained the highest pyrotechny, to use the diction of the mystic philosophers. But, although both have missed the whole truth in its details, Swedenborg has virtually given the same interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis as the Hermetic philosophers. The seer, as well as the initiates, notwithstanding their veiled phraseology, clearly show that the first chapters of Genesis relate to the regeneration, or new birth of man, not to the creation of our universe and its crown workmen. The fact that the terms of the alchemists, such as salt, sulfur, and mercury are transformed by Swedenborg into ends, cause, and effect, does not affect the underlying idea of solving the problems of the mosaic books by the only possible method that used by the hermetists that of correspondences. His doctrine of correspondence, or hermetic symbolism, is that of Pythagoras and of the Kabbalists as above, so below. It is also that of the Buddhist philosophers, who, in their still more abstract metaphysics, inverting the usual mode of definition given by our erudite scholars, call the invisible types the only reality, and everything else the effects of the causes, or visible prototype solutions. However contradictory their various elucidations of the Pentateuch may appear on their surface, every one of them tends to show that the sacred literature of every country, the Bible as much as the Vedas or the Buddhist scriptures, can only be. p. 307. Understood and thoroughly sifted by the light of Hermetic philosophy. The great sages of antiquity, those of the medieval ages, and the mystical writers of our more modern times also, were all hermetists. Whether the light of truth had illuminated them through their faculty of intuition, or as a consequence of study and regular initiation, virtually, they had accepted the method and followed the path traced to them by such men as Moses, Gautama Buddha, and Jesus. The truth, symbolized by some alchemists as dew from heaven, had descended into their hearts and they had all gathered it upon the tops of mountains, after having spread clean linen cloths to receive it, and thus, in one sense, they had secured, each for himself, and in his own way, the universal solvent. How much they were allowed to share it with the public is another question. That veil, which is alleged to have covered the face of Moses, when, after descending from Sinai, he taught his people the word of God, cannot be withdrawn at the will of the teacher only. It depends on the listeners, whether they will also remove the veil which is upon their hearts. Paul says it plainly, and his words addressed to the Corinthians can be applied to every man or woman, and of any age in the history of the world. If their minds are blinded by the shining skin of divine truth, whether the hermetic veil be withdrawn or not from the face of the teacher, it cannot be taken away from their heart unless it shall turn to the Lord. But the latter appellation must not be applied to either of the three anthropomorphized personages of the Trinity, but to the Lord as understood by Swedenborg and the Hermetic philosophers the Lord, who is life and man. The everlasting conflict between the world religions Christianity, Judaism, Brahmanism, Paganism, Buddhism, proceeds from this one source, truth is known but to the few, the rest, unwilling to withdraw the veil from their own hearts, imagine it blinding the eyes of their neighbor. The god of every exoteric religion, including Christianity, notwithstanding its pretensions to mystery, is an idol, a fiction and cannot be anything else. Moses, closely veiled, speaks to the stiff-necked multitudes of Jehovah, the cruel, anthropomorphic deity, as of the highest God, bearing deep in the bottom of his heart that truth which cannot be either spoken of or revealed. Kapila cuts with the sharp sword of his sarcasms the Braham Yagans, who in their mystical visions pretend to see the highest one. Gautama Buddha conceals, under an impenetrable cloak of metaphysical subtleties, the verity, 
and is regarded by posterity as an atheist. Pythagoras, with his allegorical mysticism and metempsychosis, is held for a clever impostor, and is succeeded in the same estimation by other philosophers, like Apollonius and Plotinus, who are generally spoken of as visionaries, if not charlatans. Plato, whose writings. p. 308. Were never read by the majority of our great scholars but superficially, is accused by many of his translators of absurdities and puerilities, and even of being ignorant of his own language, most likely for saying, in reference to the Supreme, that a matter of that kind cannot be expressed by words, like other things to be learned, and making Protagoras lay too much stress on the use of veils. We could fill a whole volume with names of misunderstood sages, whose writings only because our materialistic critics feel unable to lift the veil, which shrouds them pass off in a current way for mystical absurdities. The most important feature of this seemingly incomprehensible mystery lies perhaps in the inveterate habit of the majority of readers to judge a work by its words and insufficiently expressed ideas, leaving the spirit of it out of the question. Philosophers of quite different schools may be often found to use a multitude of different expressions, some dark and metaphorical all figurative, and yet treating of the same subject. Like the thousand divergent rays of a globe of fire, every ray leads, nevertheless, to the central point, so every mystic philosopher, whether he be a devotedly pious enthusiast like Henry Moore, an irascible alchemist, using a Billingsgate phraseology like his adversary, Eugenius Philolethes, or an atheist, like Spinoza, all had one and the same object in view man. It is Spinoza, however, who furnishes perhaps the truest key to a portion of this unwritten secret. While Moses forbids graven images of him whose name is not to be taken in vain, Spinoza goes farther. He clearly infers that God must not be so much as described. Human language is totally unfit to give an idea of this being who is altogether unique. Whether it is Spinoza or the Christian theology that is more right in their premises and conclusion, we leave the reader to judge for himself. Every attempt to the contrary leads a nation to anthropomorphize the deity in whom it believes, and the result is that given by Swedenborg. Instead of stating that God made man after his own image, we ought in truth to say that man imagines God after his image, forgetting that he has set up his own reflection for worship. Where, then, lies the true, real secret so much talked about by the Hermetists? That there was and there is a secret, no candid student of esoteric literature will ever doubt. Men of Ganesha's many of the Hermetic philosophers undeniably were would not have made fools of themselves by trying to fool others for several thousand consecutive years. That this great secret, commonly termed the Philosopher's Stone, had a spiritual as well as a physical meaning attached to it, was suspected in all ages. The author of Remarks on Alchemy and the Alchemist very truly, p. 309, observes that the subject of the hermetic art is man, and the object of the art is the perfection of man. But we cannot agree with him that only those whom he terms money-loving sods, ever attempted to carry a purely moral design, of the alchemists, into the field of physical science. The fact alone that man, in their eyes, is a trinity, which they divide into sol, water of mercury, and sulfur, which is the secret fire, or, to speak plain, into body, soul, and spirit, shows that there is a physical side to the question. Man is the philosopher's stone spiritually a trine or trinity in unity, as Philolethes expresses it. But he is also that stone physically. The latter is but the effect of the cause, and the cause is the universal solvent of everything divine spirit. Man is a correlation of chemical-physical forces, as well as a correlation of spiritual powers. The latter react on the physical powers of man in proportion to the development of the earthly man. The work is carried to perfection according to the virtue of a body, soul, and spirit, says an alchemist, for the body would never be penetrable were it not for the spirit, nor would the spirit be permanent in its super-perfect tincture, were it not for the body, nor could these two act one upon another without the soul. For the spirit is an invisible thing, nor doth it ever appear without another garment, which garment is the soul. The philosophers by fire asserted, through their chief, Robert Flood, that sympathy is the offspring of light, and antipathy hath its beginning from darkness. Moreover, they taught, with other Kabbalists, that contrarieties in nature doth proceed from one eternal essence, or from the root of all things. Thus, the first cause is the parent source of good as well as of evil. The Creator who is not the highest God is the Father of matter, which is bad, as well as of spirit, which, emanating from the highest, invisible cause, passes through and like through a vehicle, and pervades the whole universe. It is most certain, 
remarks Robertus de Fluctibus, Robert Flood, that, as there are an infinity of visible creatures, so there is an endless variety of invisible ones, of diverse natures, in the universal machine. Through the mysterious name of God, which Moses was so desirous of him, Heovah, to hear and know, when he received from him this answer, Heovah is my everlasting name. As for the other name, it is so pure and simple that it cannot be articulated, or compounded, or truly expressed by man's voice, all the other names are wholly comprehended within it, for it contains the property as well of nullity as volunty, of privation as position, of death as life, of cursing as blessing, of evil as good, though nothing ideally is bad in. p. 310. Him, of hatred and discord, and consequently of sympathy and antipathy. Lowest in the scale of being are those invisible creatures called by the Kabbalists the elementary. There are three distinct classes of these. The highest, in intelligence and cunning, are the so-called terrestrial spirits, of which we will speak more categorically in other parts of this work. Suffice to say, for the present, that they are the larvae, or shadows of those who have lived on earth, have refused all spiritual light, remain and die deeply immersed in the mire of matter, and from whose sinful souls the immortal spirit has gradually separated. The second class is composed of the invisible antitypes of the men to be born. No form can come into objective existence from the highest to the lowest before the abstract ideal of this form or, as Aristotle would call it, the privation of this form is called forth. Before an artist paints a picture every feature of it exists already in his imagination, to have enabled us to discern a watch, this particular watch must have existed in its abstract form in the watchmaker's mind. So with future men. According to Aristotle's doctrine, there are three principles of natural bodies, privation, matter, and form. These principles may be applied in this particular case. The privation of the child which is to be we will locate in the invisible mind of the great architect of the universe privation not being considered in the Aristotelic philosophy as a principle in the composition of bodies, but as an external property in their production, for the production is a change by which the matter passes from the shape it has not to that which it assumes. Though the privation of the unborn child's form, as well as of the future form of the unmade watch, is that which is neither substance nor extension nor quality as yet, nor any kind of existence, it is still something which is, though its outlines, in order to be, must acquire an objective form the abstract must become concrete, in short. Thus, as soon as this privation of matter is transmitted by energy to universal ether, it becomes a material form, however sublimated. If modern science teaches that human thought affects the matter of another universe simultaneously with this, how can he who believes in an intelligent first cause, deny that the divine thought is equally transmitted, by the same law of energy, to our common mediator, the universal ether the world soul? And, if so, then it must follow that once there the divine thought manifests itself objectively, energy faithfully reproducing the outlines of that whose privation was first born in the divine mind. Only it must not be understood that this thought creates matter. No, it creates but the design for the future form, the p. 311. Matter which serves to make this design having always been in existence, and having been prepared to form a human body, through a series of progressive transformations, as the result of evolution, forms pass, ideas that created them and the material which gave them objectiveness, remain. These models, as yet devoid of immortal spirits, are elementals, properly speaking, psychic embryos which, when their time arrives, die out of the invisible world and are born into this visible one as human infants, receiving in transit to that divine breath called spirit which completes the perfect man. This class cannot communicate objectively with men. The third class are the elementals proper, which never evolve into human beings, but occupy, as it were, a specific step of the ladder of being, and, by comparison with the others, may properly be called nature spirits, or cosmic agents of nature, each being confined to its own element and never transgressing the bounds of others. These are what Tertullian called the princes of the powers of the air. This class is believed to possess but one of the three attributes of man. They have neither immortal spirits nor tangible bodies, only astral forms, which partake, in a distinguishing degree, of the element to which they belong and also of the ether. They are a combination of sublimated matter and a rudimental mind. Some are changeless but still have no separate individuality, acting collectively, so to say. Others, of certain elements and species, change form under a fixed law which Kabbalists explain. 
The most solid of their bodies is ordinarily just immaterial enough to escape perception by our physical eyesight, but not so unsubstantial but that they can be perfectly recognized by the inner, or clairvoyant vision. They not only exist and can all live in ether, but can handle and direct it for the production of physical effects, as readily as we can compress air or water for the same purpose by pneumatic and hydraulic apparatus, in which occupation they are readily helped by the human elementary. More than this, they can so condense it as to make to themselves tangible bodies, which by their protean powers they can cause to assume such likeness as they choose, by taking as their models the portraits they find stamped in the memory of the persons present. It is not necessary that the sitter should be thinking at the moment of the one represented. His image may have faded many years before. The mind receives indelible impression even from chance acquaintance or persons encountered but once. As a few seconds exposure of the sensitized photograph plate is all that is requisite to preserve indefinitely the image of the sitter, so is it with the mind. According to the doctrine of Proclus, the uppermost regions from the zenith of the universe to the moon belong to the gods or planetary. p. 312. Spirits, according to their hierarchies and classes. The highest among them were the twelve Uper Aranui, or super celestial gods, having whole legions of subordinate demons at their command. They are followed next in rank and power by the Ecosmiui, the intercosmic gods, each of these presiding over a great number of demons, to whom they impart their power and change it from one to another at will. These are evidently the personified forces of nature and their mutual correlation, the latter being represented by the third class or the elementals we have just described. Further on he shows, on the principle of the hermetic axiom of types, in prototypes that the lower spheres have their subdivisions and classes of beings as well as the upper celestial ones, the former being always subordinate to the higher ones. He held that the four elements are all filled with demons, maintaining with Aristotle that the universe is full, and that there is no void in nature. The demons of the earth, air, fire, and water are of an elastic, ethereal, semi-corporeal essence. It is these classes which officiate as intermediate agents between the gods and men. Although lower in intelligence than the sixth order of the higher demons, these beings preside directly over the elements in organic life. They direct the growth, the inflorescence, the properties, and various changes of plants. They are the personified ideas or virtues shed from the heavenly ule into the inorganic matter, and, as the vegetable kingdom is one remove higher than the mineral, these emanations from the celestial gods take form and being in the plant, they become its soul. It is that which Aristotle's doctrine terms the form in the three principles of natural bodies, classified by him as privation, matter, and form. His philosophy teaches that besides the original matter, another principle is necessary to complete the trying nature of every particle, and this is form, an invisible, but still, in an ontological sense of the word, a substantial being, really distinct from matter proper. Thus, in an animal or a plant, besides the bones, the flesh, the nerves, the brains, and the blood, and the former, and besides the pulpy matter, tissues, fibers, and juice in the latter, which blood and juice, by circulating through the veins and fibers, nourishes all parts of both animal and plant, and besides the animal spirits, which are the principles of motion, and the chemical energy which is transformed into vital force in the green leaf, there must be a substantial form, which Aristotle called in the horse, the horse's soul, Proclus, the demon of every mineral, plant, or animal, and the medieval philosophers, the elementary spirits of the four kingdoms. All this is held in our century as metaphysics and gross superstition. Still, on strictly ontological principles, there is, in these old hypotheses, some shadow of probability, some clue to the perplexing missing links. p. 313. Of exact science. The latter has become so dogmatical of late, that all that lies beyond the ken of inductive science is termed imaginary, and we find Professor Joseph Lacondi stating that some of the best scientists ridicule the use of the term vital force, or vitality, as a remnant of superstition. The condole suggests the term vital movement, instead of vital force, thus preparing for a final scientific leap which will transform the immortal, thinking man, into an automaton with a clockwork inside him. But, objects Lacondi, can we conceive of movement without force? And if the movement is peculiar, so also is the form of force. In the Jewish Kabbalah, the nature spirits were known under the general name of Shadim and divided into four classes. The Persians called them all devs, the Greeks, indistinctly designated them as demons, the Egyptians knew them as Ephrites. The ancient Mexicans, 
says Kaiser, believed in numerous spirit abodes, into one of which the shades of innocent children were placed until final disposal, into another, situated in the sun, ascended the valiant souls of heroes, while the hideous specters of incorrigible sinners were sentenced to wander in despair in subterranean caves, held in the bonds of the earth atmosphere, unwilling and unable to liberate themselves. They passed their time in communicating with mortals, and frightening those who could see them. Some of the African tribes know them as Yahoos. In the Indian pantheon there are no less than 330 million of various kinds of spirits, including elementals, which latter were termed by the Brahmins the Daitias. These beings are known by the adepts to be attracted toward certain quarters of the heavens by something of the same mysterious property which makes the magnetic needle turn toward the north, and certain plants to obey the same attraction. The various races are also believed to have a special sympathy with certain human temperaments, and to more readily exert power over such than others. Thus, a bilious, lymphatic, nervous, or sanguine person would be affected favorably or otherwise by conditions of the astral light, resulting from the different aspects of the planetary bodies. Having reached this general principle, after recorded observations extending over an indefinite series of years, or ages, the adept astrologer would require only to know what the planetary aspects were at a given anterior date, and to apply his knowledge of the succeeding changes in the heavenly bodies, to be able to trace, with approximate accuracy, the varying fortunes of the personage whose horoscope was required, and even to predict the future. The Accuracy of the Horoscope p. 314 Would depend, of course, no less upon the astrologer's knowledge of the occult forces and races of nature, than upon his astronomical erudition. Eliphas Levi expounds with reasonable clearness, in his Doma et Rituel de la Old Magi, the law of reciprocal influences between the planets and their combined effect upon the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms, as well as upon ourselves. He states that the astral atmosphere is as constantly changing from day to day, and from hour to hour, as the air we breathe. He quotes approvingly the doctrine of Paracelsus that every man, animal, and plant bears external and internal evidences of the influences dominant at the moment of germinal development. He repeats the old Kabbalistic doctrine, that nothing is unimportant in nature, and that even so small a thing as the birth of one child upon our insignificant planet has its effect upon the universe, as the whole universe has its own reactive influence upon him. The stars, he remarks, are linked to each other by attractions which hold them in equilibrium and cause them to move with regularity through space. This network of light stretches from all the spheres to all the spheres, and there is not a point upon any planet to which is not attached one of these indestructible threads. The precise locality, as well as the hour of birth, should then be calculated by the true adept in astrology, then, when he shall have made the exact calculation of the astral influences, it remains for him to count the chances of his position in life, the helps or hindrances he is likely to encounter, and his natural impulses toward the accomplishment of his destiny. He also asserts that the individual force of the person, as indicating his ability to conquer difficulties and subdue unfavorable propensities, and so carve out his fortune, or to passively await what blind fate may bring, must be taken into account. A consideration of the subject from the standpoint of the ancients, affords us, it will be seen, a very different view from that taken by Professor Tyndall in his famous Belfast address. To supersensual beings, says he, which, however potent and invisible, were nothing but species of human creatures, perhaps raised from among mankind, and retaining all human passions and appetites, were handed over the rule and governance of natural phenomena. To enforce his point, Mr. Tyndall conveniently quotes from Euripides the familiar passage in Hume, the gods toss all into confusion, mix everything with its reverse, that all of us, from our ignorance and uncertainty, may pay them the more worship and reverence. Although enunciating in Chrysippus several Pythagorean doctrines, Euripides is considered by every ancient writer as heterodox, therefore the quotation. p. 315. Proceeding from this philosopher does not at all strengthen Mr. Tyndall's argument. As to the human spirit, the notions of the older philosophers and medieval Kabbalists while differing in some particulars, agreed on the whole, so that the doctrine of one may be viewed as the doctrine of the other. The most substantial difference consisted in the location of the immortal or divine spirit of man. While the ancient Neoplatonists held that the Agoites never descends hypostatically into the living man, but only sheds more or less its radiance on the inner Monta astral soul the Kabbalists of the Middle Ages maintained that the spirit, detaching itself from the ocean of light and spirit, entered into man's soul, 
where it remained through life imprisoned in the astral capsule. This difference was the result of the belief of Christian Kabbalists, more or less, in the dead letter of the allegory of the fall of man. The soul, they said, became, through the fall of Adam, contaminated with the world of matter, or Satan. Before it could appear with its enclosed divine spirit in the presence of the Eternal, it had to purify itself of the impurities of darkness. They compared the spirit imprisoned within the soul to a drop of water enclosed within a capsule of gelatin and thrown in the ocean, so long as the capsule remains whole the drop of water remains isolated, break the envelope and the drop becomes a part of the ocean its individual existence has ceased. So it is with the spirit. As long as it is enclosed in its plastic mediator, or soul, it has an individual existence. Destroy the capsule, a result which may occur from the agonies of withered conscience, crime, and moral disease, and the spirit returns back to its original abode. Its individuality is gone. On the other hand, the philosophers who explain the fall into generation in their own way, viewed spirit as something wholly distinct from the soul. They allowed its presence in the astral capsule only so far as the spiritual emanations or rays of the shining one were concerned. Man and soul had to conquer their immortality by ascending toward the unity with which, if successful, they were finally linked, and into which they were absorbed, so to say. The individualization of man after death depended on the spirit, not on his soul and body. Although the word personality, in the sense in which it is usually understood, is an absurdity, if applied literally to our immortal essence, still the latter is a distinct entity, immortal and eternal, per se, and, as in the case of criminals beyond redemption, when the shining thread which links the spirit to the soul, from the moment of the birth of a child, is violently snapped, and the disembodied entity is left to share the fate of the lower animals, to gradually dissolve into ether, and have its individuality annihilated even then the spirit remains a distinct being. It becomes a p. 316. Planetary spirit, an angel, for the gods of the pagan are the archangels of the Christian, the direct emanations of the first cause, notwithstanding the hazardous statement of Svedenborg, never were or will be men, on our planet, at least. This specialization has been in all ages the stumbling block of metaphysicians. The whole esotericism of the Buddhistical philosophy is based on this mysterious teaching, understood by so few persons and so totally misrepresented by many of the most learned scholars. Even metaphysicians are too inclined to confound the effect of the cause. A person may have won his immortal life, and remain the same inner self he was on earth, throughout eternity, but this does not imply necessarily that he must either remain the Mr. Smith or Brown he was on earth, or lose his individuality. Therefore, the astral soul and terrestrial body of man may, in the dark hereafter, be absorbed into the cosmical ocean of sublimated elements and cease to feel his ego, if this ego did not deserve to soar higher, and the divine spirit still remain an unchanged entity, though this terrestrial experience of his emanations may be totally obliterated at the instant of separation from the unworthy vehicle. If the spirit, or the divine portion of the soul, is pre-existent as a distinct being from all eternity, as Origen, Synesius, and other Christian fathers and philosophers taught, and if it is the same, and nothing more than the metaphysically objective soul, how can it be otherwise than eternal? And what matters it in such a case, whether man leads an animal or a pure life, if, do what he may, he can never lose his individuality? This doctrine is as pernicious in its consequences as that of vicarious atonement. Had the latter dogma, in company with the false idea that we are all mortal, been demonstrated to the world in its true light, humanity would have been bettered by its propagation. Crime and sin would be avoided, not for fear of earthly punishment, or of a ridiculous hell, but for the sake of that which lies the most deeply rooted in our inner nature the desire of an individual and distinct life in the hereafter, the positive assurance that we cannot win it unless we take the kingdom of heaven by violence, and the conviction that neither human prayers nor the blood of another man will save us from individual destruction after death, unless we firmly link ourselves during our terrestrial life with our own immortal spirit our God. Pythagoras, Plato, Timaeus of Locris, and the whole Alexandrian school derived the soul from the universal world soul, and the latter was, according to their own teachings ether, something of such a fine nature as to be perceived only by our inner sight. Therefore, it cannot be the essence of the monas, or cause, because the animal mundi is but the effect, the objective emanation of the former. Both the human spirit, p. 317, and soul are pre-existent. But, while the former exists as a distinct entity, in individualization, 
The soul exists as pre-existing matter, an unscient portion of an intelligent whole. Both were originally formed from the eternal ocean of light, but as the theosophists expressed it, there is a visible as well as invisible spirit and fire. They made a difference between the anima bruta and the anima divina. Empedocles firmly believed all men and animals to possess two souls, and in Aristotle we find that he calls one the reasoning soul nu omicron upsilon sigma, and the other, the animal soul psi upsilon chi epsilon. According to these philosophers, the reasoning soul comes from without the universal soul, and the other from within. This divine and superior region, in which they located the invisible and supreme deity, was considered by them, by Aristotle himself, as a fifth element, purely spiritual and divine, whereas the animal mundi proper was considered as composed of a fine, igneous, and ethereal nature spread throughout the universe, in short ether. The Stoics, the greatest materialists of ancient days, accepted the invisible God and divine soul, spirit, from any such a corporeal nature. Their modern commentators and admirers, greedily seizing the opportunity, build on this ground the supposition that the Stoics believed in neither God nor soul. But Epicurus, whose doctrine militating directly against the agency of a supreme being and gods, and the formation or government of the world, placed him far above the Stoics in atheism and materialism, taught, nevertheless, that the soul is of a fine, tender essence, formed from the smoothest, roundest, and finest atoms, which description still brings us to the same sublimated ether. Arnobius, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Origen, notwithstanding their Christianity, believed, with the more modern Spinoza and Hobbes, that the soul was corporeal, though of a very fine nature. This doctrine of the possibility of losing one soul and, hence, individuality, militates with the ideal theories and progressive ideas of some spiritualists, though Swedenborg fully adopts it. They will never accept the Kabbalistic doctrine which teaches that it is only through observing the law of harmony that individual life hereafter can be obtained and that the farther the inner and outer man deviate from this fount of harmony, whose source lies in our divine spirit, the more difficult it is to regain the ground. But while the spiritualists and other adherents of Christianity have little if any perception of this fact of the possible death and obliteration of the human personality by the separation of the immortal part from the perishable, the Swedenborgians fully comprehend it. One of the most respected ministers of the new church, the Rev. Chauncey Giles, D.D., of New York, recently elucidated the subject in a public discourse as follows, physical death, or the death of the body, was a provision of the p. 318. Divine economy for the benefit of man, a provision by means of which he attained the higher ends of his being. But there is another death which is the interruption of the divine order and the destruction of every human element in man's nature, and every possibility of human happiness. This is the spiritual death, which takes place before the dissolution of the body, there may be a vast development of man's natural mind without that development being accompanied by a particle of love of God, or of unselfish love of man. When one falls into a love of self and love of the world, with its pleasures, losing the divine love of God and of the neighbor, he falls from life to death. The higher principles which constitute the essential elements of his humanity perish, and he lives only on the natural plane of his faculties. Physically he exists, spiritually he is dead. To all that pertain to the higher and the only enduring phase of existence he is as much dead as his body becomes dead to all the activities, delights, and sensations of the world when the spirit has left it. This spiritual death results from disobedience of the laws of spiritual life, which is followed by the same penalty as the disobedience of the laws of the natural life. But the spiritually dead have still their delights, they have their intellectual endowments and power, and intense activities. All the animal delights are theirs and to multitudes of men and women these constitute the highest ideal of human happiness. The tireless pursuit of riches, of the amusements and entertainments of social life, the cultivation of graces of manner, of taste and dress, of social preferment, of scientific distinction, intoxicate and enrapture these dead alive, but, the eloquent preacher remarks, these creatures, with all their graces, rich attire, and brilliant accomplishments, are dead in the eye of the Lord and the angels, and when measured by the only true and immutable standard have no more genuine life than skeletons whose flesh has turned to dust. A high development of the intellectual faculties does not imply spiritual and true life. Many of our greatest scientists are but animate corpses they have no spiritual sight because their spirits have left them. So we might go through all ages, examine all occupations, weigh all human attainments, and investigate all forms of society, 
and we would find these spiritually dead everywhere. Pythagoras taught that the entire universe is one vast system of mathematically correct combinations. Plato shows the deity geometrizing. The world is sustained by the same law of equilibrium and harmony upon which it was built. The centripetal force could not manifest itself without the centrifugal and the harmonious revolutions of the spheres. All forms are the product of this dual force in nature. Thus, to illustrate our case, we may designate the spirit as the centrifugal, and the soul as the centripetal, spiritual energies. When in perfect harmony, both forces. P. 319. Produce one result, break or damage the centripetal motion of the earthly soul tending toward the center which attracts it, rest its progress by clogging it with a heavier weight of matter than it can bear, and the harmony of the whole, which was its life, is destroyed. Individual life can only be continued if sustained by this twofold force. The least deviation from harmony damages it, when it is destroyed beyond redemption the force is separate and the form is gradually annihilated. After the death of the depraved and the wicked, arrives the critical moment. If during life the ultimate and desperate effort of the inner self to reunite itself with the faintly glimmering ray of its divine parent is neglected, if this ray is allowed to be more and more shut out by the thickening crust of matter, the soul, once freed from the body, follows its earthly attractions, and is magnetically drawn into and held within the dense fogs of the material atmosphere. Then it begins to sink lower and lower, until it finds itself, when returned to consciousness, in what the ancients termed Hades. The annihilation of such a soul is never instantaneous, it may last centuries, perhaps, for nature never proceeds by jumps and starts and the astral soul being formed of elements, the law of evolution must bide its time. Then begins the fearful law of compensation, the yin yuan of the Buddhists. This class of spirits are called the terrestrial or earthly elementary, in contradistinction to the other classes, as we have shown in the introductory chapter. In the east they are known as the brothers of the shadow. Cunning, low, vindictive, and seeking to retaliate their sufferings upon humanity, they become, until final annihilation vampires, ghouls, and prominent actors. These are the leading stars on the great spiritual stage of materialization, which phenomena they perform with the help of the more intelligent of the genuine-born elemental creatures, which hover around and welcome them with delight in their own spheres. Henry Conrath, the great German Kabbalist, has on a plate of his rare work, Amphitheatri Sapientiae Eternae, representations of the four classes of these human elementary spirits. Once past the threshold of the sanctuary of initiation, once that an adept has lifted the veil of Isis, the mysterious and jealous goddess, he is nothing to fear, but till then he is in constant danger. Although Aristotle himself, anticipating the modern physiologists, regarded the human mind as a material substance, and ridiculed the hylozoist, nevertheless he fully believed in the existence of a double soul, or spirit and soul. He laughed at Strabo for believing that any particles of matter, per se, could have life and intellect in themselves soof. p. 320. Fish into fashion by degree such a multiform world as ours. Aristotle is indebted for the sublime morality of his Nicomachean ethics to a thorough study of the Pythagoric ethical fragments, for the latter can be easily shown to have been the source at which he gathered his ideas, though he might not have sworn by him who the Tetrictes found. Finally, what do we know so certain about Aristotle? His philosophy is so abstruse that he constantly leaves his reader to supply by the imagination the missing links of his logical deductions. Moreover, we know that before his works ever reached our scholars, who delight in his seemingly atheistical arguments in support of his doctrine of fate, these works passed through too many hands to have remained immaculate. From Theophrastus, his legator, they passed to Neleus, whose heirs kept them moldering in subterranean caves for nearly 150 years, after which, we learn that his manuscripts were copied and much augmented by a pelican of Theos, who supplied such paragraphs as had become illegible, by conjectures of his own, probably many of these drawn from the depths of his inner consciousness. Our scholars of the 19th century might certainly profit well by Aristotle's example, were they as anxious to imitate him practically as they are to throw his inductive method and materialistic theories at the head of the Platonists. We invite them to collect facts as carefully as he did, instead of denying those they know nothing about. What we have said in the introductory chapter and elsewhere, of mediums and the tendency of their mediumship, is not based upon conjecture, but upon actual experience and observation. There is scarcely one phase of mediumship, of either kind, that we have not seen exemplified during the past 25 years, in various countries. 
India, Tibet, Borneo, Siam, Egypt, Asia Minor, America, North and South, and other parts of the world, have each displayed to us its peculiar phase of media mystic phenomena and magical power. Our very experience has taught us two important truths, viz., that for the exercise of the latter personal purity and the exercise of retrained and indomitable willpower are indispensable, and that spiritualists can never assure themselves of the genuineness of mediumistic manifestations, unless they occur in the light and under such reasonable test conditions as would make an attempted fraud instantly noticed. For fear of being misunderstood, we would remark that while, as a rule, physical phenomena are produced by the nature spirits, of their own. p. 321. Motion and to please their own fancy, still good disembodied human spirits, under exceptional circumstances, such as the aspiration of a pure heart or the occurrence of some favoring emergency, can manifest their presence by any of the phenomena except personal materialization. But it must be a mighty attraction indeed to draw a pure, disembodied spirit from its radiant home into the foul atmosphere from which it escaped upon leaving its earthly body. Magi and theurgic philosophers objected most severely to the evocation of souls. Bring her, the soul, not forth, lest in departing she retain something, says Celis. It becomes you not to behold them before your body is initiated. Since, by always alluring, they seduce the souls of the uninitiated. Says the same philosopher, in another passage. They objected to it for several good reasons. 1. It is extremely difficult to distinguish a good demon from a bad one, says Iamblichus. 2. If a human soul succeeds in penetrating the density of the earth's atmosphere always oppressive to her, often hateful still there is a danger the soul is unable to come into proximity with the material world without that she cannot avoid, departing, she retains something, that is to say, contaminating her purity, for which she has to suffer more or less after her departure. Therefore, the true theurgists will avoid causing any more suffering to this pure denizen of the higher sphere than is absolutely required by the interests of humanity. It is only the practitioner of black magic who compels the presence, by the powerful incantations of necromancy, of the tainted souls of such as have lived bad lives, and are ready to aid his selfish designs. Of intercourse with the Ogolides, through the mediumistic powers of subjective mediums, we elsewhere speak. The theurgists employed chemicals and mineral substances to chase away evil spirits. Of the latter, a stone called mu nu iota zeta omicron upsilon rho iota nu was one of the most powerful agents. When you shall see a terrestrial demon approaching, exclaim, and sacrifice the stone in his urn, exclaims the Zoroastrian oracle, Sol, 40. And now, to descend from the eminence of theurgico magian poetry to the unconscious magic of our present century, in the prose of a modern Kabbalist, we will review it in the following. In Dr. Morin's journal The Magnetize, published a few years since in p. 322. Paris, at a time when the table turning was raging in France, a curious letter was published. Believe me, sir, wrote the anonymous correspondent, that there are no spirits, no ghosts, no angels, no demons enclosed in a table, but, all of these can be found there. Nevertheless, for that depends on our own wills and our imaginations. This mentibulism is an ancient phenomenon, misunderstood by us moderns, but natural, for all that, in which pertains to physics and psychology. Unfortunately, it had to remain incomprehensible until the discovery of electricity and heliography, as, to explain a fact of spiritual nature, we are obliged to base ourselves on a corresponding fact of a material order. As we all know, the daguerreotype plate may be impressed not only by objects, but also by their reflections. Well, the phenomenon in question, which ought to be named mental photography, produces, besides realities, the dreams of our imagination, with such a fidelity that very often we become unable to distinguish a copy taken from one present, from a negative obtained of an image. The magnetization of a table or of a person is absolutely identical in its results. It is the saturation of a foreign body by either the intelligent vital electricity, or the thought of the magnetizer and those present. Nothing can give a better or a more just idea of it than the electric battery gathering the fluid on its conductor, to obtain thereof a brute force which manifests itself in sparks of light, etc. Thus, the electricity accumulated on an isolated body acquires a power of reaction equal to the action, either for charging, magnetizing, decomposing, inflaming, or for discharging its vibrations far away.
These are the visible effects of the blind, or crude electricity produced by blind elements the word blind being used by the table itself in contradistinction to the intelligent electricity. But there evidently exists a corresponding electricity produced by the cerebral pile of man, this soul electricity, this spiritual and universal ether, which is the ambient, middle nature of the metaphysical universe, or rather of the incorporeal universe, has to be studied before it is admitted by science, which, having no idea of it, will never know anything of the great phenomenon of life until she does. It appears that to manifest itself the cerebral electricity requires the help of the ordinary statical electricity, when the latter is lacking in the atmosphere when the air is very damp, for instance you can get little or nothing of either tables or mediums. There is no need for the ideas to be formulated very precisely in the p. 323. Brains of the persons present, the table discovers and formulates them itself, in either prose or verse, but always correctly, the table requires time to compose a verse, it begins, then it erases a word, corrects it, and sometimes sends back the epigram to our address, if the persons present are in sympathy with each other, it jokes and laughs with us as any living person could. As to the things of the exterior world, it has to content itself with conjectures, as well as ourselves, it, the table, composes little philosophical systems, discusses and maintains them as the most cunning rhetorician might. In short, it creates itself a conscience and a reason properly belonging to itself, but with the materials it finds in us. The Americans are persuaded that they talk with their dead, some think, more truly, that these are spirits, others take them for angels, others again for devils, the intelligence, assuming the shape which fits the conviction and preconceived opinion of every one, so did the initiates of the temples of Serapis, of Delphi, and other theurgico-medical establishments of the same kind. They were convinced beforehand that they would communicate with their gods, and they never failed. We, who well know the value of the phenomenon, are perfectly sure that after having charged the table with our magnetic efflux, we have called to life, or created an intelligence analogous to our own, which like ourselves is endowed with a free will, can talk and discuss with us, with a degree of superior lucidity, considering that the resultant is stronger than the individual, or rather the whole is larger than a part of it. We must not accuse Herodotus of telling us fibs when he records the most extraordinary circumstances, for we must hold them to be as true and correct as the rest of historical facts which are to be found in all the pagan writers of antiquity. The phenomenon is as old as the world. The priests of India and China practice it before the Egyptians and the Greeks. The savages and the Eskimo know it well. It is the phenomenon of faith, sole source of every prodigy, and it will be done to you according to your faith. The one who enunciated this profound doctrine was verily the incarnated word of truth, he neither deceived himself, nor wanted to deceive others, he expounded an axiom which we now repeat, without much hope of seeing it accepted. Man is a microcosm, or a little world, he carries in him a fragment of the great all, in a chaotic state. The task of our half-gods is to disentangle from it the share belonging to them by an incessant mental and material labor. They have their task to do, the perpetual invention of new products, of new moralities, and the proper arrangement of the crude and formless material furnished them by the Creator, who created. p. 324. Them in his own image, that they should create in return and so complete here the work of the creation, an immense labor which can be achieved only when the whole will become so perfect, that it will be like unto God himself, and thus able to survive to itself. We are very far yet from that final moment for we can say that everything is to be done, to be undone, and outdone as yet on our globe, institutions, machinery, and products. Mens non solum agitat sed crete molum. We live in this life, in an ambient, intellectual center, which interchanges between human beings and things a necessary and perpetual solidarity, every brain is a ganglion, a station of a universal neurological telegraphy in constant rapport with the central and other stations by the vibrations of thought. The spiritual sun shines for souls as the material sun shines for bodies, for the universe is double and follows the law of couples. The ignorant operator interprets erroneously the divine dispatches, and often delivers them in a false and ridiculous manner. Thus study and true science alone can destroy the superstitions and nonsense spread by the ignorant interpreters placed at the stations of teaching among every people in this world. These blind interpreters of the verbum, the word, have always tried to impose on their pupils the obligation to swear to everything without examination and verba magistry. Alas! We could wish for nothing better were they to translate correctly the inner voices, 
which voices never deceive but those who have false spirits in them. It is our duty, they say, to interpret oracles, it is we who have received the exclusive mission for it from heaven, spirit is flat ubi vult, and it blows on us alone. It blows on every one, and the rays of the spiritual light illuminate every conscience, and when all the bodies and all the minds will reflect equally this dual light, people will see a great deal clearer than they do now. We have translated and quoted the above fragments for their great originality and truthfulness. We know the writer, fame proclaims him a great Kabbalist, and a few friends know him as a truthful and honest man. The letter shows, moreover, that the writer as well and carefully studied the chameleon-like nature of the intelligences presiding over spiritual circles. That they are of the same kind and race as those so frequently mentioned in antiquity, admits of as little doubt as that the present generation of men are of the same nature as were human beings in the days of Moses. Subjective manifestations proceed, under harmonious. p. 325. Conditions, from those beings which were known as the good demons in days of old. Sometimes, but rarely, the planetary spirits beings of another race than our own produce them, sometimes the spirits of our translated and beloved friends, sometimes nature spirits of one or more of the countless tribes, but most frequently of all terrestrial elementary spirits, disembodied evil men, the Diaco of A. Jackson Davis. We do not forget what we have elsewhere written about subjective and objective mediumistic phenomena. We keep the distinction always in mind. There are good and bad of both classes. An impure medium will attract to his impure inner self, the vicious, depraved, malignant influences as inevitably as one that is pure draws only those that are good and pure. Of the latter kind of medium where can a nobler example be found than the gentle Baroness Adelma von Ve, of Austria, born Countess Wormbrandt, who is described to us by a correspondent as the providence of her neighborhood? She uses her mediumistic power to heal the sick and comfort the afflicted. To the rich she is a phenomenon, but to the poor a ministering angel. For many years she has seen and recognized the nature spirits or cosmic elementaries, and found them always friendly. But this was because she was a pure, good woman. Other correspondents of the Theosophical Society have not fared so well at the hands of these apish and impish beings. The Havana case, elsewhere described, is an example. Though spiritualists discredit them ever so much, these nature spirits are realities. If the gnomes, sylphs, salamanders, and onions of the Rosicrucians existed in their days, they must exist now. Boar Leiden's brother of the threshold, is a modern conception, modeled on the ancient type of the Selenuth of the Hebrews and Egyptians, which is mentioned in the Book of Jasher. The Christians call them devils, imps of Satan, and like characteristic names. They are nothing of the kind, but simply creatures of ethereal matter, irresponsible, and neither good nor bad unless influenced by superior intelligence. It is very extraordinary to hear devout. p. 326. Catholics abuse and misrepresent the nature spirits, when one of their greatest authorities, Clement the Alexandrian, disposed of them, by describing these creatures as they really are. Clement, who perhaps had been a theurgist as well as a Neoplatonist, thus arguing upon good authority, remarks, that it is absurd to call them devils, for they are only inferior angels, the powers which inhabit elements, move the winds and distribute showers, and as such are agents and subject to God. Origen, who before he became a Christian also belonged to the Platonic school, is of the same opinion. Porphyry describes these demons more carefully than anyone else. When the possible nature of the manifesting intelligences, which science believes to be a psychic force, and spiritualists the identical spirits of the dead, is better known, then will academicians and believers turn to the old philosophers for information. Let us for a moment imagine an intelligent orang outing or some African anthropoid ape disembodied, i.e., deprived of its physical and in possession of an astral, if not an immortal body. We have found in spiritual journals many instances where apparitions of departed pet dogs and other animals have been seen. Therefore, upon spiritualistic testimony, we must think that such animal spirits do appear although we reserve the right of concurring with the ancients that the forms are but tricks of the elementals. Once open the door of communication between the terrestrial and the spiritual world, what prevents the ape from producing physical phenomena such as he sees human spirits produce? And why may not these excel in cleverness of ingenuity many of those which have been witnessed in spiritual circles? Let spiritualists answer. The orangutan of Borneo is little, if any inferior to the savage man in intelligence. 
Mr. Wallace and other great naturalists give instances of its wonderful acuteness, although its brains are inferior in cubic capacity to the most undeveloped of savages. These apes lack but speech to be men of low grade. The sentinels placed by monkeys, the sleeping chamber selected and built by ring outings, their prevision of danger and calculations, which show more than instinct, their choice of leaders whom they obey, and the exercise of many of their faculties, certainly entitle them to a place at least on a level with many a flat-headed Australian. Says Mr. Wallace, the mental requirements of savages, and the faculties actually exercised by them, are very little above those of the animals. Now, people assume that there can be no apes in the other world, because apes have no souls. But apes have as much intelligence, it. p. 327. Appears, as some men, why, then, should these men, in no way superior to the apes, have immortal spirits, and the apes none? The materialist will answer that neither the one nor the other has a spirit, but that annihilation overtakes each at physical death. But the spiritual philosophers of all times have agreed that man occupies a step one degree higher than the animal, and is possessed of that something which it lacks, be he the most untutored of savages or the wisest of philosophers. The ancients, as we have seen, taught that while man is a trinity of body, astral spirit, and a mortal soul, the animal is but a duality a being having a physical body and an astral spirit animating it. Scientists can distinguish no difference in the elements composing the bodies of men and brutes, and the Kabbalists agree with them so far as to say that the astral bodies, or, as the physicists would call it, the life principle, of animals and men are identical in essence. Physical man is but the highest development of animal life. If, as the scientists tell us, even thought is matter, in every sensation of pain or pleasure, every transient desire is accompanied by a disturbance of ether, and those bold speculators, the authors of the unseen universe believe that thought is conceived to affect the matter of another universe simultaneously with this, why, then, should not the gross, brutish thought of an orangutan, or a dog, impressing itself on the ethereal waves of the astral light, as well as that of man, assure the animal a continuity of life after death, or a future state? The Kabbalists held, and now hold, that it is unphilosophical to admit that the astral body of man can survive corporeal death, and at the same time assert that the astral body of the ape is resolved into independent molecules. That which survives as an individuality after the death of the body is the astral soul, which Plato, in the Timaeus and Gorgias, calls the mortal soul, for, according to the Hermetic doctrine, it throws off its more material particles at every progressive change into a higher sphere. Socrates narrates to Callicles that this mortal soul retains all the characteristics of the body after the death of the latter, so much so, indeed, that a man marked with the whip will have his astral body full of the prints and scars. The astral spirit is a faithful duplicate of the body, both in a physical and spiritual sense. The divine, the highest and immortal spirit, can be neither punished nor rewarded. To maintain such a doctrine would be at the same time absurd and blasphemous, for it is not merely a flame lit at the central and inexhaustible fountain of light, but actually a portion of it, and of identical essence. It assures immortality to the individual astral being in proportion to the willingness of the latter to receive it. So long as the double man, i.e., the man of p. 328, flesh and spirit, keeps within the limits of the law of spiritual continuity, so long as the divine spark lingers in him, however faintly, he is on the road to an immortality in the future state. But those who resign themselves to a materialistic existence, shutting out the divine radiance shed by their spirit, at the beginning of the earthly pilgrimage, and stifling the warning voice of that faithful sentry, the conscience, which serves as a focus for the light in the soul such beings as these, having left behind conscience and spirit, and crossed the boundaries of matter, will of necessity have to follow its laws. Matter is as indestructible and eternal as the immortal spirit itself but only in its particles, and not as organized forms. The body of so grossly materialistic a person as above described, having been deserted by its spirit before physical death, when that event occurs, the plastic material, astral soul, following the laws of blind matter, shapes itself thoroughly into the mold which vice has been gradually preparing for it through the earth life of the individual. Then, as Plato says, it assumes the form of that animal to which it resembled in its evil ways during life. It is an ancient saying, he tells us, that the souls departing hence exist in Hades and return hither again and are produced from the dead, but those who are found to have lived an eminently holy life, these are they who arrive at the pure abode above and dwell on the upper parts of the earth, the ethereal region.
In Phaedrus, again, he says that when man has ended his first life, on earth, some go to places of punishment beneath the earth. This region below the earth, the Kabbalists do not understand as a place inside the earth, but maintain it to be a sphere, far inferior in perfection to the earth, and far more material. Of all the modern speculators upon the seeming incongruities of the New Testament, alone the authors of the unseen universe seem to have caught a glimpse of its Kabbalistic truths, respecting the Gehenna of the universe. This Gehenna, termed by the occultists the eighth sphere, numbering inversely, is merely a planet like our own, attached to the latter and following it in its penumbra, a kind of dust hole, a place where all its garbage and filth is consumed, to borrow an expression of the above-mentioned authors, and on which all the dross and scorification of the cosmic matter pertaining to our planet is in a continual state of remodeling. The secret doctrine teaches that man, if he wins immortality, will remain forever the trinity that he is in life, and will continue so through. p. 329. Out all the spheres. The astral body, which in this life is covered by a gross physical envelope, becomes when relieved of that covering by the process of corporeal death and its turn the shell of another and more ethereal body. This begins developing from the moment of death, and becomes perfected when the astral body of the earthly form finally separates from it. This process, they say, is repeated at every new transition from sphere to sphere. But the immortal soul, the silvery spark, observed by Dr. Fennec in Margrave's brain, and not found by him in the animals, never changes, but remains indestructible by aught that shatters its tabernacle. The descriptions by Porphyry and Iamblichus and others, of the spirits of animals, which inhabit the astral light, are corroborated by those of many of the most trustworthy and intelligent clairvoyants. Sometimes the animal forms are even made visible to every person present at a spiritual circle, by being materialized. In his people from the other world, Colonel H. S. Olcott describes a materialized squirrel which followed a spirit woman into the view of the spectators, disappeared and reappeared before their eyes several times, and finally followed the spirit into the cabinet. Let us advance another step in our argument. If there is such a thing as existence in the spiritual world after corporeal death, then it must occur in accordance with the law of evolution. It takes man from his place at the apex of the pyramid of matter, and lifts him into a sphere of existence where the same inexorable law follows him. And if it follows him, why not everything else in nature? Why not animals and plants, which have all a life principle, and whose gross forms decay like his, when that life principle leaves them? If his astral body becomes more ethereal upon attaining the other sphere, why not theirs? They, as well as he, have been evolved out of condensed cosmic matter, and our physicists cannot see the slightest difference between the molecules of the four kingdoms of nature, which are thus specified by Professor Leconte. 4. Animal Kingdom 3. Vegetable Kingdom 2. Mineral Kingdom 1. Elements The progress of matter from each of these planes to the plane above is continuous, and, according to Leconte, there is no force in nature. p. 330. Capable of raising matter at once from number 1 to number 3, or from number 2 to number 4, without stopping and receiving an accession of force of a different kind on the intermediate plane. Now, will anyone presume to say that out of a given number of molecules, originally and constantly homogeneous, and all energized by the same principle of evolution, a certain number can be carried through those four kingdoms to the final result of evolving a mortal man, and the others not be allowed to progress beyond planes 1, 2, and 3? Why should not all these molecules have an equal feature before them, the mineral becoming plant, the plant, animal, and the animal, men if not upon this earth, at least somewhere in the boundless realms of space? The harmony which geometry and mathematics the only exact sciences demonstrate to be the law of the universe, would be destroyed if evolution were perfectly exemplified in man alone and limited in the subordinate kingdoms. What logic suggests, psychometry proves, and, as we said before, it is not unlikely that a monument will one day be erected by men of science to Joseph R. Buchanan, its modern discoverer. If a fragment of mineral, fossilized plant, or animal form gives the psychometer as vivid and accurate pictures of their previous conditions, as a fragment of human bone does of those of the individual to which it belonged, it would seem as if the same subtle spirit pervaded all nature, and was inseparable from organic or inorganic substances. If anthropologists, physiologists, and psychologists are equally perplexed by primal and final causes, and by finding in matter so much similarity in all its forms, but in spirit such abysses of difference, it is, perhaps, 
because their inquiries are limited to our visible globe, and that they cannot, or dare not, go beyond. The spirit of a mineral, plant, or animal, may begin to form here, and reach its final development millions of ages hereafter, on other planets, known or unknown, visible or invisible to astronomers. 4. Who is able to controvert the theory previously suggested, that the earth itself will, like the living creatures to which it has given birth, ultimately, and after passing through its own stage of death and dissolution, become an etherealized astral planet? As above, so below, harmony is the great law of nature. Harmony in the physical and mathematical world of sense, is justice in the spiritual one. Justice produces harmony, and injustice, discord, and discord, on a cosmical scale, means chaos annihilation. If there is a developed immortal spirit in man, it must be in everything else, at least in a latent or germinal state, and it can only be a question of time for each of these germs to become fully developed. What gross injustice it would be for an impenitent criminal man, the perpetrator of a brutal murder when in the exercise of his free will, to have. p. 331. All mortal spirit which in time may be washed clean of sin, and enjoying perfect happiness, while a poor horse, innocent of all crime, should toil and suffer under the merciless torture of his master's whip during a whole life, and then be annihilated at death? Such a belief implies a brutal injustice, and is only possible among people taught in the dogma that everything is created for man, and he alone is the sovereign of the universe, a sovereign so mighty that to save him from the consequences of his own misdeeds, it was not too much that the god of the universe should die to placate his own just wrath. If the most abject savage, with a brain very little inferior to that of a philosopher, the latter developed physically by ages of civilization, is still, as regards the actual exercise of his mental faculties, very little superior to an animal, is it just to infer that both he and the ape will not have the opportunity to become philosophers, the ape in this world, the man on some other planet peopled equally with beings created in some other image of God. Says Professor Denton, when speaking of the future of psychometry, astronomy will not disdain the assistance of this power. As new forms of organic being are revealed, when we go back to the earlier geologic periods, so new groupings of the stars, new constellations, will be displayed, when the heavens of those early periods are examined by the piercing gaze of future psychometers. An accurate map of the starry heavens during the Silurian period may reveal to us many secrets that we have been unable to discover. Why may we not indeed be able to read the history of the various heavenly bodies, their geological, their natural, and, perchance, their human history? I have good reason to believe that trained psychometers will be able to travel from planet to planet, and read their present condition minutely, and their past history. Herodotus tells us that in the eighth of the Towers of Belus, in Babylon, used by the sacerdotal astrologers, there was an uppermost room, a sanctuary, where the prophesying priestesses slept to receive communications from the god. Beside the couch stood a table of gold, upon which were laid various stones, which Manitha informs us were all air lights. The priestesses developed the prophetic vision in themselves by pressing one of these sacred stones against their heads and bosoms. The same took place at Thebes, and at Patara, and Lycia. This would seem to indicate that psychometry was known and extensively practiced by the ancients. We have somewhere seen it stated that. p. 332. The profound knowledge possessed, according to Draper, by the ancient Chaldean astrologers, of the planets and their relations, was obtained more by the divination of the Batilos, or the meteoric stone, than by astronomical instruments. Strabo, Pliny, Hellenicus all speak of the electrical, or electromagnetic power of the Batili. They were worshipped in the remotest antiquity in Egypt and Samothrace, as magnetic stones, containing souls which had fallen from heaven, and the priests of Sibel wore small Batilos on their bodies. How curious the coincidence between the practice of the priests of Belus and the experiments of Professor Denton. As Professor Buchanan truthfully remarks of psychometry, it will enable us, to detect vice and crime. No criminal act, can escape the detection of psychometry, when its powers are properly brought forth. The sure detection of guilt by psychometry, no matter how secret the act, will nullify all concealment. Speaking of the elementary, Porphyry says, these invisible beings have been receiving from men honors as gods. A universal belief makes them capable of becoming very malevolent. It proves that their wrath is kindled against those who neglect to offer them a legitimate worship. Homer describes them in the following terms. Our gods appear to us when we offer them sacrifice, sitting themselves at our tables, 
they partake of our festival meals. Whenever they meet on his travels a solitary Phoenician, they serve to him as guides, and otherwise manifest their presence. We can say that our piety approaches us to them as much as crime and bloodshed unite the cyclopes and the ferocious race of giants. The latter proving that these gods were kind and beneficent demons, and that, whether they were disembodied spirits or elementary beings, they were no devils. The language of Porphyry, who was himself a direct disciple of Plotinus, is still more explicit as to the nature of these spirits. Demons, he says, are invisible, but they know how to clothe themselves with forms and configurations subjected to numerous variations, which can be explained by their nature having much of the corporeal in itself. Their abode is in the neighborhood of the earth, and when they can escape the vigilance of the good demons, there is no mischief they will not dare commit. One day they will employ brute force, another, cunning. Further, he says, it is a child's play for them to arouse. p. 333. In us vile passions, to impart to societies and nations turbulent doctrines, provoking wars, seditions, and other public calamities, and then tell you that all of these is the work of the gods. These spirits pass their time in cheating and deceiving mortals, creating around them illusions and prodigies, their greatest ambition is to pass as gods and souls, disembodied spirits. Iamblichus, the great theurgist of the Neoplatonic school, a man skilled in sacred magic, teaches that good demons appear to us in reality, while the bad ones can manifest themselves but under the shadowy forms of phantoms. Further, he corroborates Porphyry, and tells that, the good ones fear not the light, while the wicked ones require darkness. The sensations they excite in us make us believe in the presence and reality of things they show, though these things be absent. Even the most practiced theurgists found danger sometimes in their dealings with certain elementaries, and we have Iambliku stating that, the gods, the angels, and the demons, as well as the souls, may be summoned through evocation and prayer. But when, during theurgic operations, a mistake is made, beware. Do not imagine that you are communicating with beneficent divinities, who have answered your earnest prayer, no, for they are bad demons, only under the guise of good ones. For the elementaries often clothe themselves with the similitude of the good, and assume a rank very much superior to that they really occupy. Their boasting betrays them. Some twenty years since, Baron du Petet, disgusted with the indifference of the scientists, who persisted in seeing in the greatest psychological phenomena only the result of clever trickery, gave vent to his indignation in the following terms. Here am I, on my way, I may truly say, to the land of marvels. I am preparing to shock every opinion, and provoke laughter in our most illustrious scientists, for I am convinced that agents of an immense potency exist outside of us, that they can enter in us, move our limbs and organs, and use us as they please. It was, after all, the belief of our fathers and of the whole of antiquity. Every religion admitted the reality of spiritual agents. Recalling innumerable phenomena which I have produced in the sight of thousands of persons, seeing the beastly indifference of official science, in presence of a discovery which transports the mind into the regions of the unknown, sick, an old man, at the very moment when I ought to be just being born. I am not. P. 334. Sure if it would not have been better for me to have shared the common ignorance. I have suffered calumnies to be written without refuting them. At one time it is simple ignorance which speaks, and I am silent, at another still, superficiality, raising its voice, makes a bluster, and I find myself hesitating whether or not to speak. Is this indifference or laziness? Has fear the power to paralyze my spirit? No, none of these causes affect me, I know simply that it is necessary to prove what one asserts, and this restrains me. For, in justifying my assertions, in showing the living fact, which proves my sincerity in the truth, I translate outside the precincts of the temple the sacred inscription, which no profane I should ever read. You doubt sorcery and magic? Oh, truth. That possession is a heavy burden. With a bigotry which one might search for in vain outside the church in whose interest he writes, De Musos quotes the above language, as proof positive that this devoted savant, and all who share his belief, have given themselves over to the dominion of the evil one. Self-complacency is the most serious obstacle to the enlightenment of the modern spiritualist. His thirty years' experience with the phenomena seemed to him sufficient to have established intermundane intercourse upon an unassailable basis. His thirty years have not only brought to him the conviction that the dead communicate and thus prove the spirit's immortality, 
but also settled in his mind an idea that little or nothing can be learned of the other world, except through mediums. For the spiritualists, the records of the past either do not exist, or if they are familiar with its gathered treasures, they regard them as having no bearing upon their own experiences. And yet, the problems which so vex them, were solved thousands of years ago by the theurgists, who have left the keys to those who will search for them in the proper spirit and with knowledge. Is it possible that nature has changed your work, and that we are encountering different spirits and different laws from those of old? Or can any spiritualist imagine that he knows more, or even as much about mediumistic phenomena or the nature of various spirits, as a priest caste who spent their lives in theurgical practice, which had been known and studied for countless centuries? If the narratives of Owen and Hare, of Edmonds, and Crooks, and Wallace are credible, why not those of Herodotus, the father of history, of Iamblichus, and Porphyry, and hundreds of other ancient authors? If the spiritualists, p. 335, have their phenomena under test conditions, so had the old theurgists, whose records, moreover, show that they could produce and vary them at will. The day when this fact shall be recognized, and profitless speculations of modern investigators shall give place to patient study of the works of the theurgists, will mark the dawn of new and important discoveries in the field of psychology.